Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty. I'm going to say something about the logistics of how all this is going to work in a moment, and then I'll introduce our, our first speaker. But before I do that, let me just take a step back and explain uh, what this meeting is all about, the Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty. Well, a little more than about 200 years ago, Alexander Hamilton, who was one of the, uh, one of the framers of the US Constitution, one of the founding fathers, wrote in Federalist Letter Number 1, which was a set of uh, published letters where the Founding Fathers sort of set out their vision of the US government, he asked a question, uh, a really quite fundamental question. And this is what he asked. He asked whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. And putting aside the unfortunate 18th century uh, gender bias in that statement, at the core of it is, is a fundamental question. And the question he was asking is whether societies can break free of this age-old tradition of depending upon uh, powerful families or violent despots to run society, which has been the sorry lot of humanity for most, let's face it, for most of the last 10,000 years of settled history. Could we go beyond that and could a group of people get together and design some sort of rational government? And this has, of course, been the perennial problem for humanity throughout settled society, which is getting this balance between liberty uh, in all of its various manifestations, including individual liberty, and that need for collective organization, some sort of uh, authority and collective control that holds a society together. And Thomas Hobbes recognized this difficulty in, in divining this fine line between liberty and collectivism. And as we move out into space, and establish settlements there, which looks increasingly likely with the increasing uh, expansion of government activity in space and private enterprise like SpaceX and Blue Origin. These questions uh, will not go away. In fact, they will intensify. And I think one of the reasons why they will intensify is because the space environment offers us particular challenges with respect to freedom and particularly individual liberty. Uh, here is an environment where oxygen, which you require on a second to second time scale, may be controlled by someone else. And of course, lots of things in society on earth are controlled by other people. But when something that you require to live on a second to second time scale is controlled by someone else, uh, there is a lever for uh, autocracy and, and tyranny, the likes of which we've never seen on the earth. And in addition to that, there are other problems like restrictions on freedom of movement. The fact that you can't just walk out onto the lunar surface or the Martian surface. Now, of course, this is not um, a denial of liberty. It's just a reality of those environments. But nevertheless, it has knock-on effects in, uh, in the social conditions in extraterrestrial environments where freedom of movement is curtailed in a way that uh, even the worst despots on Earth could not have dreamed of. So we might uh, simply rephrase Hamilton's question and ask this question again. Uh, whether extraterrestrial societies are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend, to depend for their political constitution on accident and force. This is the fundamental question that, uh, that confronts people who move out permanently or even temporarily into the space frontier. And at least for me, the future of liberty uh, beyond Earth is one of the most fascinating and I think compelling challenges of human governance in, in the 21st century. So that is just to give you a, a context of this, of this meeting and what it's all about. And, uh, and what we're gonna be doing in the next four days is considering some of the ways in which we might construct uh, free societies, free government as, as Madison and Hamilton were, were, were fond of calling it, free government beyond earth. What are the legal, social, political, and economic mechanisms for achieving uh, some of the liberties that we might want to construct beyond uh, the earth? We've got over 30 speakers presenting a whole range of topics. It's going to be a fascinating four days. Everything from the very near term, like the liberty we have to uh, operate satellites, for example, right the way through to the longer term, such as liberty and ethics on interstellar world ships, taking people to distant stars and, and everything uh, in between. All of this is going to be published. Um, all of our speakers have kindly agreed to contribute chapters. 
to a book that is going to be published by Oxford University Press next year with the title The Institutions of Extraterrestrial uh, Liberty. So that should be a very good book. So if you're interested in what you hear in the next four days, uh, have no fear, you can read it in more detail in the book that should be out. I think somewhere uh, mid mid next uh, year, uh, provided all of our speakers get their chapters in on time. There'll probably be some delay, but next year, look out for that. So let me just um, now, before we move to our first speaker, just say something about the logistics of this meeting and how it's going to work. Um, the schedule is available online. Uh, you can have a look at that on um, www.astrobiology.ac.uk forward slash events forward slash extraterrestrial hyphen liberty. And there you'll find um, information on the meeting and also the schedule. You can also find that in the, the link that you were sent from Eventbrite, that should be there uh, as well. So today and the next four days, the, meeting, the, the talks are gonna be 30 minutes each. So about 20 minute talking, and then we'll have uh, 10 minutes for question and answers. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, please put them in the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. You can see that Q&A, just open that up and type in your question. We may allow speaking questions, but we just want to avoid chaos. So we ask that you write your question into the question and answer box. Each talk is, as I say, going to be 30 minutes in total. So we'll try and answer your question. If we get talks where there's a lot of questions, we may not get round to it. So I apologize in advance if your question is not answered, but we'll try and do the best we can to answer as many questions uh, as, as we possibly can. There's going to be a 15 minute break between each talk. This is going to make the meeting a little bit clunky because they're going to be these sort of breaks where, where no one's saying anything in between talks. And the reason why I've done that is one, to avoid the sort of uh, the panic of trying to switch from one speaker to another that you would normally have in a conference, particularly with these online technologies. I'm sure you've all seen some of the problems. Uh, we wanted to give time for the speakers to turn up early, make sure they can share their slides. Uh, and also we want to start each talk exactly on time on the schedule, because some of you may want to come in and out at different times during this meeting. Some talks you may want to see that may particularly interest you. So I wanted to make sure that every talk does in fact start on time and we don't get slippage in the schedule during the day because that just becomes inconvenient for people turning up, hence the 15 minute break. So as I say, this is gonna make it a bit of a stop and start thing, but I actually think it will help uh, when it comes to um, uh, viewing this 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 series of webinars. Uh, the meeting is being recorded, just so you know. If you have colleagues or you can't make part of this, you can watch it at any other time. We'll be putting it on YouTube. We'll let you know where that is, particularly for our US colleagues who are obviously now it's too early for them, so they'll be able to watch these uh, early talks. Um, I'd like to just draw your attention to two keynote talks. We have two of those. Uh, one of them is today from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, UK time. I should just say this is British uh, summertime on the schedule. Uh, that is going to be given by Anthony Pagden, who is Professor of Political Science and History at the University of California, LA, UCLA. And he's going to be talking on the Enlightenment in the 21st century. And there's going to be lots of stuff on Montesquieu and and uh, uh, Adam Smith and, and all those great people. So come and have a listen to that. He is author of The Enlightenment and Why It Still Matters. It's gonna be slightly broader than space. That talk is going to be about, as it suggests, the enlightenment in the 21st century on a global scale. But he's also going to talk a little bit about how uh, the enlightenment can be applied or some of the values of the enlightenment can be applied to the situation beyond uh, the earth. And then tomorrow is our second keynote talk. Uh, by Bob Zubrin, who's president of the Mars Society and author of The Case for Mars, The Plan to Settle the Red Planet and Why We Must. And he's going to be setting out his vision of liberty beyond the Earth. The title of his talk is The Case for Space is Liberty, and particularly, I think, a focus on uh, the sorts of liberties we try to create on the Martian frontier. So that should be very interesting. Uh, and again, that's for one hour the schedule tomorrow. And that's actually from 2.30 to 3.30, because he's going to be speaking from the US just to make it more uh, convenient. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to um, uh, finish off my introduction by acknowledging our, our supporters of this, uh, this set of webinars over the next four days. Uh, first of all, the Open Lunar Foundation is supporting this series of talks in the US. Uh, the Open Lunar Foundation is a nonprofit organization helping to create a peaceful, cooperative future on the moon for all life. So they work on policy and partnerships that support a sustainable 
lunar settlement uh, driven by open values. Um, so we, we thank them. I also want to particularly thank the Institute for Liberal Studies in Canada. Uh, this is a registered educational charity dedicated to encouraging discussion of classical liberal ideas in Canada, uh, encouraging discussion and ideas about issues, for example, grounded in democracy, the rule of law, uh, economic and personal freedoms. And their mission is to provide a non-partisan environment uh, for these discussions. And I should say, by the way, um, just as an aside, they have a fantastic week called Freedom Week. You can go and look for that on their website, Institute for Liberal Studies. And it's a bit like this, but it's a week of talks about Earth liberties. So not much space in there, although I'm trying to change their views on this. Uh, but Freedom Week is, is people talking about various aspects of, of liberty. So you might want to look that up as well. It's a, it's a very interesting set of talks. Uh, I also want to thank the, the British Interplanetary Society. It's a membership society that promotes the exploration and use of space for the benefit of humanity by connecting people to create, educate and inspire and advance knowledge in all aspects of astronautics. And also just as an aside, I think it's the world's oldest space advocacy group, advocacy, advocacy group um, established in 1933 um, and, and developed there. So it's been around for a long time, does a lot of work on, on thinking about architectures for space missions, working on its own projects. Uh, if you're not a member, I, I encourage you to join. And then fast, f finally, last but not least, I want to thank uh, the, the organization that has supported and funded th this webinar, um, the, the, the Zoom technology we need today, which is the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh, our local supporter. And EFI seeks to pursue knowledge and understanding that supports the navigation of complex futures. And I particularly want to thank uh, uh, Kelly McCurlane, who has who has basically set all this up and has helped us um, uh, set up all this technology. It might seem very basic just to set up a, a Zoom link, but actually it's quite involved. I've discovered all this trying to set up webinars. So I thank her in particular for all the administration and the advertising for this meeting uh, that's been so essential. And finally, the UK Centre for Astrobiology, whose interest is to discover how habitable worlds form in the universe and how life emerges proliferates and leave traces on other worlds. And the UKCA is based at Edinburgh. It also has interest in um, space uh, philosophy and space ethics and space governance. For example, between 2013 and 2015, the UKCA hosted three meetings on extraterrestrial liberty with the British Interplanetary Society uh, that resulted in three books in Springer's Space and Society series. You can look those up online if you're interested. Today's meeting takes the center away from microbes, which is what it thinks about most of the time, to think about space governance, human societies, and how they might eventually proliferate in the universe. And I'd point out that the extremes of extraterrestrial uh, environments are not so disconnected from microbes because humans are just, of course, another type of biology subjected to extremes. So the sorts of societies we create are just another reflection of the way in which extreme environments uh, beyond Earth affect the organization of biology, in this case, human biology uh, in the form of political philosophy. So that's the introduction to the talk. I hope you're all going to enjoy it. I think it's going to be a fantastic four days. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers. Um, it's 10.15, so I'm going to uh, move right along and introduce the first speaker for today. I'm very, very uh, pleased to be able to welcome uh, Franz von der Dunk. Now, Franz is uh, an extraordinary uh, individual in terms of the scope of his contributions to space law. He's the Harvey and Susan uh, Perlin alumni and Othma Professor of Space Law at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, uh, previously Director of Space Law Research at the International Institute of Air and, Air and Space Law at Leiden University since 1990. He's also written a very large tome on the Handbook of Space Law. If you want to know everything about space law, I recommend you get this book. It's quite an astonishing um, uh, piece of writing. And Franz has been involved, um, I don't have time to list, all the various committees and advisory groups at ESA, NASA, on all various aspects of, of space law. And today he's going to talk to us about law and liberty on the moon. So thank you very much, Franz, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Charles, for that very kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. All you right. Me. That means that I can also start sharing. Uh, and I should, as, a, as any good lawyer would, start my talk with the disclaimer. Um, you heard Charles talk about a very future-oriented uh, um, 
paradigm and the idea of, of can we escape in outer space the, what, all the things that we did wrong on Earth, going back to, uh, to Alexander Hamilton's uh, famous statement. And uh, as of course, as a law professor, you always have to realize that you stand on, on today. Uh, I'm very grateful for being invited to talk at this conference. Uh, usually the lawyer gets uh, at the very end when everybody is already pining for the drinks. Um, uh, in this case, it's quite a change and I'm allowed to kick off. But I want to warn you that I will kick off from today's world rather than look too much into the future. Although towards the end of my talk, I will spend a few thoughts on how it works from there on as well. Now, as a lawyer, I always tell my students that the first thing we need to do is try to determine what we actually talk about. We, we should define um, the terms, the key terms, in order uh, to, to really create a discussion, a viable discussion on what we're talking about. So we need to look for definitions. And in this case, of course, the two main definitions are the words law and liberty, as they also fundamentally uh, appear in the title of my talk. I assume that everyone understands what the moon is all about, so we don't need to define that. But for law, it's a little bit more different, in particular when it comes to non-lawyers, because, um, but before we go to the law, first about liberty. Um, this is, of course, a famous statute. Uh, I was uh, recently reading a Dutch article explaining the, the background to the Statue of Liberty, uh, which is a kind of adapted version of the famous painting of a French artist on the liberty that supposedly broke through in the French Revolution back in 1789 as a kind of a precursor also to the American Revolution. If you look at liberty, of course, there are many, uh, many uh, definitions that abound. Uh, I took the very easy route also because I think it, it provides for a very good starting point for discussing liberty and just went to Wikipedia. So this is the ability to do as one pleases. Um, and that is a synonym for the word freedom in most cases. And if you want to specify a little bit more in detail, I think it's fair to say that liberty is kind of the um, uh, state of being free within society from control or oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on whatever you want to do as an individual. So the concept, at least from a Western perspective, is very much focused on individual liberty. And for better or worse, that is the kind of starting point also for my talk. We can disagree about that. Uh, there may be other liberties at stake, but this is at least where I come from. Now, with law, it's important to realize, uh, in particular for, for non-lawyers, that um, you know, uh, we are not talking here about the laws of physics. We are talking about human laws, human-made laws, and these human-made laws are basically supposed to address human interaction and human activities. Now, most non-lawyers, I, I think it's fair to say, will immediately understand that law is very much uh, linked to ethics, and it certainly has has a major ethical purpose because it's supposed to reflect a general sense of justice and fairness. It, is, it isn't always seen eye to eye with that, whereas ethical is a fluid, non-monolithic uh, non, uh, concept and is changing all the time as we speak. The law usually lags behind, but it is supposed if the, uh, to, to, come to, to catch up with the ethics. And once in a particular society, ethics have moved on to a different stage, a different paradigm, then uh, the gap between the ethics and the law cannot, be coming, cannot become too big because then you get a revolution. So you need law to catch up. And that is, of course, what everyone is looking for in the law, some sense of justice. However, it's important to realize that this is not all. Uh, at least as important as this element of human-made law is another element, and that is simply of a pragmatic nature. It is simply to establish some level of predictability in the human interaction and activity. If you take, for example, uh, road traffic, there is nothing inherently more just in driving on the left side of the road than driving on the right side of the road. Some countries do the one, some countries do the other. 
but you need to make a decision one way or another in order to prevent chaos and a lot of death and destruction. So in that sense, much of the law is not so much primarily about justice only, it's also simply to agree on certain human behavior. Now, when it comes to space, uh, of course, the primary problem so far is that there are not that many people who have actually gotten into space. I think the number is slightly above 500 right now. So if you talk about human uh, action, what are we really talking about? Well, I'm reminded of a famous heading of the New York Times of some 10 years ago, which read, wherever you go, the taxman goes. And the idea was that wherever humans go, uh, this uh, figure of the greedy taxman follows them in order to try to tax them. Well, I would point, I would put it to you that actually this should be wherever you go, the lawyer goes, because the law certainly follows humans wherever they go because of the need to handle, to, uh, to arrange, to uh, regulate, if you will, their human activities. And that is no different in outer space, which means um, that law started to become an issue in terms of space activities as soon as humans when we become, became active in outer space. Now there, of course, we have an issue because as I said, so far, no more than maybe 500 and a bit humans have actually been active in outer space and usually for a very short time. Now, what we should realize that when we talk about human interactions, we usually do not necessarily only refer to the humans themselves. We see that humans um, associate themselves in clubs, associations, communities. Um, I'm a football fan, or for the US listeners, a soccer fan. So I take the liberty here to show you a picture of my famous soccer team, Ajax in the Netherlands. And, they, and, and those clubs, associations, etc., etc., they all take, can take the legal place of humans in terms of acting, but it's still ultimately made up of humans. Likewise, we see humans getting together in companies, in corporations, legal persons who then are seen as the, the subjects of the law, uh, who have rights and obligations. Or in even greater quantities, we talk about peoples who are then usually, at least so far, reflected by this concept of a state. These are all legal fictions, uh, a, a, a club cannot act as such. It's the persons who make up the club according to the, uh, to the rules of the club who take the decisions. And likewise, companies are organized with the board who takes the decisions and the board consists of humans. And the same actually is true of state. So when we talk about human activities in outer space, we also include activities predominantly by states and then increasingly by corporations. I haven't seen anyone play soccer in outer space yet, so we can forget about that, but that's where we are. And that also means that the origins of space law started as soon as this small metal ball, the Sputnik 1, went up in 1957. Of course, that immediately arose the first legal, uh, the, 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 that raised the first legal issue. Here you see the trajectory, and you will notice that the Soviet-made uh, metal sphere orbited a number of times over a number of countries, including, of course, the United States. And the fundamental legal question, the first legal question was, is this allowed? Or does the United States have a right, like, or any other state, does any other state have the right to legally prevent this from happening? Sorry, I'm going too fast. This discussion within 10 years, which is pretty short in international legal terms, led, gave rise to a first international treaty in the UN context which in short is called the Outer Space Treaty. You see the full name reflected there, and it talks about uh, principles governing the activities of states, representing large groups of humans in outer space. And it's important to realize that this treaty was ratified both by the United States and the Soviet Union, the two superpowers of the day, and then consecutively by all the other major space-faring nations. The United Kingdom, France, Germany, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, you name them, they're all party to this treaty. And it has five key clauses of importance here. The most important one is probably Article 2, and that's why I beg your pardon, this is the only article that I will quote in full. 
It reads as follows, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty or otherwise. Now, what does that mean? Maybe you recall from your history lessons at school that Western European nations back in the day were used to planting their flags on other parts of the world and calling those, establishing those as colonies for the motherland. Well, since the UN Charter, that is no longer legally possible on Earth. We've seen a period of decolonization. And Article 2 simply makes sure that this will never extend to outer space either. So the fact that the Apollo 9 astronauts, excuse me, the Apollo 11 astronauts put the US flag on the moon, as did some subsequent missions, did not mean that the United States claimed any part of the moon as US territory. It was a small step for a man uh, and a giant leap for mankind. And reflecting what Charles said earlier, of course, now it should read a small step for a human and a giant leap for humankind. But the important thing to take away here, it wasn't just for the United States. The second key, so effectively, this is usually reflected by a, a term called global, global commons, which supposedly is then the legal status of outer space. The second key clause closely related says that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. And this province idea supposedly takes away national borders. So there is no, in line with the previous article, there is no limitation of, uh, of particular state uh, authority. There is no limitation where one state calls the shots. Freedom, however, is only for states, and that's very important to realize in view of the increasing private participation in space activities. Article 6 makes states responsible for private space activities and requires them basically to establish national space legislation. And as you see in this short picture, by now, uh, more than two dozen countries of all different walks of life have actually established such a national space. The third or fourth key clause, I should say, is Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty, which provides for the registration of space objects and thereby allows states to exercise jurisdiction over the space objects and anyone on board. And this is basically no different from the jurisdiction of flag states over ships or aircraft carrying their flags. And then the last point, and now we are getting also closer to the liberty issue, is that Article 3 serves as a kind of general fallback clause, which means that general international law continues to apply to outer space, at least as long as it is not specifically contradicted by space law, which then in, may include things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which brings in human, international human rights, where Article 3 of the Declaration talks about the right to liberty, Article 4 sort of provides a, a, a mirror-wise uh, absence of slavery and servitude. There are other clauses which support liberty at large. And then there are even rights which do not pertain to individuals, but to groups as such, but they all are still established to protect the liberty of persons, whether in groups or in individuals. Now, the problem with this whole declaration is that it provides a common standard of achievement doesn't set a legally binding rule. The effort is to promote respect for these rights and freedoms, not thereby to establish them as uh, unabridgeable law, which of course means that you need the states to actually implement them. As we unfortunately all know, some states are better in implementing them than others. States remain internationally responsible for the implementation and enforcement of human rights or individual freedoms, which basically brings back in the role of sovereign states, in spite of the fact that, technically speaking, they cannot exercise their sovereign rights, their sovereign jurisdiction in outer space, as if it would be part of Earth. So allow me to look into a crystal ball. How would that work when we actually start settling plants? Well, to keep things a little bit simple, I devise three scenarios. Scenario one is what I call the simple one. You have a habitat on outer space, which is registered by a single country. And I take the liberty of using my own country, the Netherlands, as the example. And it is even more simplified by the fact that the people who actually live there are all Dutch. So the thing is easy here because it's simply 
enough Dutch human rights can be applied to the space station, including any liberties of individual persons that are protected and, and propounded by that Dutch law. And since there are only Dutch citizens in this habitat, it doesn't lead to much to too much of an issue. Now, that's of course for the short term. In the long term, what we will see happening is that people start growing their own food, that they will uh, mine their resources to build their own habitats, that they actually will get children born. And the question then becomes, are these new people still feeling subject to Dutch authority? There are basically two options here. Again, I take a very simple approach. Either there will be a peaceful handover, a peaceful agreement in this example on the part of the Netherlands to leave these extraterrestrial persons, humans, or if it's called extra humans, whatever you want to call them, to leave them on their own, to fend for themselves, to maybe create their own first extraterrestrial state. Or there will be, well, of course, happened in the case of the United States being born, first a war before the, the old colonial power that the United Kingdom, Great Britain, was ready to call it quits. In any event, there will somehow, some way, probably arise a new state, an extraterrestrial state. I took the flag of the province of Antwerp in Belgium here simply because I like it and it sort of represents all states, if you will. But the key point is, of course, that this state can then deliver, develop its own national law on liberties, which will, in my example, uh, in many ways, probably resemble the Dutch one, certainly originally, uh, because they, those were, remember, those were Dutch people in this scenario, and that's the way they had lived before in any event, so they're very used to that. But they will, of course, already insert those elements in national law, which adapt to the specific environment of outer space, in this case, the moon or any other celestial body. Now we move to more complex scenarios. The less simple one is where the habitat is still Dutch, but the people living there are from different nationalities. And that's certainly not excluded by space law. And as long as the Dutch are willing to accept those from their space station, that is uh, par for the course. Now here, Dutch law and liberties would still be the default rule because it's a Dutch registered space object. But of course, you can imagine that uh, foreigners there may start to rail against that. And other states are getting involved as well. So the settlers of different states may remain, in addition to, in this case, the Dutch uh, laws applying because of their nature, because of their nationality, still be subject to the different laws of their own country of origin which may not be enforced because there is no territorial jurisdiction in outer space, certainly not on the part of other countries than the Dutch, since we're still speaking about a Dutch space station, but it will, may still impact the actual developments. And those foreigners may start to will and uh, uh, start to laugh about the Dutch rules and call for a change of the regime. So now you are already getting into a variety of options and scenarios, which is, of course, a paradise for lawyers, I should say. Some states may say, oh, forget about our nationals. We simply denounce the nationality of the settlers. Let them do whatever they want. We don't care anymore. Some states may leave it to the settlers to make such a decision. Uh, but some states may insist that their citizens remain their citizens, even if they are in the Dutch space station on the moon or a celestial body. And the Dutch, as the registration state, will most likely uh, continue to try and exercise control and, and, and apply their uh, set of liberties and illiberties on the space station, just because it's a Dutch space station. Now you can imagine scenario three is even more complicated because now you have a space station which is composed of habitats made up and registered by various countries, not just a single one anymore and still the people come in from all over the place. So here you can only say that there is an urgent need for the laws to converge if you really are looking for a single, more or less consistent system of liberties. But that will take some time. Now, in order to leave some time for Q&A, I will conclude there, but it should be clear that I haven't answered the last question in any detail yet. 
simply because it's unable to, it's impossible to really predict what's going on there. It is clear though, that there will be enough work out there for space lawyers for decades, if not centuries to come. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention. And I go back to, uh, to the moderator to allow him or her to take over again. Great, thank you very much. Um... Franz, for, for a fascinating talk, but also for, for, for an excellent um, start to this whole set of webinars. I think it's really set the scene nicely. Um, I'm just looking at the questions and answers. We've got a few questions here from some of our attendees. Uh, the first one is, how do any of these articles, and I think that's actually, that came in when you were talking about uh, the UN Outer Space Treaty. So how do you, any of these articles work next to the US Space Force? I suppose that's a general question about what happens when nations go out and uh, potentially exert some sort of military presence in space? Uh, th that's a great question. And, and of course, the, the, as a lawyer, as an international lawyer, I should be very clear that the space treaty rules. And to be honest about this, the US have also in the context of developing the space force or standing up the space force, always made clear that at least in their view, um, they will continue to comply with space law. The setting up of a space force as such, it should be clear, is not in violation of the outer space treaty. The Russians, the Chinese, the French have already done so anyway. And uh, much as we might have liked to see a different perspective, space is not a demilitarized area. The, 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 uh, the only limitation to, to the void of outer space in terms of military use is the prohibition in Article 4, which I didn't mention in my talk, the prohibition to station or orbit weapons of mass destruction. So anything else, as far as the outer space treaty is concerned, is not prohibited. Now on the moon and celestial bodies, the rules are much more strict. There, any military activity is predicted, but the space force doesn't only suggest uh, to land on the moon and establish military uh, bases there, because that would be clearly prohibited. It, it simply encompasses all the military activities of the United States in outer space as a whole. And as such, that is certainly not in violation of, um, of, the, uh, of the Outer Space Treaty. Now, the previous uh, uh, president uh, who stood up the Space Force might perhaps be suspected of having ideas in his mind of actual space troopers shooting their nuclear guns in outer space to uh, protect uh, American predominance. Well, that would be certainly out of the out of the out of the out of the order. Uh, that would be certainly illegal. But I also suspect that certainly with the current administration and with the whole U.S. Uh, constitution and, and uh, legislative system behind that, that's not something that is likely going to be happening soon. Good, thank you. And we've got a, a question here from Jeremiah Johnson. It's also a very interesting question. It says, um, the African space policy got released several years ago. Do you think current uh, developing countries will have a widely different approach to extraterrestrial citizens? I suppose we do tend to have a slightly Western view of of law and liberties in these matters. So do you, do you think there would be a wide divergence or do you think there are, for example, certain liberties that people might agree with regardless of where they come from? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think you're basically right. It's already, of course, something that we've seen happening on, on earth as well. Uh, when the UN Charter and the, the UN Universal Declaration were, were announced in the mid 1940s, that was clearly dominated by, by Western views of what liberties meant, very much focused on the individual. And later on with decolonization, um, many countries, uh, many newly born countries placed a much greater value on collective liberties and on growing wealth and, 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 and resources in order to allow the populations to survive. And we've seen that discussion in, in Earth as well, where human rights are now no longer limited to the kind of classical, if you will, Western-oriented human rights of, of rights to liberty and the freedom of expression, but also rights to education, rights to jobs, uh, minority rights, things like that. So that discussion will, I am afraid, also prevail in space. What of course is important to note is that you only have a real voice in outer space once you do something out there. And that is, of course, the big drawback of many developing countries. They have neither the money nor the inclination or the technology 
to be on the forefront there, although things are changing. I mean, over the last 20 years, we've seen leading developing countries, eh, take India, Brazil, even Nigeria, and a number of smaller ones, making great strides, getting a seat at the table. And that, of course, allows them to impact this discussion in, in, when it comes to outer space uh, just as much. And if the African countries can sort of unite in an African policy as opposed to individual national policy, that certainly may make a difference as well. Yeah, and then Bernard Hennin has actually asked a question, which I, I suppose is a parallel, well, it's related, which is the matter of um, increasing privatization of space companies like SpaceX, that of course also may have very different ideas about how they want to implement uh, laws and liberties in settlements that they may establish. So I think the question here is, you know, how do we construct a, a legal system that's actually practical, is actually going to work when you've got companies moving out across the vast sort of 3D uh, environment of space doing what they want? Uh, is a legal structure going to work at all? Yeah, well, whether it's going to work at all, I'm a little bit hesitant to say because... Uh, because that's all, that's again looking in a crystal ball, if you will. But I'm, I'm happy to say that at least the blueprint for the legal system is there. And this goes back to Article 6. Uh, and just to reiterate, Article 6, which I just put there briefly, provides that states are responsible for anything that private actors do. So if SpaceX does something in violation of the Outer Space Treaty, other countries can directly hold the United States responsible. And even more particular, and I didn't mention that in my, in my talk, but a twin article, Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty, which was further elaborated even by a separate convention, the Liability Convention, also makes states liable in terms of uh, monetary compensation for damage they cause for the activities of private entities. So if SpaceX somehow does something stupid and creates uh, damage of billions of dollars of damage, the, the bill has to be paid, first of all, by the United States government. And it's their problem to try and get back to SpaceX and get at least part of their money back in their license. So the system is there, which holds states responsible. I think that's the beauty of space law in a certain sense, because in other systems of law, you don't find that automatic responsibility and liability of states for whatever the private sector does. Now, whether it's enough is, of course, the second question in, in the case of SpaceX. To, to take that example again, it very much depends upon how keen the United States is on actually controlling that, uh, how serious it is. So far they are, because SpaceX cannot just do what they want. They need a license and then another license, and they get all sorts of requirements imposed upon them. Again, we can go deep into the weeds and discuss whether those requirements are sufficient or not. And of course, political opinions may diverge there. But I, I again would put to you that the blueprint of the system is there. We just need to make sure that it will continue to work as it, I believe, has worked pretty well so far. Thanks, Franz. And then uh, another question that um, attendee cryptically named 1011 has asked. Uh, they've simply said, uh, the issue, of course, you have the issue of religious systems competing to dominate. So I suppose that that's an interesting question because, of course, throughout the history of, of human society, that particularly in the past, has been very strong competition between states and religious organisations. In fact, obviously, law has, in some sense, come out of that conflict between those two parts of human society. So what would happen if you had a, you know, a theocracy on the moon, for example? I suppose the answer you just given, which is they would still be subject to the laws of the state from which they came. Um, but are there any other comments that you would make about the emergence of powerful religious systems? And perhaps if you've got an isolated group of people in a very extreme environment, there's every possibility of some sort of uh, religious um, system emerging in these sorts of extremes in, in an isolated group what how does that interface with law absolutely well i, I think you already <laughs> mowed away most of the grass in front of my feet I, I can just try to rephrase that a little bit in the sense that yes uh, most states of course at least formally adhere to freedom of religion which is one of those human rights also reflected in the universal declaration which i briefly discussed and to the extent that those states will be in control over space settlements, they will most likely try to preserve the freedom of religion to the same extent. If the 
if this if the space habitat if the if the settlement would be a settlement of a what is already a theocracy on earth where the separation between state and religion is not clear or not existing at all then presumably you would find the same system in outer space and uh, as long as no explicit rules of the outer space treaty are violated and there are none in the outer space treaty which address religion left or right um, there is not lit there's little we can do as lawyers ab about that it, it, if you want to put it that way it's just bad luck if you belong to a different religion and in that sense again it wouldn't be different from 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 what happens on earth now of course it will be interesting to see certainly if people start living on the moon and start being born on the moon and then start separating themselves into kind of extraterrestrial states I use the inverted commas to indicate that that would be a new phenomenon and nobody knows where it's going. But of course, alongside these developments, you may also get new forms of religion because uh, obviously the different living environments will probably generate new ideas about the supernatural, about the afterlife, if there is any, uh, about, uh, you know, about whether there's more to life than meets the eye. Um, uh, it's interesting if we talk about the moon that there are several uh, religions where the moon plays a very important role and uh, whether we like it or not the viewing of the moon as a religious symbol has already changed by the fact that actually humans have set foot on the moon and that we are probably looking forward to many more setting foot there in the next I don't know half a century so that may also give rise to new religions new sects new ideas. Um, but again, I'm basically sort of rephrasing what you said, Charles. So thanks for that. No, thanks, Franz. And uh, just looking at the time, we've got, uh, let's say, a couple more questions. This is a good thing about having the 15 minute um, buffer zone between talks. Let me let me come to a more immediate um, question that has come to the public mind uh, quite widely, which is this question of um, asked by uh, Ali Reese Tusi, which is Profit-based exploitation of lunar and celestial bodies, uh, particularly acquisition of rocks, for example, on the moon. Um, should the rest of the world worry about these sorts of laws that are being written that, that allow private companies to, to extract resources on celestial bodies under the UN treaty and exploit those? And, and how should we deal with that? I, I think we should worry in an abstract sense, in the sense that we should... Uh, closely monitor what's going on and simply try to make sure that those laws don't give a blank check to private entrepreneurs who could then act as cowboys uh, only you know looking at the the, the, the bucks they want to make and, and not completely disregarding all the public interest now uh, I don't I wouldn't worry too much at present in a concrete sense because the few laws that are there, do not give me that impression that that's going to happen. And uh, the US were the first one to announce such law in 2015. And it clearly requires a system of authorization and supervision alongside with the Article 6 responsibility that the United States inevitably carries. And it includes reference to, to uh, liabilities as well. Um, whether that's enough to preserve you know, the public interests in, in the peaceful use of the moon or in the environment of the moon or in allowing other countries to benefit from the moon as well. That's the discussion that we should currently be having. And I think that is currently taking place. Uh, there is, uh, it's usually in the corridors, but there's a lot of discussion going on as to should we not uh, develop a more extended set of legal rules about proper behavior on the moon, which can preserve exactly those, uh, those general public interests in peaceful uses, in, in general availability, in space environment, and things like that, uh, all the while balancing that with the interests of, of what I would call bona fide private interests. Where the balance will be, that will be political discussion. Now is the time to conduct that discussion um, because it will still influence the way that the United States, Luxembourg and the United Arab Emirates, because those are the three countries so far having any specificity on celestial mining in their national law, uh, that they will further then develop the actual licensing system. And because they are responsible for what's going on, they will at least 
on paper be forced to then implement whatever legal regime we agree on an international level at the national level. And we should be, let's say, fast within the next five to 10 years because presumably more national laws will come online. And at a certain point, of course, it becomes more difficult to go back in time and tell all those countries to, to adapt their legislation to a new part of international law. So the sooner we get these fundamental things in place in a somewhat more coherent and solid and substantive fashion than they are today, the better it is. Thank you. And I think just uh, we, should, we should have a last question here, which I'm going to ask you. Um, I was just wondering about the practicalities of a judicial system, for example, in a settlement on the moon. So you start off with a, a small group of people who land there. Um, are, is that going to be say, uh, something like a village police officer who, who watches to make sure people are behaving properly? And then do you transition into actually physically constructing a court, for example, when you get to a certain size um, where, uh, you know, a full-scale court system works and maybe a small prison? So I was just wondering what, what you think about the actual practicalities of implementing a judicial system in a society whose size might change quite rapidly, at least in comparison to societies on the earth. Right, right. I, I, think, I think, again, you, you, uh, there's little to add to, to, to the question because you, you laid out the way it's probably going to work. And obviously it's all up to the interaction between the settlers themselves, uh, how long they've been away from earth, whether they have any intention to ever return. Uh, those are, of course, key questions. Um, uh, and and the, the larger the settlement grows, uh, the more you need a more uh, sophisticated uh, set, settle, a system to settle disputes than just, you know, talking it out. I mean, if it's just one family, you know, you talk it out and supposedly you're all in the same, in the same boat. So you probably don't need to go to a judge. If you get more families, it becomes more complicated. The longer the, you are there... Uh, the, the less you might be inclined to look back to earth for solving any of your disputes, also because you start realizing that these courts on earth have no clue what it means to live on the moon. Uh, just like the Pilgrim Fathers, you know, a part increasingly controlled by the British King, simply because they were of the opinion this, this, this guy over in London has no clue of what it means, you know, to live on these wild shores of North America, to fight bears and Indians and, and the terrible climate. So how can he, you know, pretend to actually speak justice about it? So the longer these societies are there, the bigger they grow, the more they do, the more likely there will be a need to, to develop something sophisticated. And again, in first instance, they will just probably just copy the Earth-like system and elect a local judge on the moon or a local jury on the moon, if that's happening in the country where they come from, um, and then take it as it grows. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Franz. We should probably stop there uh, with five minutes before the next talk. That was absolutely fascinating. There are lots of other questions. I'm sorry, everyone, that we can't answer them. I would happily sit here for an hour and discuss uh, law and liberty on the moon with Franz. Maybe we should do that one day. But uh, for now, we need, to, we, need to, we need to stop. So thank you again. As I say, that's also been a, a wonderful introduction to, I think, all the talks in setting the stage for uh, what we think about how liberties might emerge from uh, laws and legal systems in space. So thank you again. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, for anyone who's joined us, uh, welcome to the Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty. Uh, second talk for this morning is going to be by uh, Lucas Mix. Lucas is an extraordinarily interesting individual. Um, he is an associate at the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard, but he works at the intersection of biology, history, philosophy, and theology, and has a great deal of knowledge in all those areas. And some of us sort of work in biology and dabble in political philosophy and ethics, but Lucas actually really knows what he's talking about and actually has a, a great deal of experience and writing in, in really genuinely creating connections uh, between, these, between these different fields and, and having that insight, particularly, as I say, at the ethics and theological boundary uh, with biology. Uh, he has worked with NASA astrobiology programs for the last 20 years on understanding the meaning and extent of life. Uh, he's published some great papers discussing the definition of life in uh, journals like astrobiology, if you're interested in, you know, in thinking about what, what is life. 
And he's also the next Barry Bloomberg Chair of Astrobiology at the Library of Congress, which has been running now. I'm not sure how they've had, what, four or five of them now, I think? Uh, we may be up to seven. Seven. OK, gosh, time flies. Anyway, so that's uh, also a wonderful um, position that was set up by NASA to link astrobiology to the more social aspects of astrobiology, as I say, at the Library of Congress in, in Washington, D.C., and so today he's going to talk to us about to infinity and beyond uh, biology, ethics, and endless expansion. Thank you, Charles. I am really excited about this topic. Uh, I have been looking at this question for some time, narratives of infinite expansion. And there are many things that I could talk about. Um, if I can advance my slides, which I can. Um, because of our limited time, I want to talk about just four words. So I'm going to talk about development. I'm going to talk about evolution and why evolution and development are not the same thing. I'm going to talk about soteriology, which is a fancy word for how we think about salvation. So narratives of salvation, particularly salvation as development and hegemony or um, leadership, uh, usually with slightly sinister overtones, um, a strong leadership, uh, and why this is a natural product of developmental soteriology. So development. Development is the process by which an individual organism progresses to a complete or more advanced anatomical state. Uh, alternatively, it is the formulation or creation of something by successive stages of improvement or advancement. So we have here a, a diagram, a fairly traditional diagram of the development of a fly from a fertilized egg up through various stages uh, to a fly that we would recognize. And the interesting thing here, if we look at the second definition is there's this idea of improvement or advancement that we tend to think of the fly as better than the fertilized egg. This has been a key question from the time of Aristotle. How does an egg know what to grow into? We have attached to development this idea of maturation along a fixed course from beginning to end to an adulthood of some sort. Now, this is not guaranteed. We know that not all acorns do grow into oaks, but it is both expected and normative. To stop short of adulthood is usually considered tragic. Uh, an acorn that has not advanced to an oak uh, is often thought to have not fulfilled its purpose, although that's something we could talk about more uh, in biology. Uh, but I'd like you to consider these ideas of premature and pre-adolescent and the valences that go along with those, how we think of them. Uh, generally, premature is not considered a good thing, and pre-adolescent is fine for only so long. In modern biology from the late 20th century, Development has considered to be specifically goal-directed or teleonomic according to a genetic program. Now, alternatively, we have this concept of evolution. Evolution is the process by which living organisms or their parts development from rudiments to from rudimentary state to a mature or complete state. And that is the definition of evolution from around 1670 to around 1900 but it has shifted over the years so that now we tend to think of evolution as the proposition that all living organisms have undergone a process of alteration and diversification from simple primordial forms during Earth's history. Uh, in particular, a scientific theory proposing a mechanism for this process, now especially based on Darwin's theory of natural selection, of genetically inherited and adaptive variation. So, Evolution, when it was first developed, was what we now call progressive evolution. It was a theories of species change, but it was a theories of species change for the better. Originally, um, it, the term was coined by Charles Bonnet and Jean-Baptiste Romanet uh, with this idea of God's unrolling or unfolding plan. The word evolution is just a Latin for unrolling. And it was chiefly progressive in this sense through the 19th century as in Lamarck's path to perfection, he thought things were getting better along a fixed path as they evolved. And it built on the medieval scala naturae or ladder of nature, which showed a progression from pond scum all the way up the scale of dignity and agency to humans and perhaps beyond to angels. So we have some classic pictures here of progressive evolution. 
uh, the Book of Ascents 1305, we see a picture of the static ladder of nature. Uh, it becomes an escalator in the 18th century, and we start thinking of species rolling up the ladder. Uh, Lamarck, interestingly, has a two-pronged progression, the plants advancing up to the complexity of orchids, while animals were progressing up to the complexity and dignity of humans. Uh, we can also see Ernst Haeckel's tree uh, there in 1874, which is a little bit more branchy, but still has this notion of humans being the most advanced and right out there on top. Now, evolution by natural selection was a different idea than progressive evolution. It's still a theory of species change, uh, but it's slightly different. Proposed by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace in the 19th century, it is explicitly not developmental. It is instead undirected and fitted to a local environment. And it became statistical and population oriented in the modern synthesis, the early 20th century. Uh, and we see in evolution by natural selection, these branchy trees that are not moving in a particular direction. They don't have a top, they only have an outside. So there's some important things that we should distinguish between development and evolution when talking about them biologically. We see the development of an individual organism, but the evolution of a population, particularly a species. We think of development as directed by a genetic program, but at least in biology, we think of evolution as undirected. We think of development along a fixed path, but we think of evolution randomly varying and being selected for specific environments, importantly, different ways of being selected in different environments. There isn't one best way to be evolved. Uh, and of course, development is expected and normative, whereas evolution is probabilistic and non-normative. And there are three reasons why very, very hard wall went up between these concepts. Uh, the first is a rejection of design arguments, uh, building on David Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion. Uh, it turns out that the developmental or progressive evolutionary scheme doesn't do much explanatory work. Charles Darwin also noted that there's a whole lot of misery observed in the world. Uh, Darwin particularly points out the ichneumid wasp, which lays its egg inside a live insect, inside a live insect, and keeps the insect alive uh, so that it can continue to provide the best nutrition to the wasp's young, which will slowly eat their way out of the still living insect. And Darwin says, this could be fitted to the environment, but it doesn't really seem to be something that would be chosen as morally good or advanced in any kind of just universe. Uh, a second reason has to do with the mathematics of probability, which formalized evolutionary theory in the early 20th century. And third, there's a very problematic connection between the normative claims of developmental evolution and politics. Uh, there's not time for a whole lot of examples, but I can point out the Galton Professor of National Eugenics at University College London, which uh, survived from 1911 to 1963, though it was slowly shifting to what we now think of as population genetics. There was still this idea of eugenics and breeding a better species uh, well into the 20th century. Likewise, in the United States, we can see the Supreme Court case of Buck v. Bell, in which the Supreme Court said, uh, the state has an interest in breeding the population, uh, and therefore the state has an interest and an ability to sterilize individuals who are not fit to reproduce. Notably, Buck v. Bell has never been explicitly overturned by the US Supreme Court. Uh, sterilization just sort of drifted out of use, um, although there have been troubling um, indirect cases recently that weren't explicitly claimed as eugenic. Um, but could have been thought of uh, by the practitioners. Uh, the last explicitly eugenic case in the US, if I remember correctly, was a sterilization by the state of Oregon in 1980. So this is not quite as old as we might think that it is. Now, contrary to the biological concept of evolution, we have a concept of social development that develops in sociology and economics. And we can particularly turn to Auguste Comte, who proposed social evolution, um, which we probably should think of as social development, given the terminology we've been using, through three distinct stages. So he spoke that of every society as passing through 
a theological stage in which they believed in theological agents, a metaphysical stage in which they invoked metaphysical principles, abstract rules for how things happened, to positive stage in which they had positive knowledge of scientific laws. Uh, and this was used as a way of justifying why some civilizations were farther along and better off than others. Uh, Herbert Spencer had this theory that we tend to label as social Darwinism, uh, along with his term survival of the fittest that attached a moral um, status that that which was better would survive and that which, was sur that which survives is better because it survived. Uh, and we can also look at uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, uh, who spoke of parallel development between technology and morality. He thought the two would always advance hand in hand. Uh, John Bacon, I think we'll be speaking later, uh, spoke of evolutionary eschatology uh, in his paper in Theology and Science. I am going to argue that he's really talking about developmental soteriology rather than evolutionary eschatology, but I think we're talking about the same thing. So what is soteriology? Soteriology is the idea of a doctrine or um, view of salvation, uh, which develops from Christian doctrines of salvation from sin, but we might compare Buddhist ideas of liberation from suffering. It's this idea that humanity uh, requires saving from some ill uh, and that individuals require some saving from an ill and that there is a path by which this may occur. Um, and so with this developmental soteriology, which we see developed by the sociologists and by the progressive uh, evolutionary biologists prior to 1900, uh, we can talk about the maturation of populations or of entire species. Uh, and we see this frequently in science fiction, a little bit in popular science as well. You may be familiar with terms like ascension, uplift, or transcendence that talk about uh, a whole society proceeding to a higher level, uh, a whole society growing up. Um, so, these examples, uh, once you start looking for them, appear everywhere in science fiction. Uh, so I want to go ahead and, and start there. If we look at Star Trek's prime directive, uh, there is unfortunately, as far as I know, no canonical text uh, that tells us exactly what the wording of the prime directive is. However, there's this idea of non-interference with the development of pre-warp societies. And here pre-warp is clearly equivalent to pre-adolescent. They don't have the, uh, generally they're considered not to have the technological ability to travel between stars, to travel faster than light. And they don't have the emotional maturity to have formed a one world government. Um, whether or not those are, are, are good ways of looking at human development, uh, we'll save for later. Uh, but that seems to be the Star Trek view. Uh, but we can also see it very clearly um, in other stories in the history of science fiction. Uh, so once you start looking for developmental soteriology, you see it uh, in a number of places. Uh, this idea that I just mentioned of we'll contact you when you're old enough, uh, frequently attached to the labels zoo hypothesis and galactic quarantine, shows up, shows up as early as Star Maker by Olaf Stapleton, uh, the Sentinel, which uh, will become 2001 later on, uh, and Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke uh, throughout Star Trek uh, in Carl Sagan's Cosmos uh, and even in the species of the Tolan in Stargate SG-1 if you are sci-fi fans. Um, on a slightly more sinister note, there is this idea that we will guide you to a higher plane as a species, uh, and this appears in Foundation uh, in the Beings of Light in Battlestar Galactica, the first version uh, as well as messengers in Battlestar Galactica, the second version, uh, both of which display strongly um, Latter-day Saint soteriology uh, in their construction, uh, as well as the first ones in Babylon 5 and the Ori in Stargate SB-1. Even more sinister is we will breed humanity into a better species. Uh, we can see this in Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, the Bene Gesserit in June, uh, and the Uplift Universe by David Brin. Of course, this also appears in popular science. 
there is this idea of more advanced civilizations. Now, I make, my, I make an argument in my 2009 book, Life in Space, uh, that we don't have clear definitions of life or intelligence. Usually when we say life, we mean stuff that's sort of like us uh, in a way that we're not sure about. And intelligence is stuff that's very like us. Uh, and so I strive to get clearer definitions of those things. But in popular culture, I think that's very true, that intelligence means very like us. And I want to ask, what does it mean to be more intelligent? Because it cannot mean more like us than we are. So it must mean better than we are in a substantial way. And I want to ask who decides what it is to be better than us and who decides what it will mean for us to mature when we're talking about maturing into something that we haven't yet. Uh, concrete examples, we can look at Konstantin Sarkovsky. The earth is the cradle of mankind, uh, but one does not stay in the cradle forever. Carl Sagan speaks of technological adolescence in cosmos. More recently, we can look at David Grinspoon's Mature Anthropocene and Galactic Destiny. He has this very telling soteriology uh, in Earth and Human Hands. He says, you must only admit the possibility that immortality is occasionally the outcome of an evolutionary process to conclude that the universe must be headed in this direction. So developmental soteriology is clearly a developmental rather than an evolutionary metaphor. So I'd encourage people to speak of it as developmental rather than evolutionary. Biology has rejected development at the level of species and therefore this idea is not biological, but something else. Personally, I'm open to progressive and de developmental ideology, but I think we need to be ever so careful about where it comes from and why we believe in it. I do not think it should be packaged as science. In particular, I think it tracks this notion that we will outgrow religion uh, which we see in, in Star Trek as well as popular science, uh, which I tend to question. Um, it may be an interesting idea, but it's, it's curious about how we get there. Uh, and I think we need to be careful about where that idea comes from because the impersonal end of an anthropic principle is no less dangerous than the personal end of a God and equally able to develop a priesthood. The problem is not about supernatural agency, but about an axiology of progress and an elite no. And this brings us to the hegemony problem, the leadership problem. If there is a fixed and normative path to improvement, and if we know what it is, then there is a moral obligation to help groups along this path, often at the expense of individuals. Within a society, this becomes social engineering and when tied to biology, uh, and the development of the species, eugenics. And from outside a population, from another population, it becomes a type of colonial oversight, uh, what we think of as white man's burden. Developmental soteriology is, I think, deeply tied to authority uh, and that it, that is a problematic link. For as long as space has been treated as real estate, we have flirted with and sometimes ardently embraced a narrative that our species can mature along a predictable path escaping the cradle of earth and taking up um, an interstellar adulthood. Uh, I won't give you any spoilers, but I will say that it is a plot point in the Expanse series. Um, just after the television show uh, has ended and in the last book, uh, I think printed so far, uh, there's a clear link between space travel eugenics and galactic empire. And so, this is a very popular narrative within our society and something to be aware of as we step out into space. Specifically on the concept of liberty, if we are to grow, then I think we must reflect on how we grow and what we grow into. The resources necessary for reaching state, space and for living in space will require us to live more closely with one another and developmental soteriology can have a profound impact on how we view authority and liberty moving forward. Uh, a quick thank you. Uh, papers out there which you can easily find um, and uh, I am very excited about continuing this work uh, as the Blumberg Chair uh, in Washington DC starting next month. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you to Charles for putting this together. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas, for that really thoughtful, interesting talk. If you've got questions, by the way, everyone, please uh, type them into the question and answer box and uh, any questions you may have. While we're waiting to see if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll start off by asking you a question. Um, given the, the need to um, direct a society in space, given the extremities of, of space environments, do you think that it, it, it fits in with your view? I'm afraid, Charles, I've lost your audio. Someone... Okay, I was muted, but now I'm unmuted. <laughs> okay, not sure what happened there. Okay, uh, let me let me try and ask that again. Um, given the extremities of the space environment and uh, how how extreme those conditions are compared to the Earth, and the need to sort of, in some ways, direct society to be successful, chance of it unraveling, do you think moving out into space is, in terms of social development, really something categorically different from the way in which societies have developed? on the earth? And do you worry that um, this need to direct societies, which you alluded to, this, this problem with authority, will lead to more of these, what we would consider at least today, sort of slightly morally questionable ways of, of organizing human society, both biologically and socially, will actually become a necessity to survive in this environment? Well, I, I think like, uh, probably like uh, Hamilton and Hobbes, uh, I look at the necessity of having strong leadership and ask myself, what systems can we put in place that will help us to resist the temptations uh, inherent within strong leadership? And I would prefer to avoid uh, an ideology, much less a religion, uh, that had built into it this idea of, uh, of maturation and adulthood, um, especially if it's tied to a concept of science and positive knowledge uh, in a Comtean sense, uh, because I think this has done great harm already uh, in the human species and would not like to see it perpetuated. Thank you. And uh, just have a look in the questions. Please do ask questions, folks. <laughs> While we're waiting for those, I'll ask you another one. Um, there's a lot of talk about post-human solar system, genetic engineering in space, um, and, uh, uh, it need not necessarily be eugenics as such, rather, you know, in the sense of selecting people to necessarily be better, but simply introducing genes to allow for survival, better survival in space in the first place across the whole population. For example, you might imagine introducing genes to allow more radiation resistance in space, or at least the capacity to tolerate a higher radiation dose, which could result in liberty. It could result in you being able to spend more time, for example, on the surface of the moon or Mars and not inside a habitat in the subsurface because you eliminate some of these physical restrictions that are currently potential restrictions on people's ability to move around. So if you were to have the ability to use genetic engineering to introduce um, biological characteristics into humans across the whole population that actually resulted in an extension of liberty, particularly in terms of the freedom of movement in extreme conditions. And I'm thinking particularly of radiation. Uh, how would that fit, do you think, into your views of uh, morality and ethics? Uh, well, I guess I have to start by saying, I, I think you would be practicing eugenics um, because I, I think you're trying to build um, a, a new branch of humanity. Um, I don't know that that's a bad thing. I think that there are positive ways uh, one could go about this. Uh, one critical thing I think would be to avoid the idea that the new population was inherently better or worse. Uh, and I actually think the it Expanse science fiction series does a really good job of looking into the diversification of humanity that would come from a move into space. Uh, and I think if we can think of it as a diversification rather than an advancement, we will be on the right track. But that's a very difficult thing to do. So I think it would be good to have built into our um, ethical system uh, a value for that type of diversity in particular uh, and a respect for these questions of how easy it is to transition from one population to another. I'm actually more concerned about the distance problem um, in getting from one population to another and what it means uh, to, to 
birth someone into a society that is distant from human society, from earth society, excuse me. <laughs> That's a terrible mistake <laughs> uh, from my perspective. Um, I think we need to call both humans. Yes. Okay, thank you. We've got a question from uh, 1011, who also sent me an email, so I now know the name. It's Atamar Atia, and, and the question he has is that, he has, says he has experience for years living in isolated, self-sufficient desert um, communities. Is that religion and tradition become very much ways for inhabitants to express their identity, and they can do this. Uh, it, it can become quite aggressive, he's saying. So um, for another part of the community, the ones having stepped away from old ties, this can push them to violently resist any cooperation or dominance where they've got these uh, previous views. So I... I think it's more of a comment, but I guess the question that would emerge from what he's written there is, you know, how would you, uh, how would you deal with that, in particular in the context of what you've been talking about in terms of uh, social development? Is there a way to, to improve cooperation when people do have these very strong religious and traditional identities? Well, I will say I preach love of neighbor. Uh, and I think that uh, astrobiology gives us a chance to think about a neighbor who is very, very different. Um, and so if we can get in the habit of thinking of aliens as neighbors, uh, then I think we will be more likely to treat our neighbors as friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Jeremiah Johnson has actually asked a question that I think follows on from the points that you were making about distance, which is a question, do you see the development of cultures and spaces becoming more divergent the further away from Earth our societies get? So I suppose there's a question about whether there's any correlation between the physical distance and, and cultural divergence, which is interesting. I'm an evolutionary biology of, a biologist. Of, of course, there is a link between <laughs> the distance between populations and their divergence. Um, how long that would take to become something really significant is, is a difficult question. I'd love to see someone do the math. Um, it would have to do with the, the mutation load uh, it looks like there's going to be a big mutation load in travel between stars. Um, so with a really big mutation load and a distance of, you know, at least three years traveling at light speed, uh, those are going to be very different populations, I think, quite quickly. Yes. Interesting. And then I, this is a, a question actually that relates to your, your Barry Bloomberg chair, which is, could you comment on the concept of using science fiction to predict science fact? Uh, what is really a what what's really achievable is very different to TV, film, and stories. I think you touched on that from the religious perspective. Perhaps you could say a bit more about how you think there's a, uh, a link there at all between science fiction and, and science fact. I mean, I think there's a huge link um, between science fiction and engineering, and that is we don't do things until we imagine them. Uh, likewise, we don't discover things until we imagine they are possibilities. So I think it is, it is really important to develop our imagination and then to develop our critical imagination. So one of the interesting things for me is the relationship between what's usually called hard science fiction uh, that tries not to transgress against the bounds of science or minimally against the bounds of science uh, and what we might call more speculative uh, fiction, which is looking at, at questions of how we might develop um, being interested in the ethical questions, I'm very interested in the speculative stuff. Um, and I'm interested in how we expand our imagination. So I do think science fiction is an important step. Um, I think there has been a close, close tie uh, between science and science fiction in the development of rocketry. Uh, if you look into the concept of astrofuturism, it's very well documented. Uh, there's also, I think, a strong correlation between the ideology of Russian cosmism and the Russian, uh, sorry, the Soviet space program. Uh, and so I think we, we need to keep an eye on, on how our imagination as scientists shapes the imagination of science fiction and vice versa, uh, and how both of those shape public expectations. Yes, I agree with you about scientists being, you know, sometimes shockingly inspired by science fiction. I think a lot of us not necessarily went into scientific careers because we watch science fiction, but I've actually been heavily influenced in our aspirations, particularly in space exploration, by what we saw in things like uh, Star Trek. I know I, I certainly, from personal experience, watched a lot of the Star Trek episodes that involved astrobiology and exobiology and was inspired by them. Anyway, um, 
I don't see any other questions, but I'm going to ask you a final question. I just want to come back to link with theology and actually um, ask you a question similar to, to the one I, I asked Franz, which was, you know, you've got a, an isolated community in a very extreme environment. Um, the outside is monotonous. I mean, on the moon, it's mainly gray. On, on Mars, reds, browns, oranges. Uh, this is a spiritually, I think, draining environment. I'm not quite sure what I mean by that. But what I mean is, is there is, um, from a visual and sound and, and smells point of view, it's a, very, it's a very narrow environment in terms of human experiences, living in a habitat stuck on a, in a place like Mars. And so one could expect that as a counterweight to that, one might get, um, like I mentioned before, not necessarily a theocracy as such, but a very strong religious view or some sort of spiritual group that emerges that provides meaning in people's lives in an environment that's instantaneously lethal. And my question would be, if that happens, um, do you accept that as just a necessary part of living in that environment, a natural social development of that society? And so, you, you know, you end up with a, a really strong theocracy on Mars. Who cares? That's great. That's how it's developed. Or should you, from a liberty point of view, be concerned about an all-embracing theology taking over a settlement and actually try and push back against that? Or is that to undermine the very social basis of what's required to live in an instantaneously lethal environment. So I wonder what you thought about, um, you know, powerful religious currents emerging in extraterrestrial settlements and how you think uh, an authority in a society should deal with that. So I, I, I love the question. Um, I, I wanna take a step back in that I have discovered people use the word religion to mean fundamental beliefs about um, the way the universe is and what's important that are not true. Um, so you will find uh, you know, um, pagans in, in Rome uh, referring to Christianity as a religion, but not their own beliefs. Christians referring to paganism as religion, but not their own beliefs. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've heard any number of Christians tell me that they're not religious. They're just Bible believing. <laughs> um, so the, that word, I think, distracts us. I think that we will develop a belief system with a very, very strong deference to authority and incredibly strong social norms. And I think that in that context, it is very important to have an ethic of care for others that balances the respect for authority. I don't think we're gonna get away with from the authority because I think we need that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I look at Christianity and I say Christianity tends to have a fairly strong respect for authority, although Protestantism, interestingly, takes that in an interesting direction. Um, but the question is, what systems do we have that allow care for others and critical thinking to question our respect for authority alongside the authority? So if you have care for others, just to, to pursue that, that only becomes a counterbalance to authority if it emerges through voluntary consent of people. If the care for others is somehow imposed and I'll avoid, as you, I think, rightly point out, using the word religion, but let's say it's imposed within some sort of spiritual structure or set of beliefs about how people should behave, then the care for others becomes a form of overbearing authority and the, and the way in which one should care. Is, is that a concern or do you think not? Um, I think that if what you're talking about is love for the sake of duty, it's not what I would call really love. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, you have yeah. to have duty for the sake of love. Yes. And this turns out to be an existential question. Um, and that, that mindset has to be nurtured. Yeah. Love for the sake of uh, duty, for, love for the sake of duty can be imposed, but duty for the sake of love must be nurtured. Um, so on that, on that note, I want to come to a, a question from Sherry in the, in the chat, um, who's, who's concerned that, I'm saying we might have stopped developing as a species. And I, I wanna push back on that and say, no, I'm saying we never developed as a species. I don't think that we are more mature than our ancestors, um, biologically, to the extent that I think we're more mature than our ancestors. Uh, I think that we have learned some things about what it means to love one another. Um, and so the, the first important thing for me there is to separate that link between morality and biology, because biology doesn't do morality very well. I'm hopeful maybe some point in the future, but for right now, biology does morality very, very poorly. 
Um, and then when I talk about what it means to nurture something good, uh, I'm aware of where that's coming from. For me, it's informed um, by Christianity and the Enlightenment and humanism and Buddhism and Taoism. Um, but I, I label those things um, and, and don't attach them to biology because I don't think biology does that work for me. So to be a critical thinker, I want to know where I'm getting the ideas from. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, I, I'm going to, by the way, just everyone, just can I just um, request that you put questions in the question and answer? They're fine in chat, but my brain goes into overload when I'm trying to look at question and answers and chat at the same time. So if you do have a question, please put it in, in question and answers. But I do see there's one in chat that actually is similar to one in, question, in the question. So let me put this together. I think that there are two people asking similar things here, which is that if you... Um, you know, you go beyond the earth and maybe you maybe even, uh, like we were talking about earlier, engineer people in some way or they, or they adapt to that environment in some way where, they're, where they end up physically different. Um, but nevertheless, they may still have uh, emotional um, mechanisms that, that hark back to their state on the earth. So that in some sense, they're slightly immature in these extraterrestrial environments. Will we not still cover... Uh, carry with us the biological substrates of their immature former selves, as Alan asked, but also in the question section, could it also be these people regarded, will be regarded as some sort of inferior subspecies. Uh, so sort of, I, I guess, an extraterrestrial uh, racism that could emerge from a physical difference that results from the extraterrestrial environment. And how do we cope with these sorts of things? Yeah, I want to, I want to push back about calling either group immature. Um, because I think that gets us into, into difficulties. We will find that there are two groups, one on earth and one elsewhere, say, uh, that are adapted to two different environments. And the question will be, uh, in what way do they love one another and care for their environment in the environment they're in, rather than trying to have the exact same standard for both of them? Now, obviously, you've got to have some universal standards in order to have any form of communication. Uh, and that's the, the tricky bit. But I think when we can be aware that we are asking how they're fit to their environment rather than how they would be fit to ours, um, and if we can stop from the assumption that they should be fit for ours or we should be fit from theirs, uh, that we get more moral work done. Yes. Uh, I recommend uh, the discussion of quaddies in Lois McMaster Bujold's, uh, I think, Falling Free? Um, she does a good job with a, a species or a group of humans that has been engineered uh, for life in space. Uh, huh. And it's a fun read. Okay. I need to read that. Good, good. Um, I think we'll move on to the last question. Just, just before the question, a comment from Helen Schell about what you, what you need are the arts to resolve issues of other world living. And I agree with that general statement about the, the, the cold functionality that tends to be the focus of space exploration agencies and, even private space programs, but the need to introduce arts and artistic expression into space exploration. Uh, for example, I don't see why you wouldn't have a, you know, a space station decked out in 18th century furniture, for example, why not? You know, th this human expression that's actually sort of currently very much lacking in space exploration may be one way to resolve some of the, uh, the cultural blandness of, of space, if you like. Let me come on to this question. Um, well, actually it's more of a statement, but I'll, I'll try and turn it into a question um, from the Enigmatic 1011 again, um, I think it's dangerously naive to assume that settlers will drop their previous beliefs and set up something new altogether. Uh, people have always been inclined to form groups and dissociate themselves from other groups to feel distinctive. So let me let me just um, try and turn that into a question, which I suppose is that he's getting at this point, which I think is uh, very right, which is that you're building a society... Um, so this is Itamar, by the way, so I do know his name. Um, he, he's getting at this point that, that unlike on the earth, most societies, as you uh, explain, have emerged from existing societies with previous culture. And that's not to say that when you send people into space, they will be free of culture. They will take what they know from the earth. But you are still nevertheless putting a group of people in a very different environment. And they've got to sort of construct uh, something that's going to be really very new compared to the way in which some societies have emerged on the earth. Do you think that the space environment is sufficiently new that people do have to come up with new forms of culture or do you think that what we take with us will be strong enough to rebuild successful societies 
uh, in space without having to rethink everything? Uh, several cool questions there. Uh, as an evolutionary biologist, um, species diversify. You can leave them in the same environment, they'll still diversify. Um, so of course there's going to be change. Uh, I think space will accelerate that. Uh, I am somewhat pessimistic about the um, resource costs to transporting humans to other planets. Uh, so I'm not sure um, we're going to develop a population center somewhere else. I hope we do. Um, in a, uh, I think, uh, well, we'll just say a, in a shockingly Christian way, uh, I want to point out uh, that we tend to take for granted the species imperative uh, that we must preserve the species, we must preserve our individual population, uh, and we must expand to cover as much of the universe as possible. Uh, that those need not be our highest priorities, and I, I hope they won't be. Um, it may be that it's good to stay on Earth. Let's have the discussion. Um, I think it's good to expand, but I don't think it's good to expand just because there's more humans. Yes. Um, and so let's think about why it might be good for Mars for us to go to Mars, not just why it's good for us to go to Mars. Uh, and let's be willing, um, if we need to give other populations space, uh, to accept that as a possibility, not to fatalistically take it, but to say, let's have a real discussion about what we value. Um, and that's, that's what I would argue for. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. I think we'll end there. Um, this is, as I said earlier, this is good that we have this buffer between talks. These are fascinating discussions, and I'm not going to stop people at 30 minutes. So it's great that we've got so much interest uh, from people to talk and this, this extra time where we can. So there's a couple of minutes before our next speaker, which is actually me. Uh, before we do, so thank you again, Lucas. Fantastic talk. And thank for you. joining us um, at this webinar series. Just a quick logistics point. Uh, one of the panelists has, has asked, uh, said that you can't, panelists can't post questions in the question and answer. And apparently Kelly's saying that's the case. It's an annoying bug of Zoom, uh, which might be why people, panelists have been putting questions in chat. So thank you for that. I guess I will just have to watch the chat and the question and answer box at the same time. So if you're a panelist, uh, yeah, put your question in the chat and I'll try and keep an eye out there as well. So not particularly helpful function of Zoom. But anyway, it seems like that's the way it is. Good. So we'll have a one minute break, everyone. Take a, 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 a breath and then we'll move on to the next speaker, which is going to be me. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll make a start uh, with the next talk. Uh, good morning, everyone. Anyone who's just joining us, welcome to the um, Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty webinar series. Uh, the next speaker is me, so I'll, I'll do the strange thing of introducing myself. So I'm, I'm Charles Cockell. I'm a biologist at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, my interest is in life in extreme environments, microbiology of extreme environments, and the microbiology of the space environment. Uh, I also happen to have an interest in political philosophy have been fascinated particularly by questions of liberty in space for the last, I guess, 15, 20 years. Um, hence this uh, meeting here. We've also organized previous meetings out of Edinburgh on extraterrestrial liberty with the British Interplanetary Society. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, some work I've been doing, when I say work, sort of in my spare time. It's not officially funded work through the university, but in my holidays, which links into my interest in political philosophy, which emerged when I came here to Edinburgh. And that is the question of the use of Scottish islands and their lessons for extraterrestrial free governance. And one of the things that we might be interested in doing, I think we'll hear more about this in the next four days, is thinking about how we can use uh, settlements and um, societies on the earth to gain insights about how you might extrapolate those into the extraterrestrial environment and develop, develop settlements beyond. And this emerged actually from a, um, from a, oh dear, this is frozen up. Okay. <laughs> That's now working. This emerged from a, um, from a trip to the Isle of Egg. Uh, Anna Leo, I think is on here, will remember that trip to the Isle of Egg. This is where my interest came from. Why would you be interested in using Scottish islands to think about extraterrestrial liberty or society beyond the earth. Well, Scotland is home to about 168 islands of about 100 acres or greater, and substantially more uh, at a smaller scale. And they vary enormously in their history, culture, and population. Some of them have been inhabited for literally beyond a millennium, 
Uh, some of them are now uninhabited, but were inhabited. And I will talk about one of those in the context of this talk, St Kilda. And some, of course, have never been inhabited, so are not relevant to this talk. But there are a substantial number of, of those as well. And during the last seven years, essentially during my holidays, I've been looking at these islands with respect to their governance structures and trying to understand what we might learn, uh, what general lessons we could extract from their histories to better understand uh, democracy and liberty beyond the earth. And I'm going to talk today about the Hebridean Islands, which are these islands shown on the left-hand side on the west coast of Scotland, and just pick up on a few examples. I don't have time to talk about all the things I've looked at in the last seven years. I'm going to pull out just some examples that I thought uh, would be interesting. Muck, by the way, is, is one of the islands I'm going to come to in a moment, hence this sort of rather cryptic statement. Why would we think these islands were, were useful for understanding life beyond the earth? Well, as I said, there's a very large number of them, and they range in population sizes. Some of them are less than 10, up to over 10,000. And so these islands are, if you, in some sense, a snapshot of the different stages of an extraterrestrial settlement, from the first people to land on an island through to a, a full-scale society, the sort of thing that is, Im is imagined by Elon Musk. So what you've got there is a potential temporal snapshot across the spatial dimensions of those societies. Their history is well documented in books and papers. It's easily accessible. And despite the... Um, the similarities of these islands, they've carried out diverse experiments in living, as John Stuart Mill might have put it, from coercive lairds. Lairds, by the way, are a sort of um, uh, leader or, or overseer of an island. It's a Scottish word for um, the person who runs an island through to participatory democracies in more recent times, I'll talk about. Now, what's interesting about these islands is that despite the fact that they are environmentally different, uh, in, in a general sense, at least on a broad planetary scale, they're environmentally very similar. They sit within the environmental conditions of, of coastal Scotland. And so in some ways, you can think of them as, as having the minimum number of, of variables other than the different societies they've set up and their populations. So from a scientific point of view, social sciences point of view, they are an extremely good set of controlled experiments, or at least as good as you can get, given uh, the, the vagaries of human populations. The present day populations are well educated. I don't mean that in a snobby way. What I mean by that is that, you know, many people there have knowledge of space exploration and, uh, and political philosophy. So you can actually engage in quite interesting conversations with islanders about specifically how their conditions might be transplanted into space. There's a dialogue to be had there between the occupants of these islands and the extraterrestrial condition. And they're easily accessible. There are other island chains one could think about, like Polynesian islands, that might also make very good analogues for space exploration. But of course, they're expensive to get to, at least for someone in the UK, whereas Scottish islands are extremely cheap to get to. So all of these things come together to make these rather a good uh, extraterrestrial uh, analogue for, for moving out into space. Here are just some of the islands and their population sizes, just to give you some idea of the range of them. I'm going to focus in on a few of these to illustrate some general points, as I say, about liberty. But I just want to show you just the wide variety. These are just in uh, the Hebrides as well. There are a great number of other islands uh, elsewhere. So I first of all want to go to the Isle of Egg. Interesting place, 31 kilometers squared, has a population of 105. I should say it varies year on year. So this is a, a sort of typical population any given time. And the Isle of Egg uh, is an interesting place because it's very different from most other Scottish islands. In 1997, they got fed up with their absentee laird who never arrived on the island. He ran it from a distance and they decided to take ownership of their island. So immediately at once, you can see a possible parallel with the extraterrestrial settlement. Imagine a settlement being run from the earth where the managers of that settlement, maybe a corporation or the government, uh, start to lose interest in it, they don't really turn up, and the settlement is never really well managed. This is what happened on the Isle of Egg, where the laird lived on mainland Scotland and never came to the island. So they essentially had what can only be described as a mini revolution. It was not violent. They raised the money and they bought their island, and they set up the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust and essentially established a participatory democracy on this island. And the overall planning of the community is undertaken by the trust. And it's worth just having a quick look at this trust to understand 
uh, what they did. What they wanted to do was to avoid the traditional management of islands, which has been the case throughout much of Scottish history, which is the Laird. And this is what McPhee had to say about the Laird of Colonsay, which is another island. He is the enigmatic embodiment of good and evil, hope and fear, keeper of the gate in heaven, of heaven and hell, fate's own fulcrum, overlord, landlord. So you can see in that statement, lairds can be good and bad, and essentially they're unpredictable. This is what the islanders of Egg wanted to avoid. And I suspect that if you start to implement um, even the most benign uh, um, dictatorships, if you like, in the extraterrestrial environment, you will end up with the same situation. So they formed the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust. It has three members. Uh, one of the members of, is the Isle of Egg Residents Association. This is basically the local people. This is the participatory democracy where they get together and they decide on a day-to-day -day basis how their island is going to be run. And mapped onto the extraterrestrial case, this would be the people living in the settlement. They have uh, a management structure. So if you can think of it as a uh, a simple executive branch. There are four directors who are elected by the community. The main board holds quarterly meetings and the day-to-day -day management is entrusted to the island uh, directors who are elected. And they also meet on a monthly basis. But the whole island meets in the town hall to discuss uh, the actual implementation of decisions that might be proposed by the directors. And then it's supported by a part-time secretary. So the Isle of Eggs Residents Association is not a bad analog for how you might set up a simple participatory democracy on the moon. What's interesting is that there are two other groups in this, um, in this board, which are the Highland Council and the Scottish Wildlife Trust. There's no obvious analog to the Scottish Wildlife Trust, maybe a planetary protection board for Mars. But the interesting analog is that you've got organisations from the mainland of Scotland represented um, in the Heritage Trust. So in the extraterrestrial case, the Highland Council and the Scottish Wildlife Trust might be a director from planet Earth or from a corporation from planet Earth who represent the interests of the external power, for example, a nation state on Earth that might have some vested interest in the settlement. And in fact, the, the Egg Heritage Trust is an enormously interesting analog for how you can bring together the local community and people with an external interest in a peaceful, productive manner. So again, I think this is a useful, um, a useful case study for the extraterrestrial environment. What's also interesting is they've constructed independent organizations to oversee economic activity. So here we see overlapping but independent bodies of voluntary association. So they've got egg construction that oversees the building works on the island and egg trading that oversees any form of trade with people outside the settlement, for example, tourists, but also trading with the mainland. Again, you can see immediate possible analogues with the extraterrestrial environment. Maybe you have moon construction that oversees construction and the economics of construction in the lunar environment, and maybe moon trading that deals with um, uh, trading with external people. And part of this success is that there's no central control here. As I say, these are overlapping bodies that are in some sense a little bit in conflict because they have their own interests, but that separation prevents an all overarching sort of central power on the Isle of Egg. Uh, in the 24 years that this structure has existed, it's proven highly successful. And part of that is because the islanders have a common sense of purpose. They're living in, a, in a relatively extreme conditions. They want it to be successful. And those who took part in setting up the settlement sort of feel duty bound to make it a success. And the democratic nature of the island overcomes this, uh, th this, this sort of slightly dictatorial approach to management, which is typically being characterized by lairdships. So I think that the Isle of Egg is, is an interesting uh, case study in participatory democracy. It's something I've been examining to try and understand it better. But I'm going to stop there on Egg and move on just to some other points. If we move on to the Isle of Muck, which is much smaller, has a smaller population, this is an island that actually does have a laird and has done since the 19th century. It's in the McEwen family. And I visited Muck on several occasions over the last years and had some interesting conversations with Lawrence McEwen, who's now just recently handed over to his son, to try and understand how his lairdship has not collapsed into dictatorship. And the simple answer is that he is, a, as a personality, is a delightful individual and is not inherently tyrannical. 
Um, so in some sense, the island has depended upon a benevolence in their leader that is just a matter of luck. He also has a specific philosophy of management, and I've bolded one of the comments he made in one of the interviews I had with him, where he said that he helped people where they needed it, but otherwise let them be. In other words, he recognized the difficulties of living in this extreme environment, and he uses his experience to help people out where they need it. But unless it's absolutely necessary, he backs off from them. So here we've got an example of what one might call a benevolent dictatorship. I think he would be horrified to be described as that way. And I mean that in the most uh, in, in the most complimentary way. But the crucial point is here is on this island, people are relying on someone not to overstep their power. And this has always been a problem with management. As James Madison once said, if, main, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. And framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men, uh, apologies for, the, for his sexist view here, but general statement stands. The great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and the next place oblige it to control itself. A Machiavellian characteristic um, uh, prose uh, said, it is necessary for whoever arranges to found a republic and establish laws in it to presuppose that all men are bad and they will use their malignity of mind every time uh, they have the opportunity to do so. And this, uh, I think, brings forward the central point that the Isle of Egg um, has put in place a management structure that tries to head off any form of malign dictatorship, which was always the problem with their laird, or at least a laird who was never even present. Whereas on Muck, although it works, you're still relying on the benevolence of a family, a single family. And that cannot be um, assumed in the extraterrestrial case. I would say, although Lawrence McEwen has done a fantastic job on Muck, uh, the Isle of Egg is an example of what you probably want to be doing. Now, there is a, um, a a contradiction, of course, in the sense of community and the sense of liberty. And I want to take you to Connellsay Island, where there has been much observation by several people on the sense of community. For example, Alexander, um, who spent some time on this island, noted that um, there was a strong overlapping sense of, of community in the, in the islanders caused by, as he writes, the island web, the island wide web of innumerable interconnected conversations. Um, and a hidden catalog of organized gatherings uh, that many bigger communities might envy. In other words, one of the benefits of maintaining a community in, in these extreme environments is this very strong sense of, of communal togetherness that results from living in a confined space on an island. And we can expect that to be the case on the moon or Mars. But the flip side of this is that the familiar goldfish bowl, which seems so friendly and comforting most of the time, can suddenly feel suffocatingly small. Creeping peer pressure could come out of a clear blue sky. And this is the problem with isolation, is this tendency towards uh, authoritarianism that does not necessarily come from the authority itself or the management structure, but from the peer pressure that emerges from a confined group of people where interdependence is necessary for survival. And if we go out to St Kilda, which is an even more extreme island, which is now no longer occupied, it was evacuated in 1930. Uh, that's a fascinating story in itself that I don't have time to talk about. But there's a great deal of history about how that island was run. It was inhabited by about 100 people for many hundreds of years. And they were truly separated from the mainland. There was very little communication. And this island is a particularly fascinating example uh, for looking at structures of democracy. But here again, we see the same sorts of reports from uh, McLean, for example, who said many people would regard life at St Kilda as anything but ideal because of the absence of opportunity for individual originality and, cr and creativeness, which though to some extent dependent on the firm support of a culture are easily smothered by a cultural pattern, which is too strong. Undeniably, there was little room for individuality. And even in the 17th century, Martin Martin, who wrote one of the first accounts of these islanders said the voice of one is the voice of all the rest their common interest uniting them firmly together so you can see again that living in extremity requires the sense of community that has many beneficial aspects of creating collegiality but at the same time it crushes individuality and in the extraterrestrial environment where individual creativity may be necessary to come up with solutions to living in those extreme environments. This is not necessarily an end state 
we particularly want. And herein lies one of the major challenges of attempting to maintain a sense of community that allows successful survival in extremes, but at the same time trying to head off a crushing sense of conformity that, that essentially reduces the environment to uh, one of a sort of uh, conformist despotism. Now, you might say, well, surely that's okay. We just do what they do on egg and we create a democracy. But St Kilda is a fascinating example of how you can have illiberality alongside democracy, dictatorship within a democracy. St Kilda had a very effective participatory democracy. In fact, it met every day. You can see them uh, at the top of this picture here. Every morning, the community met um, in this one place outside one of the houses in the in the uh, community to discuss everything that was happening for the day. And um, McLean says, nor was the parliament above hearing the island's gossip, but for all that, the St Kilda parliament was a serious institution. So they took their democracy seriously. And yet it was possible to have despotism because here is an example of how this can happen in the 19th century. Uh, the Church of Scotland took over St Kilda and they sent over a new uh, minister to run the island. And as Maclean points out, um, John Mackay, who took over the, the, uh, the church on the island, he did so not with enlightened leadership, but with blinkered despotism. So shortly after his arrival, he, uh, he established a vibrantly harsh rule. He instigated surfaces, services in the church on Sunday at 11, 2 and 6. Uh, they lasted for two to three hours. He preached long repetitious sermons in Gaelic, which involved the same message of hellfire and eternal damnation to all sinners. Children uh, were forced to come to church at two. Conversation between islanders was forbidden from Saturday evening until Monday morning. Singing or whistling was a serious sin. Uh, children were forbidden to play games and so on and so forth. So here we have an example of a despotism within a structure where there is participatory democracy. So democracy does not necessarily buy you freedom and nor does it guarantee it. And Judge Learned Hand said in 1944, in a similar way, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. Where it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. So it's no good just creating a constitutional structure that is democratic and implementing a structure that is democratic if one person essentially takes over the cultural aspects of a society such that essentially a dictatorship is running alongside a democracy. And so we might sort of try and sum up here. And, and again, as I say, in the interest of time, I just want to stop here and draw out some general lessons. There are many others. These are, these are fascinating islands. We could observe that, that having overlapping voluntary associations is important. On the Isle of Egg, for example, it's not just the democracy, it's the independent economic groups. It's the, um, the different clubs and societies that may seem very trivial, but what they allow people to do is to get away from other people and they dilute out power. They, they prevent one person from dominating everything on the island. And St Kilda had none of these voluntary associations. So it's easier for one person to come in and dominate the island's culture despite the participatory democracy. So we might suggest many voluntary overlapping areas of interest in an extraterrestrial settlement to allow for democracy, but also to prevent um, domination of the culture. Continuous external influences are important. That would not have happened on St Kilda if there had probably been more people coming in and out of that island from the mainland who saw what was going on. Because they were isolated, McKay could do what he did. And in the extraterrestrial settlement case, I think it's extraordinarily dangerous to have a settlement a long way away, for example, on the moon or particularly on Mars or maybe in the outer solar system, which is utterly isolated. Clearly, it becomes potentially possible for that settlement to come under the control of one individual. So we need uh, a free movement in and out of those settlements. The capacity to leave, uh, Jim Schwartz is going to talk more about that, and also access to information. We need settlers to know what's going on in their settlement, who's running what, for example, who's running the oxygen machines, to be able to uh, to be able to take part in the democratic process and challenge what's happening uh, on the islands. One of the interesting things about Scottish islands, just to finish off here, is that I mentioned those, those differences in population scales. They also allow us to understand what happens on the islands uh, when we go from small settlements to much larger settlements of, of thousands. And I, I won't discuss that here, 
but there's an enormous amount of information about transition from participatory democracy, such as on St Kilda and Egg, through to representative modes of government that you see on Isla, where you've actually got a, a separation of powers. You've got an executive branch, you have a police force on there um, that is essentially a judiciary, although the laws themselves are set on mainland Scotland. And you've uh, you've not got a legislature because, of course, the laws are established on Scotland. But you do have sort of local rules and regulations that are decided by the community. So there's a sort of rudimentary separation of powers. And one might even think about what I've called the preemptive free governance, where you actually introduce the separation of powers at a much earlier stage, even in matters of settlements where there are a few tens of people. You might think about rudimentary executive branches that allow for a more fluid transition to representative government as that settlement grows. So there are a lot of lessons to be learned there. So I think I was summarized by saying that Scottish islands provide a spatial snapshot of temporal evolution of an extraterrestrial settlement. Uh, these are fascinating places. I'm just gonna finish off by acknowledging all the islanders who have indulged my interest in comparing them to space settlers, uh, sometimes with slightly different results. I'd uh, particularly like to thank Lawrence McEwen uh, for his discussions about laird ships and management on Scottish islands. He, he's had an enormous uh, uh, influence on, on how I think this should happen and others who have provided insights, ideas on island governance. So I'll stop there. Sorry, I've overrun. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to my talk. And um, we will transition directly then into questions. And let me just get this up and um, let's start off, uh, first of all, with a um, a question here from uh, 1011 again, who's asking, um, the problem with the participatory democracy is you need a certain optimal number of participants for it to work. Having lived in a number of so-called intentional communities of different sizes and having acquaintances, I've noticed the following. Below about 100 to 150 voting members, you get fragmentation into smaller cliques, which form coalitions, independent of what is discussed. Above 400 members, you get a disinterest in government with many, with merely the ambitious and naturally dominant getting involved in eventually dictating policy. So thank you for that comment. I think that's a, a really fascinating uh, comment. And I'll sort of turn it into a question, which is really, you know, can participatory democracy or democracies of these kinds work in space? I, I think what you say is absolutely true. And I didn't discuss this, but on the Isle of Egg, for example, there's one individual who can remain nameless, who, who's been very dominant in their participatory democracy. And, and she's very driven. I mean, she's just fascinated by management and very keen on the island's future. It's not a negative thing, but she naturally has a strong dominating role in the community. She is benevolent, of course, but she is also, she is also checked by the participatory democracy. There's only a certain amount she can do. So I think as long as the democracy is active and functioning um, and people take an interest in it, you can overcome the problem of um, the democracy being, being dominated by particular individuals. But of course, we know this is a problem in participatory democracy. It was one of the problems in ancient Athens. And this is one of the reasons why you need some sophistication in the system. Having a participatory de democracy where people just meet and have a big discussion about things in the open air, which is sort of roughly what happened in, in ancient Athens. We're not quite like that, but but they had these, um, th these open fora for discussion leads to demagogues taking over the community. And what you need is, you, need, you do need a board of directors who implements decisions. You need some sort of um, structure for the way in which questions get discussed. On the Isle of Egg, I could go into this in some detail, but they have evolved a structure where there are formal mechanisms that prevent demagogues from taking over and where the, the process of discussion is actually quite effective. But I think you're absolutely right that none of this is perfect, right? Um, as you get to larger groups, if people don't take an interest in their democracy, then particularly forceful, dominant people can take over. We, we see this on the earth, countless examples of democracies falling prey to demagogues and dictators. And on the very small scale, uh, countless examples of small groups of people being dominated by uh, factions that fragment. And the founding fathers, of course, were obsessive about the problem of faction in early American society. 
So there's no simple answer to this. And the, the, the simple answer I would give is the case for any democracy, which is it needs to be a process of ongoing discussion. There isn't some magic formula that you implement and then that's good for the next thousand years. Democracy is something that people have to take an interest in. It has to be an ongoing discussion. As society changes, it needs to modify itself. And the challenge is to inculcate into any society that, that healthy sense of discussion, dissent and disagreement that allows those structures to modify. And as we all know, that doesn't always work. And I think the Scottish islands are interesting because they do provide us uh, with some insights of how we might uh, create societies where this discussion does does continue and does evolve. Egg, I would say, is a particularly interesting island because there there is a healthy discussion. No one is dominated. And it has modified itself over the last 24 years since it was founded. So if it can work on egg, we know at least it can work for 24 years on the moon or Mars. And I suspect egg will carry on uh, much longer because it's working very well. So Analia Beatis asks, what kind of cultural life or cultural traditions did you see on these islands in terms of craft or art making? Did these contribute in any notable way to cohesion and democracy? I think that's also a very good question. It comes back to Helen's point about art being very important. Yes, uh, one of the things I've noticed on these islands is that art and craft groups are part of these, what I described earlier as overlapping voluntary associations where People are not just subject to um, the rule of the participatory democracy. They also get together in groups and over making paintings or doing pottery. They're talking about politics. So there are these independent groups. I wouldn't go as far, far as calling them factions because they're not in opposition to the management, but they provide an opportunity for people to get away from a suffocating management at the center and express their ideas and their dissent amongst other groups. As I say, uh, overlapping um, organ intermediate organizations, if you like, and they've often been described in political philosophy as intermediate organizations. These organizations that sit between the state or the management structure and individuals. They're very, very important for diluting out the power of the state, for acting as a bulwark between individuals and the governing powers and for putting up resistance against state power. So if the governance authority says we're doing this on the island, the local pottery group can get together and say, well, we all think this is really bad. So maybe other people think that, and maybe we can get together and ask the, the art people what they think about this, people who are painting. And slowly but surely, a resistance emerges at that intermediate level. So I think these are extremely important. I would also say, um, um, Annalie, the, 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 quite apart from the political side, these organizations are important for people to express their artistic interests in what is a relatively quite um, extreme environment. Sean McMurn is saying this sounds a bit like Burke's defense of civil society. Yes, I'm certainly horrified about that because I find Burke, <laughs> Burke's defense a little bit too um, conservative for me. But you're right in the sense that he pointed out um, that society should evolve rather than um, emerged by revolutionary change. He, of course, was horrified by the French Revolution when he wrote Reflections on the Revolution in France. His book was, in some sense, the English counterpoint to the horror of what had happened in France. And he was very much, well, he was quite strongly pro-monarchy. But one of the, uh, I suppose, aspects of his writing that I agree with is this idea that society should evolve slowly by constant discussion and that revolutionary change and coming up with idealistic organizations uh, essentially like an architect might design a building, designing a society from scratch, irrespective of human behavior, has not always been a good outcome. Uh, so conservative institutions that just continue because they've been there for thousands of years, uh, such as, you know, some violent monarchies, for example, or, or other forms of, of governance are not good, but revolutionary change, idealistic institutions are also not necessarily very good. You've got to take into account human behavior, the realities of human behavior, like Lucas was saying, but also uh, evolve them over time. So there is a, a little bit of um, a, a, a Burke-like view on this. Have you published a paper on this and where might we find it? Laura Montgomery is, is asking, and that provides me with the ideal opportunity to advertise that we're writing a book from this. So next year, we're going to be publishing a book called The Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty, uh, which is going to be produced by Oxford University Press. And my chapter in that book is, is what I presented uh, this morning. So it will be out there. Uh, so I haven't written the paper, but it will be 
coming out with some of these data uh, and discussions. So here's a really good question. What will the pottery group do if the government turns off their oxygen supply? And I think that gets to, and I'm, I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to stop in a moment and give us all a break. But I think that gets to the core of actually the categorical problem with the extraterrestrial case, which I raised in the introduction, which is that you could argue, what's the difference between a moon society or a, lo or a lunar society or a Mars society and a society on the earth. Surely it's just the same old questions about individual freedom and liberties. Uh, this isn't a very special or interesting discussion because you're just talking about things people have been talking about for hundreds of years ago, for hundreds of years. And the difference with the extraterrestrial cases, you rightly point out, is that in these cases, we will be having to produce something by technology that we depend upon on a second to second time scale. So if the government takes away your food and water, at least you can run off into a forest, at least in some countries, and you can plan revolution. Or if a military organization invades your country, you can run off into a forest and maybe uh, plan um, uh, sabotage. So there's a, there's a temporal buffer there between your death and the emergence of dictatorship. Whereas in space, the oxygen you breathe, you require on a second second time scale. Switch that off and you're dead within a matter of minutes. And so the oxygen problem emerges as a particular problem about how you manage that in space and prevent it from being controlled by a single authority. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow when I talk about freedom engineering. But I suspect that others will come up uh, with this problem in other talks as well. But I think it is one of the central problems in space, how you prevent oxygen coming under the control of a single individual. And I should point out, there's 101 has pointed out, um, this is not a new idea either. It's, you can find it in science fiction. The, the first total recall film is the canonical science fiction depiction of a group of people on Mars where um, the, uh, the corporation controlling the settlement uh, starts switching off the oxygen supply. So science fiction writers, have imagined this for a long time. Stephen Baxter might talk more about this tomorrow, but but yeah, that raises a problem. On And this is the one big difference between the Scottish Islands and the extraterrestrial case, is if the authority becomes malignant, the potters, as you write it, as you write it, can just go off and go back to their houses and complain and decide how they're going to change their governance. If someone shuts off the oxygen while they're making their pots, then they're all dead. So this is a much more extreme sense and foreboding, if you like, of central control and dictatorship that has been unseen on the earth and unseen on Scottish islands, even with the worst layers. Um, so I think that's an interesting question. I'm just having a look here, no further questions in the chat. We are 20 past. Um, and I'll, I'll just take one final, one final question, then I'll end off here. Do you think that any form of democracy will be more effective on Mars uh, than strong leadership? And again, I think that gets to the heart of what I hope we're discussing in these four days, which is where is this balance? And there's no answer to this, right? This is something that was recognized um, in ancient Athens, it was forcefully discussed by Thomas Hobbes, which is this incessant um, uh, attempting to sort of balance liberty and authority, individual liberty and authority. No society ever gets this right. And one might even define a free society as a society that never tries to get it right. Because if you try and get it right, then in some sense you've become a dictatorship because society is always changing. So if you say, right, this is the balance between liberty and authority, we've decided that, and this is how it's gonna to be. Tomorrow, there are going to be different social challenges. There are going to be different fashions and different ideas. That balance between liberty and authority necessarily changes. So in some sense, you could define a free society as one where, where there's never any dogmatic decision about liberty and authority, but it's constantly under discussion. So I would answer your question of, do you think that any form of democracy will be effective on Mars with strong leadership? I think both things will be necessary. Strong leadership will be necessary to survive in an instantaneously lethal environment. But you also want to have uh, some form of democratic deliberation because uh, situations in these settlements need to be discussed with the people. And the Scottish example, just to return to my own talk, is, is an example of how democracy can be highly effective at preventing either absentee uh, managers or managers who become despotic. So there's a connection there between a necessary democracy and necessary strong leadership. 
where is the balance between those two things? The simple answer is there isn't. It's something that has to be constantly discussed. But what you don't want to do is collapse into either extreme. You don't want an anarchic democracy such that there's no order at all. Everyone is just doing what they want. And there's potentially um, a collapse of a social order. And for example, because of a lack of leadership and management, not enough oxygen gets produced. And suddenly everyone wakes up one day and discovers that there's insufficient oxygen and you end up with a catastrophic situation. And nor do you want to collapse into abject dictatorship where everything is under the control of a group of people, a cabal of people or a single individual. How you do that is not something that can ever be determined because we've never managed to successfully do that on the earth as present day societies on our own planet attest democracy and um, and yet having a sufficiently strong leadership to allow a society to exist it has been a perennial problem for 10,000 years of settled human history. And it, there is no formula. If there was, we would never have dictatorship again. So this is not, not something we can we can satisfactorily lay out. As Franz said, you know, everything we do has to take into account um, uh, the realities of, of, of collections of human individuals that are not predictable and they're not easily reduced to scientific uh, analysis. But what I would say is as we go into space, we can decide we want to we want to create societies where there is liberty and rather than just allowing it to emerge through a totally random process, we can have meetings like these and other sorts of meetings where we discuss freedom in space and we write books on extraterrestrial liberty and maybe provide some sort of intellectual groundwork for people to think about how can you build a free society, free governance in space that is effective and what sort of mechanisms can we use? So it's not a hopeless case. People can think about this before and they can move towards a direction of balancing authority and liberty as um, I, I would contend good societies have attempted to do for hundreds of years. So it's 25 past um, uh, and I'm rambling too much. So I'm going to stop now and we're going to take a break, go and grab a, a cup of uh, tea. I'm just going to have some lunch, go and grab some lunch. And please do come back or you can hang online if you want for 1 p.m. when we're going to have our keynote talk for today by Anthony Pagden, who's going to talk about the Enlightenment in the 21st century. That's going to be a bit of a more uh, broad discussion about Enlightenment in 21st century societies. But I know he's also going to talk a little bit about its application to the space environment as well. But I think it'll give you a very interesting uh, context about the values of the Enlightenment and how we think societies might be, free societies might be run. Thank you very much, everyone. See you at, uh, I'll be back here before one, but otherwise the talk will start at exactly one o'clock. Thank you for joining our, our first morning session. Speak to you later. Um, let's, let's make a start, good. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for coming to our keynote talk in the Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty. And for those of you who may be joining us, uh, maybe didn't come to the morning session, welcome to this set of webinar talks thinking about uh, the conditions for, for liberty beyond the earth and particularly in the extreme environments of places like the moon or Mars where organization in those extremes, the need for things like oxygen might create very different conditions for liberty. And I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Anthony Pagden to talk to us about his views on particular conditions of um, values of the enlightenment and not just in space, but how we might apply them in the 21st century. So Anthony is currently a uh, distinguished professor in departments of political science and history at the University of California, LA. His main area of research has been in a prolonged contact of Europe with uh, non-European world. He's also written on the history of law, uh, anthropology and of modern Spanish America and how to think and not think about the history of ideas. He has a very broad view of things, but he also has a long history of uh, not just writing academic papers and academic books, but taking these ideas out into the wider world. For example, um, he's written on uh, the 2,500 year struggle between the East and West. And uh, his books have been translated into several European and Asian languages. And I think probably the book that is most relevant to what he's going to talk about today, which is, uh, and I'll plug it for you, and it's well worth reading, excellent book, The Enlightenment and Why It Still Matters. Many people tend to think of the Enlightenment as something that happened in the 18th century and you have vague ideas about people like Adam Smith and Hume, but don't actually seem to realize that we're still living in the Enlightenment and uh, much of what we think and how our societies are organized through from science to political philosophy are continuations 
of some of these bigger ideas that uh, were not necessarily established in the 18th century, but certainly came to the fore in the 18th century and influenced society at the larger scale. So we're still living in the Enlightenment, which brings us to the question of how is how are these ideas of the Enlightenment relevant to the 21st century? And in the context of our discussion today uh, in space, and I thought it would be particularly interesting to hear from Anthony to put a wider context into this, into the ideas of liberty beyond the earth, because of course those ideas sit within the context of what's gonna happen in the 21st, 22nd century and, and so on, on the earth, where by far the majority of the human population will reside for a long time to come. So in order to understand liberty and freedom beyond the earth, we still need to think about what might happen here on this planet and how that might fashion liberty beyond the earth. So without any further distraction, um, I will uh, hand over to Anthony Pagden. Thank you very much for coming and giving us a keynote talk, Anthony, on the subject of um, the Enlightenment in the 21st century. I should say, finally, um, this is in association with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So Royal Society of Edinburgh. So I shouldn't um, uh, miss that as well. It's a crucial part of our talk. This is a, a joint event with them. So thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Charles. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this meeting, um, uh, which is a great honor for me to be allowed to address this gathering um, in what <laughs> virtually at least is one of the great capitals of the Enlightenment, of course, Edinburgh. And I would also like to thank uh, the Royal Society of Scotland, a great Enlightenment institution, one of whose founders was, of course, Adam Smith, of whom I shall have something to say later. Um, and I know this is, for me, a very great uh, pleasure and honor indeed. Um, I just want to begin by saying that, um, briefly, that I've having been having trouble with my computers. Um, I saw the floor was one of them collapsed last night, so I hope that this will go ahead as planned. If there's any problem, just please forgive me and bear with me while I try to um, sort things out. Um, Charles has already given you an overview, really, of what I um, plan to say, or at least the, the subject I wish to address. Um, the importance uh, for us in the 21st century of the Enlightenment um, can't really be um, underestimated, overestimated. So the Enlightenment is everywhere apparent, although many, for many of us may not be entirely aware of it. And it's apparent for two reasons. The first is quite obvious. Without the Enlightenment, uh, modern science as we understand it today would not have taken the form it has, at least not here in the West. It might have happened in China or India, although a number of the philosophers of the Enlightenment considered that possibility and thought it very unlikely. But it, didn't, it wouldn't have happened where it did happen and how it did happen in France, in Britain, um, in uh, Germany, in Italy, in Spain, in Scandinavia, in the United States, and in, even in the republics of uh, Latin America. Now, the second aspect of it is less obvious, uh, perhaps, but equally pertinent for us in this uh, virtual Zoom room. In the recent past, what we refer to as the West has become increasingly divided intellectually, morally, and politically into two broad groups who have sometimes radically opposed views about the world they inhabit. On the one side, we have those who generally, while they are prepared to acknowledge human frailty and the human capacity for doing harm, believe that it's possible to improve through knowledge and science the human condition. And because they believe this, they believe also that there exists a human nature common to us all, and I suppose few today would employ such a term, and that that human nature is much the same everywhere. They hold that is that although matters such as cultures and religion are important, and that differences must be respected, this can only be set done when such things conform to some standard of behavior by those cultures towards all their members, which every rational being of whatever culture, religion, and so on, could be brought to understand and respect, even if they didn't necessarily share it. To put it differently, they believe that the means by which humans order their lives cannot be anything other than human, consensual, intelligible, and changeable. We might say that they give predominance to individual agency, to autonomy, a key word in discussing the Enlightenment, and thus to individual freedom. On the other hand, on the other side, we have those who believe that cultures cannot be questioned or changed by those outside them, and that there exists no such thing as a single rationality or a single human identity, and therefore no single rule of justice, but only what the contemporary American philosopher Michael Walzer has called spheres of justice, spheres that overlap certainly, but are nevertheless distinct and always sovereign. The Indian caste system, for instance, so apparently and blatantly unjust to contemporary secular sensibilities, 
would argues Walzer be entirely just if it were accepted by, as such by all those who are affected by it. In fact, he claims it is not, and so the question does not arise. In this context, all he will accept as possible universal criteria would be a list of what he calls, I quote, negative injunctions against oppression and tyranny. And these would inevitably be remarkably short, particularly if a system of caste was not to be included among them. For members of this group, let us call them for the sake of argument, communitarians, enlightenment universality is nothing other than an attempt to impose what is in fact simply one set of norms, those of the West, uh, today they're Western, tomorrow they might just as well be Chinese, on the whole world, and is therefore necessarily, subject comes up again and again, imperialist, and ultimately, of course, tyrannical. Now, there are, of course, I don't want to oversimplify things more than is necessary. There are many shades in between, but the dichotomy is there and it ultimately derives, as I have said, from an acceptance or denial of the arguments put forward by the philosophers and scientists, the, the novelists, the uh, poets and playwrights who made out what they called, and it was a very self-conscious movement, the Enlightenment. Now, Originally, the term enlightenment of Clarum in German, Lumiere in French, Illustration in Spanish, Illuminismo in Italian, and so on and so forth, a word for it in practically every European language, meant very simply casting light where there had once been darkness. It meant demolishing prejudice, a favorite term of abuse described by Charles de Secondin, Baron de Montesquieu, perhaps the most lastingly influential of the political and legal philosophers of the Enlightenment. As I quote, not one what one makes, sorry, not what makes one unaware of certain things, but what makes one unaware of oneself. And by so, end of quote, and by so doing, it deprives one of the necessary freedom of action which the individual must be allowed to exercise. Similarly, Immanuel Kant, uh, one of the two most lastingly influential philosophers of the Enlightenment, in his famous attempt to answer precisely the question what is enlightenment, Vasis al Clarum, argued that enlightenment was what allowed the individual to exit from what he called his self-incured uh, minority. And by minority, what Kant meant was, I quote, the inability to make use of one's own understanding without the guidance of another. To do this, the individual had to cast aside all those dogmas and formulas, those mechanical instruments for rational use or rather misuse, of mankind's natural endowments, end of quote, which Kant described as the ball and chain of his permanent minority. I have to live, as Kant put it, if I'm going to live as a fully autonomous being, with, I quote, without the aid of a book that has understanding for me, a pastor who has a conscience for me, a doctor who judges my diet for me, and so forth. I need, Kant concluded, borrowing a famous line from the poet Horace, to dare to think, sapere aldo. This then, daring to think, is the necessary condition of freedom. It's perhaps best captured in, in the words of one of Kant's exact contemporaries, although he seems never to have read him, the Marquis de Condorcet. Condorcet was one of the creators of differential calculus and the first person to attempt to predict the possible outcome of human decision-making by using mathematics, which makes him the kind of founder of modern political science. He was also a champion of equal rights for women and for all peoples of all races and an abolitionist who devised the world's first state education system, uh, which is, were of course, put into operation by the French after the revolution. In his sketch for historical picture of the progress of the human mind, written while in hiding from the forces of the Jacobin terror, Condorcet was a keen supporter of the, of the early moderate revolution, um, but fell out of favor when he opposed the execution of the king. He described a future condition in which all mankind would acquire, I quote, the necessary enlightenment to conduct themselves in accordance with their own reason in the common affairs of life and to maintain them free of prejudice so they might know their rights and be at liberty to exercise them according to their own opinion and their conscience, where all might through the development of their faculties obtain the certain means to provide for their needs. Condorcet's sketch, end of quote, sorry, Condorcet's sketch and Kant's essay have often been taken to sum up all that was most important about the Enlightenment, namely to put it very simply that it was, in the words of the modern English philosopher John Gay, Gray, who is generally, I should say, hostile to it, at, quote, a movement promoting autonomous human reason and, according to science, a privileged status in relation to all other forms of any understanding. And many contemporaries did indeed see it that way. They were all, after all, the self-styled heirs of the great intellectuals 
shakers and movers of the 17th century of Descartes, of Hobbes, Locke, Leibniz, Spinoza, Bacon, Newton, whose lasting achievement, quite apart from whatever else they might have done, had, and of course they did much, had been, as Locke phrased it, to sweep away, I quote, all the rubbish that lies in the way to knowledge. Now, most of that rubbish, in their views, had been placed there by the Aristotelian Thomist theologians of the previous two centuries, who, as Thomas Hobbes said contemptuously, by repeating everything that Aristotle had said on anything, how does he put it, reduce philosophy to mere Aristotelity. Now, this is one view of the Enlightenment. It is certainly the most familiar, but there is another related but not identical one on which I wish to focus today. And I wish to begin with the, the other great, I said there were two great philosophers of the Enlightenment, the other great philosopher of the Enlightenment, reading whose work Kant Clance claimed had, I quote, roused him from his dogmatic slumber, the great Scott, North Britain is what he called himself, David Hume, who um, Charles alluded to in his introduction. Now, the two men could not have been more alike. Kant was thin, dry, ascetic, sarcastic, but humorless, and never left his native town of Königsberg. Hume was plump, witty, jovial, and traveled wildly. You belong to all nations, the great French philosopher Diderot wrote to him, they were close friends, in 1768. I flatter myself that I am, like you, a citizen of that great city of the world. And so he was. And the compliment, as we shall see, was highly significant. Now, Hume took a rather different place, sorry, a different view of the place of reason in human understanding, best summed up perhaps in one of his most famous remarks, that I quote, reason is and ought to be a slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office but to serve and obey them. By this, Hume meant that, meant why, by this, what Hume meant was that without our passions, we would have no reason for reasoning at all and no reason for acting. It is our passions which motivate us to reason and it is they that then activate our will. Linked to the passions, are what the philosophers of the Enlightenment generally called sentiments, and now, of course, debased word, but one which for Hume meant those emotions which arise primarily from the passions of pride and humility on the one hand, and from love and hatred on the other. Now, there are a great many of them, but the most important and most for what I want to say today is what, what in the 18th century was called sympathy, or we today would call empathy. Now, sympathy has, however, a far richer range of connotations in empathy, and I will continue to use it. What this is, is best explained in the theory of moral sentiments of 1759, the first major work by another great Scot, Adam Smith, who has already been mentioned. When wrote Smith, we see someone being tortured, then as long as, I, as, long as uh, quote, we ourselves are at our ease, our senses will never inform us of what he suffers. What does inform us of what he suffers is our recognition of our similarity with the victim, that is, our sympathy for what um, Smith described as our brother who is upon the rack. What I need to know, however, is the cause of the suffering. Sufferings come in many forms and shapes, and obviously if I, somebody who's been waterboarded is suffering differently from someone who is being hung up by their fingernails. Only then will I be able to know how I will feel if I were to find myself in the same predicament. In other words, to be at all effective, my initial act of unthinking instinctual sympathy has to activate my reason. For the compassion of the spectator must arise, in Smith's word, I quote, altogether from the consideration of what he himself would feel if he was reduced to the same unhappy situation and was, and this is important, at the same time able to regard it with his present reason and judgment. So we can operate both our sentiments and our reason simultaneously. And of course, the, the example of the torture is merely an extreme one. We can feel sympathy for all kinds of activities, both negative and positive, which we said. Now, it's impossible to stress, it's important to stress, sorry, that since it is based upon an emotion and may thus be, I quote, used to donate our fellow feeling with any passion whatsoever, end quote. Sympathy depends on no prior moral, religious, or cultural conditions. It emanates from within each of, our, each of us as free, autonomous individuals. And even, so Smith claimed to believe, I quote, the greatest ruffian, the most hardened violators of the laws of society, 
is not altogether without it. Someone who was indeed altogether without it would not, therefore, simply be human. What provides, it provides, therefore, is a minimum psychological principle on which to base a claim to human sociability, both within individual communities and what is still more significant for my purposes between them. No passion, wrote Hume, if well understood, can be entirely indifferent to us, because there is none of which every man has not, within him at least the seeds and first principles. We seem, he went on, to have a concern even for those whose lives are remote from ours. Why else, he asked, should we seem um, to see the fates of nations, provinces, or many individuals so extremely interesting? Uh, even if we have nothing particular at stake in what happens to them? Why otherwise do we read newspapers? Why are we moved by reading poetry and by the lives of beings that are entirely imaginary? I may not be able or willing to do anything about the victims of, say, suicide bombers, since my sympathies can only be aroused by the sufferings, but since my sympathies can only be aroused by the sufferings of the dead for whom I can do nothing, let's say the victims of the Holocaust, and Hume gives us as an example for the same sentiment, the cruelty of the Roman emperors Nero and Tiberius, but it does not mean that the thought of them does not have the capacity to trouble me, and because of that, to become the principle of my future actions. No quality of human nature is more remarkable, wrote Hume, both in itself and its consequences, than that propensity we have to sympathize with others and to receive by communication their inclinations and sentiments, however different from or even contrary to our own, end of quote. From here, it was only a short step to imagine the existence of a world made up of diverse peoples, but all united by this common sympathy. This then, I would claim, is the basis of enlightened universalism. To believe, for instance, that the Indian caste system would be acceptable if all agreed to it, would be to assume that we should feel no sympathy with the sufferings of, say, the untouchables, even if for some perverse reason they were to consent and take pleasure in their suffering. It is also, however, obviously the case that although we're able to experience sympathy with every other human on the planet, no matter how remote or alien, we are more likely to act on that passion if the person or persons are near and in some degree familiar to us, then we are if they're so remote that we, in Smith's words, can neither serve nor hurt them. This familiarity required to compel us, the familiarity required to compel us to move from simple feeling of discomfort, of, of benevolence, to action, or at any rate, the possibility for, for familiarity, was a condition of history, however, which was believed in the 18th century to have reached, if not the final, then certainly a crucial stage in what was known as the commercial society. Now, this is, of course, the source of what Smith famously called the wealth of nations, which is, as you all know, the uh, title of his best-known book, The Great um, History, the great, sorry, the great um, first work of modern economics. Commerce, however, was far more than mere economic exchange. It was far more than to use the invisible hand of capitalism. Commerce had not only made property mobile, as Smith insisted, it had done the same for peoples. It had become the channel by which peoples encountered one another, and through encounter, it was hoped, they became to know and understand one another. It was responsible, as Smith put it, for, I quote, the communication of knowledge and all sorts of improvements. In Montesquieu's famous formulation, I quote, commerce has made known the customs of all peoples of the world and spread everywhere. It was this, he went on, which gave to it the power to cure, I quote, destructive prejudices. And it is almost a general rule that wherever the customs are gentle, there is commerce. And when there, wherever there is commerce, customs are gentle. The famous du commerce. Now, for Immanuel Kant, it had also indeed been this commerce which had resulted in a state of which, I quote, the community of the nations of the earth has now gone so far that a violation of rights in one place of the earth is felt in all. For Kant, however, and indeed for what I'm about to say now, the key term here is rights. For it is on the basis of this that that other great project of enlightenment was built, and that is cosmopolitanism. Now, cosmopolitanism is not a creation of the 18th century or the enlightenment as such any more than modern sciences, but the form it took in the 18th century has shaped the modern conception of a unified world, uh, which is, of course, extremely relevant to our discussions about what might eventually happen 
beyond it, uh, than any previous form of universalism. Cosmopolitanism has, as I'm sure you're all aware, come in for some very severe criticisms. The cosmopolite, and not only nowadays, but also by contemporaries, the cosmopolite Saint Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is very hostile to the whole idea, is one who is guilty, I quote, of loving the entire world in order to enjoy the privileges of loving no one. In the scathing words of the contemporary English philosopher Roger Scruton, Roger Scruton, I quote, cosmopolitan is the belief in and pursuit of a style of life which shows acquaintance with an ability to incorporate the manners, habits, languages, and social customs of cities throughout the world. And then he went on sardonically, the cosmopolitan is a kind of parasite who depends upon the quotidian lives of others to create the various local flavors and identities in which he dabbles. Similar comments have come over the years from Hitler, from Stalin, and more recently from any number of nationalism populists, populists across Europe. The objection, however, is always at bottom the same. The cosmopolite and cosmopolitanism um, has no direct allegiance or attachments to or roots in any particular society or community. This is not, however, how the philosophers of the Enlightenment saw it. For them, it was not a matter of detachment or contraction of, as Scruton put it, dabbling in the quotidian lives of others, nor was it a bid for the kind of flattening uh, homage and homogenization, the coca colorization the McDonaldization, so they've been called, of the world, of which contemporary globalization is so often accused. It was indeed the very opposite. It was a demand for expansion and inclusion. What the philosophers of the Enlightenment were asking for was an effective vision of the human that demanded a degree of attachment, which although it began at home, did not because of that simply stop at the nearest frontier, social, cultural, religious, or natural. Of course, every Enlightenment philosopher would have said, I care more for my family than I do, say, today for the displaced masses in Syria or Iraq. What is being asked of me is rather a vision of the world which is capable of encompass encompassing both my immediate family, my local community, and those displaced masses within a broader perception of humanity itself. Now, this is how Montesquieu uh, expressed it in that uh, collection of personal reflections, he simply calls mes pensées, my, my thoughts. Since he said in 1745, he was a man before I am a Frenchman, or rather because I am necessity a man, but only a Frenchman by chance. I quote, if I knew something useful to me and harmful to my family, I would reject, I would reject it from my mind. If I knew something useful to my family and not to my country, I would try to forget it. If I knew of something useful to my country and harmful to Europe, or useful to Europe and harmful to mankind, I would look upon it as a crime." End of quote. Now, Adam Smith arrived at much the same conclusion by a somewhat different route. If he said, the wise and virtuous man was always willing, as Smith assumed he must be, to sacrifice his own private interest to those of the public interest of his own particular order and society, and if that same man recognized that this should in turn be, I quote, sacrificed to the greater interests of the state or sovereignty of which he is only a subordinate part, end of quote, then it followed that finally he should be equally willing that all those inferior interests should be sacrificed to the greater interests of the universe. Of course, it's this final step in the argument that populist nationalists, communitarians, and their like reject. Now, such persons, as those described by Montesquieu and Smith, are cosmopolites, or what Kant called cosmotheroi, that is to say, students of the world. And what they're being asked to do is to keep their eyes fixed upon the wider horizon of mankind itself. Um, to bear that always in mind. It was what Kant significantly formed, called a form of global patriotism. Now, Global patriotism, however, demands a grasp of the global and a conception of the patria, the patria. The former follows, of course, from the kind of shared sympathy which Kant, for which Kant constitutes a moral duty. Humanity, he wrote, means on the one hand the universal feeling of participation, and on the other the capacity for being able to communicate to one innermost uh, self universally, which properties taken together constitute the sociability that is appropriate to humankind by means of which it distinguishes itself from the limitations of animals. 
These are the inescapable facts of the human condition. They provided a basic reason why we should, why as human beings we could not fail to, develop interpersonal relations with others from widely different cultures from our own and extend our benevolence to one another. And because they do that, in Kant's view, they, are also, they also generated a right, not he insists a mere philanthropic principle, but a right that each people should, I quote, try to establish community with and to this end to visit all regions of the world. This is what he famously called the jus cosmopoliticum, a troubling uh, term which I shall come back to several times. It could be translated as cosmopolitan right, it could be translated as cosmopolitan law. I think it captures something actually broader than both of those. Anyway, in the first instance, it is fairly, this is a fairly restricted one. It, in this instance, when he's talking about as a right, however, it's a fairly restricted one. It gives the traveler a right to travel and of what he calls temporary sojourn in any part of the world. This is not, of course, a right acquired by treaty. It's not a right enforced by positive law. It does not include, for instance, the right to permanent residence. It doesn't include the kind of right when in Europe I had acquired in 1975 and was deprived of in January of this year. It derives solely from the fact that because I inhabit a space that I cannot leave, or at least Kant couldn't leave it, and no matter where I set off from, I go on long enough, if I go on long enough, I will come back to where I started, which confers upon me what he called a common possession of its surface. Only under such conditions would it be, I quote, possible for strangers to enter into our relations with the native inhabitants. And since societies cannot flourish in isolation from one another, much less in contempt of one another, it is a right that arises from a general concern for the good of the species. It had been, Kant argued, precisely the tendency of the Greeks to isolate themselves from the rest of humanity, whom they then lumped together as barbarians, that had been, I quote, the prime cause contributing to the downfall of their states. Now, this, I should say, this notion of the right to travel is not entirely, of course, a new idea either. It harks back, indeed, to an ancient conception of the universal, what's called the universal right of hospitality. And the idea that travel, or what was called the right of passage, was a natural one, and therefore part of what was called in the 17th century the law of nature and nations, it still has a place in the debates over the rights of refugees. It was for most part also, as it is today, what at the time was referred to as an imperfect right, in that it could be overruled in the interests of public safety and so on, which is why Kant himself accepts that the Chinese and the Japanese, whom he generally reviled precisely, not for their culture, not for their uh, language or anything, but precisely for isolating themselves from the rest of humanity, were entitled to place, he believed, they were entitled to place severe limitations on the activities of the European trading companies, since, as he put it sarcastically, having given such guests a try, they knew that in this case, visiting was merely a synonym for conquering. Now, the origins of the claim made on behalf of the rites of passage may be old, but Kant's version and the implications for it of Smith and Hume's theory of moral sentiments are really quite different. For in all previous iterations, it was nature, or more precisely, the natural law, which has delivered to us this right. Here, in this world of autonomous free agents, who in Kant's words are, I quote, meant to produce everything out of themselves, it is we who claim it, this right, through our own actions. This, we might say, Kant and Hume would say, indeed, is the condition of true freedom. The cosmopolitan right is also, in the end, not merely a right to survive and prosper. It is a right having to do with our evolution as a species. This universal cosmopolitan condition, Kant declared, um, was nothing less than the womb in which all the original predispositions of the human species will be developed, unquote. It also, of course, constituted a form of global patriotism and therefore had to possess, a, as it, as it, sorry, as it for, constituted uh, this form of what he called global patriotism, it has, of course, to produce both a, pol uh, um, a political and a legal order. Now, the form that this would take, can't imagine, indeed predicated, would eventually be some kind of world association of nations, what he variously called, and I should say, uh, this is discussed in a number of texts over a relatively short period of time, but um, scattered texts, they're not one single one, and um, they're there's a great variety of terms and they're often in, in used inconsistently. 
Anyway, he called it variously a league of peoples, an international state, a universal union of states, a federation, a confederation, a partnership, and so on. In broad outline, however, it corresponds roughly to Ian Crawford's vision for a future extraterrestrial federation based upon what today is called the principle of subsidiarity. Now, Kant, of course, knew nothing of subsidiarity since it was first introduced in 1891 by Pope Leo XIII as a safeguard against encroaching liberalism, although in fact it's a remarkably liberal principle. But the basic idea is that all government, all command, that is, should be conducted at the lowest level possible which in the case of a federation or an empire, as its more remote source is indeed a principle of the Roman common law, this means that only those actions which directly affect all the member states within the confederation should be decided by the federal government. This would, as Kant insisted, any federal government should leave the individual states separate and independent as far as anything concerning their cultural, their language, their religion, etc., were concerned. It approximates what to what the contemporary Irish-American philosopher Philip Pettit calls the idea of externally undominated states. Subsidiarity, indeed, determines the limits of European Union law and bears some resemblance to the Tenth Amendment of the US Constitution, which deals with the relationship between the individual states and the federal government. It also places, I should say, severe limitations, of course, on the development of any true federation and is the source of much of the complaints about the EU's democratic deficit. And it's also, uh, of course, one of the great sources of contention um, at a more at a sort of serious level uh, over the Brexit debates. The question, the question which had bedeviled all previous attempts to create a compelling and binding law of nature, nature and nations in the, night, in the 17th century and, and to certainly be in the 16th before it, was, however, where such a law was to come from. As I've tried to suggest, the enlightened conception of sympathy broadly understood had provided a reason why all human beings possess the disposition to communicate and thus to reach an understanding with each other and a corresponding right to the possibility of interaction with each other. But the relationship between individuals was one thing, those between states quite another. For whereas individuals within states were bound by the rule of law, states in relationship to one another were not. As Kant phrased it, I quote, states considered in external relationship to one another are like lawless savages by nature in a non-rightful condition. Furthermore, this is a condition in which the very concept of a law or a right would seem to be so inherently meaningless that, I quote, it is difficult even to form a concept of this or to think of law in this lawless state without contradicting oneself. End of quote. Now, so long as this remained the case, no universal law, no law of nations was even conceivable. As all the previous attempts by the great natural law theorists of the 17th and 18th century, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Puffendorf, Christian Wolf, Emma de Vattel, all of whom Kant dismisses as the sorry comforters of mankind, precisely because they tried and indeed failed to create in his idea any plausible universal legal order, was, in Kant's opinion, merely an indication of good intentions but it could have no purchase as law because it was not subject, and in the world in which, of course, he knew it could never be subject to any external coercive power. In other words, what was required was not the law of nations, which was inextricably bound in with the natural law, a form of law imposed by nature on humans, but instead a form of positive law created by humans and imposed by them on nature. For this, in 1783, Jeremy Bentham had coined the term international law. Now, since all positive law is based on consensus, to arrive at such a rule of law, the world would first need a common global order of justice. And this is precisely, I would argue, what Kant's use cosmopolitanism was intended ultimately to provide. Kant indeed had seen, unlike all previous attempts to dream up a world federation, of which there were many, that such a union would only work on any scale if all the parts of which it was made up shared a common political regime. And not just any political regime, for although external undomination, to use Pettit's term, is not incompatible with internal domination, it is very likely that any unfree or dominated state would be willing to enter into a relationship with any state, dominated or undominated, in the first place. All states in which the future world federation were to be, had to be then um, what 
Kant referred to as representative republics. By this he meant a state in which the sovereign is constrained, I quote, to give his law as if it could have arisen from the united will of an entire people. This is the definition of what he calls external rightful freedom. It did not mean, however, that the law had to be made by the people. Indeed, Kant is explicit in saying this is not a democracy. The counterfactual here is crucial. This would be a system which the peoples are not free and Pettit's understanding of Republican non-domination. To, to do so, they'd have to be lawmakers themselves. But the fact that they could have given their consent means that for Kant, they become co-legislating members of the state. Um, Kant, of course, fails to explain how a society would be created in the first place, except through revolution, and this he rejected, nor what would happen if the representative should suddenly decide to cease to be the representative of anything other than their own particular interests, as indeed the American colonists believed that George III had done. Only when this had been satisfied, would, and all of the states of the world were representative republics in this sense, would they be joined able to join together and create a common law among themselves and thus exit from the state of nature. Now, this common law is roughly speaking what we today call, call uh, the law of international law. Of course, modern international law is frequently brushed aside by the so-called realists, much as Kant had brushed himself had brushed aside the law of nations in his own day in the belief that the international world today is and still in, in fact in a state of nature or what has been called a law-free policy space. In reality, however, unlike, not, uh, <clears throat> unlike the late 18th century, it is hard to imagine any modern state, even China, operating for long outside the rule of law. For modern international law is, as Kant understood his Jos Cosmopolitikum to be, more than a mere set of rules, more than law as regulation. It is precisely Jos, that is justice, an order which determines what is to be discussed, how and in what form and language any final decision will be made, and so on. It is, in fact, and creates what in the 18th century was known as a civilization, a word I should stress, which has a quite precise legal origin and quite precise legal meaning, a civilization beyond the state of nature in which all states still otherwise exist. Now, much of this enlightened vision of humanity, of human autonomy and cosmopolitanism came under fierce attack as a consequence of modern nationalism, nation and nationalism, and the mod creation of the modern nation in uh, the 19th century. Um, paradoxically, nationalism itself began as an alternative, but similarly all embracing vision of the world. But it soon developed from the American French and French revolutions through the democratic revolutions of 1848, across two world wars, into the inward looking populist dogmas we're all too familiar with today. Here in this vision, there can be no place outside the culture, beliefs, languages of identities of which our communities are made up. Humans do not create their social world as the enlightened philosophers suppose they are created by them. But while nationalism in the 19th has hardened the boundaries between nations, it also prompted a resurgence, in particular after World War I, of interest in cosmopolitanism broadly understood. So that today, despite the flurry of books announcing the end of the global world order, the collapse of the international community and the like. Nations and nationalists are faced with a powerful battery of international, transnational, supranational institutions, legal orders, cell and self-defining communities. For however remotely the enlightened vision of a cosmopolitan order it might be, it had provided the fundamental inspiration for the creation of a number of admittedly imperfect institutions, not unluckily, utterly unlike in some respects, the kind that Kant had hoped for. Above all, first, the League of Nations of 1919, which for all its, for many of its founders was an explicitly Kantian project. And subsequently, of course, the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the International Labour Organization, not to mention still, amorph still more amorphous and impermanent, but potentially no less consequential, uh, what do we call them, um, act initiatives, such as the Kyoto Protocol, for instance, or the Paris Agreement. All of these, as it were, hark back to a generally broad, let us say, Humean, Smithian, Kantian view of um, the international world, the relationship between peoples and nations. Enlightenment cosmopolitanism has also provided the theoretical foundations for such modern conceptions of international justice, geo governance, global civil society, the responsibility to protect, etc. And then, of course, we have had, since 1948, a universal declaration of human rights. 
Truid's demands are vague, and there are many, the right to health care and education, for instance, to which even the most conscientious and wealthy Western nation countries do not subscribe, including this one. But it has been perhaps the single most influential concept in shaping foreign policy in the West since at least the 1970s. And the very idea of a human right would have been unimaginable without some notion of a single human nature and of a global community bound together by a common order of justice, by in fact something very close to Kant's Jus Cosmopoliticum. So to come finally to the topic of this conference, sorry, I'm taking so long about it. Uh, what are indeed the conditions of freedom beyond Earth? Um, for here in space, we have indeed, as Charles has pointed out, a new state of nature, which will thus compel its settlers to draw up something resembling a new social contract among themselves. In some ways, of course, they will find themselves in the uh, uh, position not unlike the early settlers of America. Like them, they will initially at least be entirely dependent technically and economically on their respective mother institu institutions, be they states or private corporations. They will acquire, again, as Charles has pointed out, the ready real necessities of life. For while, as he says, I quote, everywhere on earth one is free to breathe the air, in space oxygen has to be manufactured and in thus dependent, at least initially, upon techno technologies imported from Earth. I should say the analogy between this and the settlings um, in, in America, not in the later settlers in settlements in Africa and Asia, are very striking. Um, and similarly, as was the case in the Amer early Americas, this is also, as Charles has stressed, an opportunity, so to speak, for a form of extraterrestrial ty tyranny, which might be far greater than anything that currently exists on Earth. And um, even, if the, uh, <clears throat> even if the settlements were to be carried out by private enterprise rather than states, um, it is very likely that um, the... the um, Musks and the Benzos of today would end up in fact like the Virginia Company, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company if their power and influence have become too threatening to be to, by being absorbed by the state. Unlike the early American settlers, however, uh, these new colonists uh, will not be able so easily to carry with them the social and political institutions, customs and systems of law of their former homelands. Um, they will not be able to build New England's, New Spain's, or New Amsterdam's in outer space quite so readily. But since they will initially at least be humans like us, they will need, if they're going to build societies of any kind at all, to carry with them the same guiding principles, above all, the principles of cooperation and participation on which the earthly societies in which they come have been constructed. They will also, of course, carry with them that capacity for sympathy, which Hume and Smith identified as the source of all human sociability. And since these extra stressful settlements will, like the colonies in America, eventually become self-governing, they will need to extend our existing legal and political institutions of international governments. To do that, they will inevitably be thrown back on the Enlightenment vision of a universal, now no longer merely global, of course, order of justice, grounded upon our common human nature and our irrefutable capacity to enter into communication with one another. For in space, those are the only human attributes we are likely to have in common. And if all that comes to be, it can only be some version in principle, no matter how remote in practice, of Kant's cosmopolitan order. This was indeed, as Kant himself had seen in 1795, an idea, a condition of future time. But like all such ideas, he insisted it was one that not, should not be abandoned like the, as he put it, like the Platonic Republic under the very wretched and harmful pretext of its impracticability, end of quote. So long as we are free, morally and intellectually, we can go on hoping that some kind of cosmopolitan order will be achieved. More pressingly, perhaps, the very fact that we are able to imagine such a state makes it our duty, as he put it, to work, work towards this not merely chimerical end. And if not on this earth, then perhaps beyond it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony, for this really wonderful talk, a very sweeping talk as well. That was just fascinating.
Um, so we've got time for some questions, if you're happy to answer a few of those. Yes, certainly. Um, feel free, everyone, to put uh, your questions in the question and answer box, um, if you have any questions. In the meantime, oh. while we're waiting for a few questions to come up, I've got a couple there, but let me just start off by asking you um, a question based on what you were talking about, cosmopolitanism. So, so the idea that cosmopolitanism is that you're sort of opening your mind to a, a wider view of society, particularly if you travel somewhere else. Of course, if you go to the moon and Mars, there's no one there already. There is no existing society. So to, if you're an isolated group of people, for example, on the moon or Mars, your cosmopolitan view is necessarily a view of, of Earth because there's no, there's no other society with which to build a cosmopolitan view. So do you think that a cosmopolitan view in space will actually make people hidebound to Earth? Or would they be better off to, uh, to drop the whole idea of cosmopolitanism and construct a whole new vision based on their extraterrestrial society? Or does that lead in itself to new dangers of an, of an undefined society? Well, I would reply to that with uh, uh, two um, qualifications. One is that I was rather assuming that that we're talking about a possible whether there is more than one extraterrestrial society, and that these extraterrestrials will have to enter in communication with, not, with each other. So the analogy with the, the states of nature, or indeed, let's say, the English colonies in America, uh, would be, um, which also, of course, don't forget, they largely considered themselves to be in, in terra nullius, I mean, in spaces where there were no other people, they didn't consider the people who were there to be uh, significant presences at all. Um, but there would have to be connections between them, relations between them. I was also thinking along the lines that um, we've been seeing a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, watch the French television. I mean, and there's been a great deal about the space station because of the commander of the present international space station, the Frenchman. So, um, and I'm struck by how you have there a multicultural, multinational group of people all cramped together in one tiny space. Um, and that, therefore, the degrees of understanding and cooperation that are necessary between them, very much as it were, reflects or echoes, or reflects a kind of understanding that would have to exist on a larger scale between different space colonies. So I had, I had that in mind rather than what would happen with, with the relationship between one particular colony, so to speak, one particular settlement and the Earth itself. Um, now, even, even on that level, however, one is assuming that whatever whatever relationship there is, we're talking about a relationship between a colony and, and a some kind of multicultural, multinational entity, even if, it's a, even if it's a private one on Earth, not just one particular state. So the cosmopolitanism is a way of getting, as it, so to speak, different groups of people with different views and ambitions to collaborate and, and with one another um, at, on a, at both a cultural, political and legal level. Okay, and then following on from that, uh, Scott Cassingham has asked a question which I think does follow on from that. Are we more likely, uh, despite those aspirations, to see a cosmopolitan order or an extension of nationalism? And I suppose that question fits within these concerns about resource acquisition in space, countries going out into space to acquire resources on the moon. And given the lack of the the, the breadth of possibly nations in different on different planetary bodies, could we see um, countries extending nationalism rather than taking a cosmopolitan view? And, and how would the Enlightenment thinkers, I suppose, uh, advise us to to try and to try and increase the success of cosmopolitanism in these environments rather than nationalism in, in a very localized space settlement? Well, I think the problem. I mean, I think the, the question is a very pertinent one. I think this obviously is the great danger. Uh, would be that there would be a, a different kind of space race. And that uh, so long as you have ideologically conflicting bodies, and I imagine the future would be some kind of conflict of, of like the Cold War, and that the race to dominate space would then take on a deeply nationalist, uh, deeply nationalist quality to it. I don't know, I can't obviously couldn't possibly predict what's like it happened. I mean, the answer, uh, would be the answer of the, the three people I chose to focus on, and they're only of course rep they're representative and not exhaustive. Um, would precisely be that uh, this is a violation of the natural human right, that is to say, the right to communicate, the right to share common resources, and so on, and that um, that ultimately it will be destructive. 
and that ultimately any form of nationalism is going to be destructive in itself. It's going to lead ultimately to warfare. I think one of the things, of course, I left out of this account is that at the back of all of this um, really is an attempt to bring an end to human conflict. Simply Kant's project is an attempt to bring an end to primary attempt is to bring a human conflict. And all, to, all ideas about federation and confederation that go back as far as you know, Dante's great model in the 12th century is, is, is our um, attempts to bring an end to conflict. That if you have an export, you export nationalism into outer space, you're going to get warfare. And warfare is going to be uh, ultimately of that environment utterly destructive. It may be the case that because as you put, rightly pointed out in your in your essays in your book that um, books that uh, you know that the, the resource the shortness of resources may be a question that is going to force people to cooperate with one another. Indeed, in the ways that um, communities in, say, North America on a smaller scale, uh, the Solomons, you know, were forced to cooperate with one another in ways they were not able to do within Europe itself. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then following off that, Billy Kapoor raises, raises an interesting question. He, they ask, um, they're talking about Polynesian societies and their sense of community that's built into their languages and whether this would contrast more positively in space versus atomized Enlightenment views of the self. And, and I suppose what that's getting at, there, there tends to be, I think, my personal thoughts, a slightly caricatured view of the Enlightenment as human beings being atomized, this very individualistic conception of society. Mm -hmm. But I think, as you pointed out, Adam Smith actually uh, was not the consummate individualist in that sense. He talked about sympathies and actually community was a very important part of the Enlightenment view. But just to apply that to space, do you, how do you think this view of the, the atomized individual versus this idea of a sympathetic community will play out in space? I mean, I would presume that in an extreme environment like the moon or Mars, Adam Smith's concept of sympathies, the need to understand other human beings to survive in such extremes uh, without a collapse uh, and a disintegration of a society in inherently lethal conditions would become more important. Might we see a, an enrichment and a, and a rebirth of these enlightenment ideas of sympathy, which as you say, might be more framed as empathy these days? Yes, I think, I think that's probably true. I think it's, it's you know, the, the idea of a single community in which, and I know nothing I'm afraid about the realities of the Polynesian situation, but um, of the, of a single community whose language is, which sense of community is that we're bound into the language. The communitarian, roughly speaking, view is fine as long, long as there's only one community. Um, when you have two communities, you are inevitably under those circumstances not going to share the same views. You need to find some common principle which unites them all. And that is, that is precisely is the whole point of the, of the question of the notion of cosmopolitanism and, and really you know, the basis on which the Smithian, Humean, and it's not just Smith and Hume, they're the, they're the sort of major figures, thinkers of this conception, but the, you, know, you find versions of it in just not any version, you do count of course, I point out anything for the Enlightenment. This idea that there has to be something will transcend the limitations of the community. The Valtzer, the Val view that Valtzer provides us with us, which I mentioned briefly at the beginning, um, of the community works very well as far as you, as long as you remain within that community as long as you're not threatened by anything outside it. Um, and of course, and that depends on you um, living in a world where you're essentially isolated from other communities, as indeed the Polynesians were. So it's the problem is in outer space, you're likely to find a situation, from what little, very, very little I gleaned of it, in which there are going to be different communities from Earth collected together into a single community. And they have therefore, to be able to um, work and gather and together with them. And the needs for sympathy of the kind that Smith thinks in mind, has in mind, this emphatic understanding, which you know, begins with simply a recognition of, of, of physical pain and also physical pleasure, one might say, um, becomes paramount in things like the International Space Station. So if you think about any sort of community that's that, that size, or even 20 times that size, or 400 times that size, but isn't as big as a, an entire nation state, then you're going to have to need some kind of bond that will keep all these different views together. Yes. So it's an atomized, yes, it's true that you begin with the individual and it's true that the atomized individual is the, 
is the, the autonomous, let's put it that way, third model now, is the crucial. But, the, but it's only the, what we've got to try and imagine, what they're getting at is the idea of a society, of a society made up of autonomous, atomized individuals, not of one con conflicting. Yes, yes. yes. Good. Okay. There's a couple of other questions that touch on important aspects of the Enlightenment. I thought we could, uh, you might be interested to answer. One of them is asking about the separation of church and state, and of course that was another project of the Enlightenment: the separation of the the, the, the secular and not. So, how do you think that that should play out in space? Should we try and maintain that separation in extraterrestrial settlements? So it comes back to some of the questions we were asking earlier today about uh, the role of religion or where, where, where do you think the church and separation of church and state should sit in an extraterrestrial settlement, particularly if one where a faith emerges, for example, as a very strong essence of survival in extreme conditions, what, what would one do about that? It's a very difficult question. I should say, of course, the separation of church and state um, goes all the way back to the adaptation of adoption by the Roman Empire of, of, of Christianity in the first place. And of church and state, I should say, not necessarily, so that, um, you know, it's one of the great features of Western civilization, so to speak, is that there is this distinction. I mean, it's, of course, it differs enormously depending on which place or part of the world you're in. Um, but I think it's an absolutely vital uh, way of any kind of possible understanding between different faiths. I mean, if you're going to have a society in which there are different faiths, there has to be, and this was one of the lessons we learned uh, in, in Europe after the end of the uh, great wars of religion of the 17th century. It's one of the lessons of the Treaty of Westphalia. You have to have a state or a, a secular system, a secular rule, which is going to be above and beyond religion, and that, which, which guarantees the freedom of religion to all members, but doesn't, as it were, isn't in any way um, determined by it, it doesn't, doesn't make laws in accordance with it. So I think that is a very necessary condition. Uh, of course, there is a... There is a um, a, a real possibility that in the very extreme circumstances of the kind you're talking about, that human beings might turn to religion, uh, turn to faith rather, as a means of um, you know, survival, not anything else. And that, that those faiths, like all faiths, if they're monotheistic faiths, faiths are likely to be uh, come into conflict with one another. But if they're, if they, and that's if they do, then they're a rule of law which is based not upon faith, but upon you know, calculated reason, on self-interest, if you like, on calculated self-interest, is um, a very necessary uh, condition. Yes. Hence, I can stress the important importance, the, the real sort of, as it were, the hard edge of all of this, which is the creation of a, of a, a form of international law, and into, into extraterrestrial law, if you like, um, to which all people are willing to be bound. Excellent. And there's a there's a question here from Paul Gladstone Reed. I think we should accept the fact that not everyone agrees the Enlightenment was great. <laughs> so he's got a, an interesting question. He says in, uh, Enlightenment principles underpin uh, the apocalyptic violence of settler colonialism, white supremacy, and uh, uh, and racialized capitalism and modern nation state. Of course, you know, the, and a revolutionary Atlantic world. And of course, that that's a fascinating discussion in itself. But there's certainly a view that. The, the rationalism, the, the scientific view of how to organize a society, some people would would claim was the basis of, of uh, societies that, that, that very much became focused on a scientific organization rather than a view of humanity. So, you know, just picking up on that and, and taking this slightly, this contrarian view of enlightenment principles, how can these principles we've been talking about be transferred uh, to a universal practice of egalitarian sovereignty with regards to settlements beyond the earth without uh, contributing to some of these, um, these other more negative aspects of, of what it's been associated with in the past? Well, it's a, it's a very um, tough question to ask because it's a huge debate in which I've been involved in for years and I'm we don't yes. have time, three minutes to answer. Yeah. So um, if whoever it is would like to write to me, I'd be happy to try and reply. But I think that the, the answer is that we're, I'm not sure that, I mean, the answer is this, that the claim that the Enlightenment is responsible is essentially a false one, uh, to put it very simply, or at least the, the claim that some kind of scientific rationalism as manifest in the 19th century is responsible for that um, is, is not false. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. But I think that is a property of the nationalist 
empires of the 19th century and not what happened in the 18th. There's a very, there's a very important passage in The Wealth of Nation, uh, which I, if I had known I was going to get this question, I could have read out to you, where Smith precisely said, um, we must avoid any attempt uh, to impose this on others. And the, 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 what is the, this, this expansion of the, of the world is a, is a great phenomenon. But uh, it may, in the end, prove deleterious to those peoples who have been caught up, as it has already proved destructive, destructive for the peoples of the East and West Indies. And I think this, this view that most of the, certainly all of the writers I'm talking about, and most of you, most of you of them, and a lot many others were, were violently opposed, or can't was, for instance, to any form of imperialism as we're talking about. Yeah. This, is a, this is a development of nationalism. Modern, modern 19th century empires were nationalist empires, not cosmopolitan ones. And, and certainly the aspect of, as I wanted to make this distinction, science is conceived as being you know, omnipresent in all this respect, this kind of view that John Gray has been like, as something that privileges this over other forms of knowledge, as he said, it is entirely false because it's precisely other forms of knowledge that I've been trying to discuss uh, today. But it, it's, it goes well beyond that sort of thing. And it is an ongoing battle uh, within academia and not only for that within academia. And of course, yeah. I clearly don't accept that the Enlightenment is responsible for this. Not that yeah. those things didn't happen, not that the, these situations aren't as your uh, interlocutor describes them, but simply that they are not, the, can't, the fault cannot be laid at the feet of the uh, great thinkers of the 18th century, least of all, uh, the ones that I've uh, chosen. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think that's a good good point to to touch on there. And then finally, just looking at time, perhaps we should finish off with one final question. There's, I'm just going to pick one question that again is linked to um, something that was an important discussion in the Enlightenment, which is how one claims private property. Going back to Locke's idea, so someone's asking about land, and I'm thinking here of you know, Locke's claim of mixing your um, mixing your labour with land and it makes it yours. So this, the whole Enlightenment vision of how one acquires private property and land, how does that apply to the extraterrestrial environment? Is it the case that if uh, the US lands on the moon and mixes their labour with lunar soil, uh, <laughs> that lunar rock should therefore belong to them? And how does this Lockean vision of, of, of property ownership tie in with this... Uh, this more UN conception of space being the province of all mankind or the province of all humankind. Well, I think that there's not, they're not contradictory. I mean, I think that, the, that we ge generally in the West, that anyway, we have this view of property, which is based upon labor, a uh, notion of mixing your labor with the, with the land or mixing your labor with everything. After all, Locke thought, you know, the Indian had the right to the deer he killed because by killing it, he'd mixed his labor. With it. So I mean, it's, a, it's much more complicated than just, but the idea that you develop, you, you, you acquire property rights by developing things um, is something that is, you know, still widely accepted. Also, of course, it's still widely challenged. So that the idea that we exploit nature, human beings exist in order to exploit nature. That's why God put them on the earth in the first place, which is also, of course, Locke's po wider point. Um, we don't, we no longer accept it. And they have much more nuanced views on what it is. That. So I, I really don't know how you would conceive and determine private property. I imagine that in practice, what would happen is that this would be um, the considered to be the domain of whatever private institution or state actually acquired them in the first place. I think probably it would be necessary to rethink the whole question of property rights in outer space and where you would start from, I really can't say, but I think part of this larger global order or extraterrestrial global order uh, that we would have to come up with this inter international interspace law. And I noticed at least one of the speakers, several of the speakers will be talking about this and maybe they have an answer to the question uh, to extend the notion of international law beyond the nation relationship between nations to some extraterrestrial settlement will obviously require rethinking uh, where, how you acquire, how we acquire property rights in space, or in, in, la in, in actual you know, pieces of other planets. When incidentally, of course, unlike other <clears throat> other debates on this issue, which always go back to the assumption that someone else already occupies in some sense that planet, because you know, Locke's claim, don't forget, is made to defend, it's made in the abstract, obviously, as a general principle, but it's made to defend 
the American colonists in, in, in North America, the British colonists in North America. This is how you acquire property on land. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anthony. I'm just looking at the time now. It's 10 past. We should probably end there as the next talk is at quarter past. I want to thank you uh, for joining us. It's been a real privilege to hear from you and a really fascinating talk. And also, I think, not just the connection with space, but just to get the wider historical and philosophical views on where some of these ideas come from that, that apply to the space environment. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I look forward to reading and listening to the rest of the talks um, as we go forward. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Um, greetings, everyone. Thank you again for, for staying online. Anyone who's new, welcome to uh, the Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty set of webinar talks. I'm very pleased now to introduce uh, Raphael Costa. He's a public law teacher and PhD candidate at Paris Saclay University and author of several books and articles about legal oddities and space law. And he's even got a, um, an extremely widely read French social media platform sharing law peculiarities, uh, Curiosité uh, Juridique, which has 400,000 followers. So he thinks very broadly about space law and its applications. And one of the things that he's been thinking about more recently is um, the application of, of laws to developing space colonies. So this is sort of continuing on from the discussion from Franz this morning about space legality. So he's going to talk about establishing a space colony, a legal guide. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for having me uh, today uh, speaking here. I'm very pleased. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce my, uh, my presentation. I will speak about space law, general space law, uh, and issues regarding the establishment of a space uh, colony. Uh, that is to say, a legal guide to the establishing of a, a space colony. Um, let me start by, uh, by my specialty, which are <laughs> legal oddities. Uh, space law is, uh, is often seen as a legal curiosity, uh, something very strange, very unusual. When I, uh, I say to, to lawyers or uh, law teachers that I am specialized in space law, they often laugh uh, and they don't believe it. They don't believe there is law uh, uh, regarding uh, human activities in our space. Um, and uh, uh, in France, for, for instance, we have some, um, law, some laws that are very strange. Uh, maybe you know the wine, um, which is, uh, uh, there is a famous uh, French wine, Chateauneuf du Pape. Uh, maybe you heard about it. And in France, in the city of Chateauneuf du Pape, it is completely forbidden for uh, aliens to come to visit. And if they land in Chateauneuf du Pape, um, the flying saucer can be sent uh, to uh, Fourier. You know, there, there is, it's a place uh, where we send uh, the cars that do not pay. Uh, to be parking somewhere. Uh, but space law is not a legal oddity. Um, the, the, the main uh, proof that it's not anymore a legal oddity is this book you can see on the screen, 50 Years of Space Law, 50 Ans du Droit de l'Espace. So this book was uh, published uh, a few months ago. It was edited by Philippe Achilles, uh, who is a French, French specialist of space law, and Stéphane Aube. Uh, the German one. And this book was uh, published by the Ag, Ag Academy of International Law, uh, which is attached to the International Court of Justice. And so this book comes back on the 50 years of space law, which we have passed now because uh, space law was born in 1967 uh, with uh, the adoption of the International Space Treaty. And on this book, uh, so I was part of the, the writers, and uh, I had to write a chapter about space law and um, colon space colonization. So what I will present to you is uh, the chapter of the book I've made with some uh, modifications for you to, to understand it, but uh, it's a long chapter, but, but it's in French. Uh, but you can find on this book uh, some uh, very classical topics, uh, that is to say uh, the birth of space law, uh, the fundamental principles, and you also have uh, very, um, uh, how can I say that in English, but like, uh, 
uh, avant-garde or very advanced topic discussed like space colonization or uh, uh, extraterrestrial life regarding space law. So topics also uh, very uh, related to science fiction. Um, how can I begin? I will begin with some uh, uh, general principles of space law. I don't know this morning if maybe Professor van der Bunk discussed um, the, the basis of space law. So uh, I will start by introducing you what is the discipline, the internet discipline of space law, and then uh, applying all those principles to space colonization. So let me <laughs> drink first. So now uh, let's go on with explaining space law. So space law is the law applying to any human activity uh, occurring in outer space. Uh, the, the, basi the basis of space law uh, are five international treaties. First, uh, the first one was the Outer Space Treaty adopted in 1967. Sorry for what I am about to do to you, but I will detail some of the main principles, just doing a list and uh, then I will apply them to conversation, but I don't know if maybe you have heard this, you have heard this morning this, so sorry if it was the case. So the first principle governing uh, the human activities in outer space is the freedom of exploration and use of outer space. Second principle is the prohibition of appropriation of outer space. The also, also the application of general international law to space activities. Uh, for instance, the UN uh, treaty. Also, there is a total demilitarization of celestial bodies and a partial one of uh, Earth's orbits. There are some principles of assistance due to astronauts in this in distress. Also, principles of returning space objects uh, in case of uh, falling on, on a foreign state. Also, there is a principle very important, a need for private entities to obtain an authorization, a state authorization, before engaging in activities in other space. And those private entities always have to submit to their state's continuous supervision. Uh, the consequence of that is that the freedom of exploration and use of other space is only to the benefit of states themselves, but not to private entities. Uh, principles of liability of states for private and public activities carried out in other space. It's an unusual principle in international law. Normally, states are only liable for their own activities, uh, especially in, in international zones. But uh, in other space, they are also liable for private activities because they have to authorize them and constantly supervise them. Uh, there are some principles of registration of space objects. I won't detail them uh, here, uh, and some mutual respects and cooperation procedures. So this was the first one, the first treaty adopted, the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, the principles of the treaty are drafted in very general terms, so they had to be uh, detailed uh, in other uh, international conventions. So the first one, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, 1967. Uh, the uh, later, the rescue agreement, which details the obligations of rescuing astronauts and returning space objects. Uh, liability convention details all the, the international liability principles I have explained to you. And then the registration convention, which also details uh, the registry of space objects principles. I, won't, I, I, I will not also develop on that. And the last one, the Moon Agreement. Uh, but before, uh, before uh, uh, entering in details on the principles applicable to space colonization, let me just tell you how many uh, states uh, have ratified and signed those treaties. It's really important because a treaty only applies to the state that has uh, to a state if this state has uh, ratified it. And if the states only have signed it, the treaty applies, but in a very minor way. So the Outer Space Treaty was ratified by more than 100 states, including all spacefaring nations. You can see now for the rescue agreement, liability, and registration, 
uh, it's not that much, but there are also a big number of states who um, uh, ratifying it. And the Moon Agreement, which which should be the the treaty at the basis of uh, of space colonization colonization law, only received 20 uh, ratifications, uh, including none. There is no space faring nation who has uh, ratified this agreement. And among the signatories, we can find only France uh, uh, as a space space faring nation, but there is no space faring nation uh, who has uh, give a consent to apply this treaty. And it's a treaty applying to all human activities on the moon and in any, uh, on any celestial body within the solar system. So it's, it's like that. Now, let me enter uh, after this brief in introduction, and I'm sorry it was a little bit long. Uh, let me give you a definition of what is aerospace colonization, uh, legally speaking. So first of all, colonization is not defined internationally and legally. There are several definitions of what is colonization. So my definition is uh, that colonization is a process by which an organized group of human beings extend its territory to new places. There can be more, uh, more elements, but I think this is the, base, uh, the, the core definition to all process of uh, colonization. Uh, so, colonize a space or space means occupy it definitely. So, the human establishment must exceed and outrun its founders. And we have to distinguish colonization from immigration because immigration is more like a personal or familial process, and uh, colonization is a social one. So, we, uh, this means that the International Space Station, which is the only a uh, permanent occupation of outer space by human for now is not a colonization per se, because it's, uh, the, the, the station will come to an end soon. And uh, by this station, human does not intend to occupy space indefinitely. Maybe with the uh, moon village, it will be different. But for now, I, I, I think we cannot uh, qualify the International Space Station as space colonization. So let me just. Voila. Uh, so the legal foundation of a space colony, we have to see two elements. Ah, sorry. Well, first step is to analyze the lawfulness of this project to colonize space. And the second step will be what, uh, if it's legal to colonize space, what are the conditions applicable uh, and that we must follow. And uh, the space uh, colonization um, can be by two ways. We can colonize space by uh, space stations, which is the occupation of, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but maybe the space emptiness, or we can colonize it by uh, occupying celestial bodies. So let's start by uh, celestial bodies colonization, which is uh, the more uh, touchy one. So traditionally, why it is complicated to colonize space by uh, occupying celestial bodies. It's because the traditional definition uh, of colonization is a, is a synonym of territorial appropriation, uh, which is completely forbidden by the Outer Space Treaty Article 2. Uh, when I did my research for uh, the, the article, I, I wrote, uh, the, the chapter I wrote for uh, the Ag Academy, um, I, I read a lot of colonial law books, classical ones uh, from 18th century. Uh, and uh, it, it's, I think it was, uh, it was the definition, the legal definition of colonization at this time was this one. It was a territorial appropriation by a state of a zone of a perimeter. And this is completely forbidden by the Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. So we use the term space colonization to to qualify this final occupation of space by men, but this term is uh, very used by science fiction authors. And uh, I think we keep this term colonization, but it cannot have the same meaning that the, uh, as it had for uh, legally speaking uh, for uh, the past uh, centuries. Uh, for instance, uh, when the US landed on the moon in 1969, and they put the flag on the moon territory, 
they, they had to be a, a community from uh, the US administration saying that it was just a fiscal symbol because this uh, mission was paid by, uh, by the Americans, but they were not intending to uh, appropriate uh, the land of the moon because the, the, the moon exploration just happened two years before the adoption of the outer space treaty and the non-appropriation principle was very important. So in conclusion, the outer space colonization is legal, but it cannot be uh, an appropriation of the zone. We can occupy celestial bodies, legal, we can occupy them. Uh, the treaties also uh, speak about human life on celestial bodies, but we cannot appropriate the, the land. So the state who will be colonizing uh, we'll have to be very careful by not claiming, be, uh, do a claim, a zone, a territory uh, claiming. And space stations, uh, all the scholars are uh, consent to say that they do not uh, cause any problem because they are constantly moving, so they do not constitute an appropriation of outer space. Uh, it will be more difficult to some, uh, um, some orbital positions with, which are uh, limited, like the geostationary one, uh, but um, the princip uh, principle of uh, uh, colonized space by station do not, uh, there is no legal issue about this one. Uh, so colonization per se is legal, as long as it means occupation, but then we can distinguish uh, from the type of colonization which is occurring in outer space, because when we colonize zones uh, in the past centuries, it was not just to occupy them. Uh, this colonization had, had a purpose. So some kind of colonies will not be legal. For instance, military colonies are not legal in aerospace. Uh, why? Uh, they are not legal on stellar bodies because the Article 4 of the Aerospace Treaty completely forbids the military use of, uh, of outer space. Uh, so military colonies, like we can, like there are a few on Earth, are completely forbidden on celestial bodies. And uh, mining factories, um, we name comptoir. Uh, when some uh, European countries installed comptoir, uh, like in India or things like that, uh, the status of this legal uh, possibility is completely uncertain. Uh, because, as you know, maybe Professor Van der Donk discussed this morning. Uh, some states consider the legal appropriation of the, the appropriation of space resources as a legal thing, uh, and uh, the majority of scholars tend to um, to think that uh, it's illegal to appropriate uh, the land. This is admitted by everyone, but uh, also the resources on this land. So uh, this is my conclusion: Celestia colonization only, as it means occupation, is legal. Now. Let me see with you the conditions of uh, uh, the legal conditions of the establishment of a space colony. So the first condition, of course, is to respect the legal, the legal regime of use of outer space, as we saw in the beginning. You see with my list, uh, my uh, my boring list of uh, the principles of the outer space treaty. So this is the first condition to respect to establish a legal colony within the few years. Also. A uh, very important point is that the, the a colonizing state, uh, and I speak uh, only of state because as, you, as I told you, uh, space law only applies to states and then states have the responsibility, the international responsibility to ensure that these principles are also apply, uh, applied by uh, their nationals. Uh, so the state who will be colonizing only can only retain personal jurisdiction over the settlers. Um, this is very important because if it retains a uh, territorial jurisdiction, it will be an appropriation of the land. So uh, it's, uh, it's one of the conditions, uh, it's, it's maybe an evident one, but not that much because when a state was colonizing, it was applying its law to a zone, but now it, it cannot do that in space. A state can only apply its law to a group of peoples. Uh, so the state who will keep jurisdiction over a colony will be the state of registry of the space object. And uh, space law 
uh, specifies, uh, precise that uh, a state retains jurisdiction within uh, the module it sent to space, but also within uh, its, uh, its um, the settlers when they are outside the module. So imagine a state is colonizing the moon. Uh, it will retain jurisdiction over the settlers inside the modules, but also outside. This will give uh, will um, will raise maybe a legal issue because what happens in case of legal issue outside the module? For instance, if there are several states colonizing the moon, uh, as long as something happens inside the module, it's the law of the re state of registry uh, which applies. Uh, but uh, if there there is a legal problem occurring outside any module between two foreign uh, settlers, what, which, what, what is the law applicable? If the states colonize uh, uh, unilaterally, there is no answer uh, to this question. There are also uh, the conditions to establish a colony, protect the settlers because they are considered, uh, considered as envoys of mankind in our space by space law. Uh, so there is a protective and mutual helping regime among them. Uh, there is also some environmental obligations. Uh, I mentioned this point because one of the solutions to colonize space would be to terraform um, Mars. And I won't be detailing here, but for now, the terraforming of Mars is completely forbidden by positive international law. Uh, so then there is some cooperation obligations among the states. Now uh, imagine the long-term colonization of outer space. We, uh, we will have some intern legal issues arising within the space colony. First of all, the, it's the organizational model. Uh, this co colonizing space will it be uh, made unilaterally or in cooperation. If it's made unilaterally, some problems will arise as uh, the legal issues between foreigners outside. Uh, because when there is a legal problem between two foreign people, uh, admitting this problem occurs in Paris. It's French law generally will apply because there is a territorial jurisdiction of France in Paris. But in our space, outside the module, there is no uh, jurisdiction um, of, of that kind, territorial jurisdiction. So which law applies? The, the solution to that problem should be to colonize space with a cooperational system as we did for international space station and states in the space station have, um, have settled a regime in case of a crime occurring inside, which could be a model. Uh, also the property rights of the settlers will become an issue. Uh, space Post also says that property rights are uh, maintained in our space. So the legal relationship, I already said it. Uh, and uh, by studying the, uh, by studying uh, classical colonial law, uh, we, we, I saw that generally when a state built a colony, there was not so that much of a legal order. And, but by the years, there was a progressive growth of a complex legal order and institutions uh, as law was extending. Uh, then we have some legal, uh, external legal issues to space colony, uh, long term speaking, and this will be the link with the colony and the metropolis, because uh, in space law, the space activities should always be carried uh, within the supervision and uh, authorization of a state on hers, and with the colonies, with the long term uh, issue of colonies on hers, we saw that the link with uh, the metropolis was often a problem. And in outer space, I think this issue will be much more because uh, all activities in outer space should be um, re uh, reported and authorized by hers. Uh, so what would be the legal regime of the outer space colony? This regime will only be exclusively decided at the beginning by uh, an urgent state. There are three kinds of regimes, subjugation, assimilation, or autonomy, and this will be uh, uh, at the will at the beginning of uh, a state. Uh, there is, if uh, the link, the, the legal regime shoes is uh, too much subjugative or um, 
not uh, sufficiently autonomous, uh, risk of unilateral declaration of independence by a space colony. Uh, maybe if, uh, if this colony creates its own state, uh, will the, the elements of uh, identification of a state are uh, population, territory, and jurisdiction. But in, as there is uh, no possibility to, uh, to claim territory in other space, maybe we can see the, 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 the birth of a new kind of state, the free territory one, if there is a declaration of independence. I don't believe it's that much, but maybe it will be some legal uh, creativity. And uh, as it is, uh, uh, there is not that much sense that if there is a declaration of independence, uh, it will be by a free territory state. Now this is, we signify the end of positive international law because state will be, uh, space will be uh, appropriate by this new state created you know, space by this colony. So I am done. Thank you for your attention. I hope this was not too long. Uh, and you enjoyed the, uh, this presentation. Great, thank you very much, Raphael. That was a really nice um, summary of the legal situation, some of your thoughts about applications, thank you. if you want to um, end sharing. And anyone who has any questions, please feel free to um, ask questions in the question and answer box. I'm gonna pick up on one question uh, right away from Martin Elvis, it's also um, uh, sort of being discussed in the chat here. That is, you, know, you, you put a station on the moon or Mars and wherever it is, uh, by default, you're sort of appropriating that land that you've put on, you put the station on just by the mere fact of its existence. How do you do that? I mean, it, theoretically it's illegal, but how do you deal with the situation that building infrastructure on a planetary body is in some sense appropriating that space because now no one else can use it? Technically, uh, it's legal because space occupation is legal and the article one of the other space treaty says that you can use other space freely. Uh, and for instance, in the moon agreement, they deal, they, they, they deal with this issue by saying that even if you are, um, uh, appropriating a zo the zone you are occupying, you cannot uh, you cannot forbid other states to access to some zones. You can just occupy the, the the minimum you need to stay on the moon. But of course, there will be uh, an there will be an appropriation by occupation, even if there is no claim. It's a legal issue that is not uh, not uh, not resolved yet. Uh, and uh, I I'm seeing on the chat a question, uh, choosing the term colonization, not, it's not a critic from me, it's uh, because it's a term, I don't know, maybe in English not, but in French, uh, we, al we, we always use the term space colonization to, me to, to, to just speak of the space occupation by men. So that's why I was clarifying the, my use of this term. It's, it's just to, to say occupation. But I think in English also we use space colonization, no? To... It's an interesting one. I mean, it's more of a definitional thing, but nevertheless, I think, um, you know, technically colonization, you talk about microbes colonizing a Petri dish. And I think from a scientific point of view, the word is okay, but, but of course it comes with a lot of dark history and historical baggage in, in what it implies, uh, at least from a Western point of view and, uh, you know, the effects on indigenous people. So I think that people have a discomfort with this discussion of, Yes. colonizing space because of course there are no indigenous people elsewhere in the solar system but it's still this notion of conquest and, and moving in and conquering yes. new environments uh, and you know it's an interesting I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that I'm not sure what word one could use settlement is another word one could use or you know uh, you know just establishing a society perhaps there are just words that we can use that avoid colonization but I think people have different views on the strength of feeling they that, have about of course, that's why on my, uh, on my chapter, uh, the discussion was that, okay, we can use, keep this term colonization, but it has to change a little bit the meaning of it. It cannot mean uh, land appropriation as it, it usually uh, uh, intended to be. Yeah. Uh, there's another question here. Um, hang on, let me just move that up so I can see who it is. Shannon Wan, who's asking, what do you think would be the most realistic yet inclusive progression of space colonization? How is the current state of affairs from the aspect of states and international uh, relations and what should be done to reach the ideal 
end state? That's a very interesting question. I suppose the question is, is there an, an ideal end state or should it be more pragmatic? Yeah, I mean, what do you think about how we should progress space colonization, space settlement? I think it, it, it should be done in cooperation as it was the case for uh, uh, the International Space Station. It's a more uh, interesting system uh, because it solved all the issues regarding uh, foreign jurisdiction uh, and uh, and things like that. It's, uh, the states uh, managed to solve all, all the issues uh, I mentioned uh, for the International Space Station. Uh, so I think the more, uh, so the only model of space colonization respecting all uh, the principles of outer space is a cooperative uh, model. Because what is uh, forbidden in outer space is national appropriation. But as long as you are colonizing in cooperation, there is, uh, even if you're occupying, occupying some land, uh, it's not a national appropriation anymore. Any, anymore. It's, it's an international one and it's not forbidden. So I think th this will be the only model uh, acceptable and fully respective of uh, uh, international space law. Yeah. I'm following on from that, there's a question from Scott uh, Cassingham saying, so is there any international consideration of what law applies to areas outside of a facility if neither a personal facility or equipment is involved? What kind of law would be needed that is now lacking? And I think the answer to that is right, the UN law still applies where, you, where people yes, are not norm present. No, normally it's the law uh, nor normally, it's, it's the law of the state of registry of an object which applies. There, there, uh, for instance, if a situation occurs between a French and, uh, you know, uh, I'm half French, half Portuguese, so it's between a French and a Portuguese on the moon, but if the situation occurs within the French module, it's French law who will apply uh, among them because they're inside the French module. But uh, so, for now, the application of flow in space is related to the object sending the people. So my point was to say what, what is the law apply, applicable uh, in case of a uh, situation occurring only between two persons, not involving any space object, and outside those objects, because we don't have the answer for this, this question. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just following on, uh, Shannon's following on this question about again, turning to this idea of the development of space settlement and how it, how it progresses. This question of, um, so, so how should the cooperative model be realistically executed, taking into consideration the global superpowers from a realistic perspective in international relations? And I suppose this question, you know, ties directly into the Artemis Accords that we'll, we'll hear more about tomorrow from, from Chris Newman. But this general question of, of, if you have various um, powers present on the moon and Mars, particularly in places where there may be a limited resource, and, and Martin Elvis has thought about this, where you've got a, a limited resource, how do you put in place a cooperative regime where there isn't superpower conflict on the moon? I know that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, there is no, no it's thoughts. not an easy question. If there, if there is no... no uh... Uh, how to say that in English? Sorry. <laughs> if the superpowers do not want to to set up a cooperative regime, there won't be any cooperative regime. We cannot force them because states are autonomous uh, uh, persons regarding to international law. So there is no, from a realistic perspective, I think that it will be impossible to set up this cooperative regime from a, a really uh, realistic, from a, re a real a realistic perspective. Um, I think there is no solution as long uh, states not have an interest to fully cooperate to, to, to establish a new permanent settlement. So some states which have political uh, same views can manage it as they did for the International Space Station, but uh, we will not succeed to together all states to, to realistically set up this cooperative regime. It's, I think it's impossible. Uh, so do you think ultimately, pragmatically, we just have to wait until the situation arises and then presumably yes. the two parties have to cooperate? I mean, either they fight or they cooperate. So presumably, in some sense, to say we, we, it's difficult to come up with these regimes of cooperation is difficult. But one of the reasons why we don't come up with them, of course, because it's not needed yet. But ultimately, if there are two stations in a lunar crater, for example, 
eyeing up some lunar ice that they want to exploit, presumably at that point, there will be no choice but to come up with some internationally agreed regime. Yes, of course, it, it will be a, uh, uh, yeah, when the situation occurs, there will be law, of course, because states will have to cooperate. And even if not, they, they do not cooperate, it will, it will still be, uh, that will, there will still be a need for law. Uh, and the law applicable to other space will still be the, the UN treaty for, for now, I think. Uh, so um, I don't really have an answer to this question. We will, see, we will have to wait and see. So I'm just going to ask you a related question that comes to mind that I haven't, I don't really see addressed many times by space lawyers, which is the policeability of laws in space. I mean, we can come up with these legal agreements and Artemis Accords and, and other things that set a framework that's either regulations or formal law. How do you think, I mean, what are your thoughts on the policeability of laws? Presumably if you're in a crater on the moon, you're in a confined two-dimensional space, in which case you could actually have some sort of police force that like you do on the Earth. But if you have people hiding in the vast three-dimensional spaces of, say, the asteroid belt or beyond, um, how realistic are laws throughout the solar system, and particularly in the outer solar system, where the space is, you know, the three-dimensional space you have to police gets larger and larger the further away you go from the Earth and increasingly impossible to police. Do you have any thoughts on policing a solar system legal regime? Uh, I think I was not prepared to this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just wondering whether you had any sort of general thoughts. You have, uh, first, if you have some people hiding, uh, if I, I clearly understood your question, if you have the, first of all, if, the, if it's still current space law applying to space, there will be a difficulty if you have some uh, police situation on, uh, on celestial bodies because the Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty completely uh, prohibits military uses of uh, celestial bodies and even uh, it prohibits even the sending of military people, uh, uh, the, the, the military, military uh, people can only be sent to uh, celestial bodies to do like, like uh, some scientific uh, activities. So for now, I, I think uh, the only place we can have uh, like an, a space policy will be um, on the emptiness of space. On celestial bodies, it's forbidden for now. Uh, so it will still be the same thing. How how can we apply um, how can we apply law to this uh, to this hmm. to this place? But it's it's an un, uh, unresolved question. We cannot it's an I cannot of course, too far answer. You know, you can you can say we just you know the, the response to what happens is someone puts you know military equipment in space. Well, we have a tough space law, but in the context of this webinar series, of course, one of the defining characteristics of tyranny and of a tyrant is that they don't really obey laws, or where they do, they use them to their own advantage. Um, so with the best will in the world, the best legal structure does not stop tyranny, because that's what tyranny is, it's, you know, arbitrary, arbitrary rule, arbitrary coercion. So ultimately, you know, if you if you have someone who is in space and then decides to build military equipment there and disperse it through the solar system, uh, presumably there needs to be a method of policing that. So you have to go beyond law into some structure of policing. And presumably the legal structure also needs to be realistic with respect to its ability to be policed. Otherwise, it's just bits of paper. Um, so, yeah, I'm just interested to know how lawyers think they can build laws that are not necessarily just good in themselves and well constructed themselves, but can also be implemented and enforced because presumably that's a quite important aspect of a law, right? The ability to enforce it in the first place. Yes, of course. I, I have nothing else to, to say to what you say because it's completely true. Uh, if, there is no need, if there is no international will to uh, enforce uh, space laws, there, will be, there won't be because uh, international law, it's a difficulty that uh, the, the subject of international law uh, have themselves to, to make to make it uh, be respected. Uh, for instance, if you want, uh, as a private entity within a state, uh, if there are some laws that are uh, not respected, you just go to court and there is a third person that will apply law to you and your situation. But in our space, it is impossible because the subject of law is a state itself. 
So there is no third party that the state can go and see and, and tell uh, them apply space law to, to my situation because there is another state violating it. So there is a state themselves that have to, to make sure space law is applicable. There is no third party uh, yes. as, a, as a guarantee. I can see one question about uh, terraforming. Uh, it's uh, where it is prohibited. You can see uh, it's not um, stricto sensu prohibited. You can see this prohibition in Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which uh, prohibits the modification of outer space environment. Uh, and so if you apply this principle, it's, it prohibits terraforming for Article 9. Uh, but it's only a principle applying as long as all scientific research has, uh, uh, haven't been made. So um, it's just an interpretation uh, thing, but to me now, uh, for in, in the current state of uh, international law, terraforming is prohibited. Also, I think there is a, so this is a general principle of terraforming which is prohibited, and then there is some techniques which, uh, which are forbidden. For instance, you cannot send any uh, any uh, mass uh, weapon of mass destruction on uh, celestial bodies, and I think there is some technique for to terraform Mars by the sending of um, of weapons of mass destruction, which are also forbidden. So, terraforming itself is forbidden, and also some techniques are by themselves. Yes. Right. We, uh, do you, do we have some more questions or? No, I think we should probably stop there as we're three minutes off the the next speaker. But that's fine. That's what this buffer zone is for. It's fascinating. Okay. And I hope it was okay with my English. <laughs> I know <laughs> I have a terrible life. The talk was excellent, very clear. Thank you very much. And thanks for your thank time, you Raphael, and joining your... us. Okay, thank you. And for everyone thank else. Thank you. Um, have a nice day. Thank you. Cheers, Raphael. Bye. Well, yeah. Uh, and for everyone else, yeah, we hope to start in three minutes' time, three o'clock, um, just seeing if our next speaker has arrived yet. Doesn't look like it. Anyway, we will. Um, We'll be back at exactly or just after three o'clock. Thanks, everyone. It's one minute past, so I think we'll we'll start if that's okay with okay. you. And then okay, at the end, I'm ready. Yeah. Michael, if you've got time to stay for questions for the to the end of the half an hour, I know you've got to go at the end. But, yep, I'll stay. Sure, absolutely. Great. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, uh, hello everyone again. Thank you for staying online. For those of you who may have just turned up, thank you for uh, coming to the webinar series, Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty. So our next speaker this afternoon is Michael Shermer. Uh, he is a science writer, historian of science, and founder of the Skeptic Society, and editor-in-chief of its magazine, uh, Skeptic, which is largely devoted to investigating pseudoscientific and supernatural claims. And the Skeptic Society currently has over 55,000 members. So Michael Shermer engages in, in debates on, on topics related to things like pseudoscience and religion, uh, emphasizing scientific skepticism and the application of the scientific method to these sorts of uh, problems, um, hence his uh, work on founding the Skeptic Society. He's the author of, of a number of books, including Giving the Devil His Due, in which in there he does consider uh, some aspects of extraterrestrial settlement. So today he's going to talk about governing Mars, lessons for the red planet from experiments in governing the blue planet. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thanks, Charles, and uh, good uh, good afternoon, everyone, or as we say in California, good morning. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, when I was writing uh, my book, The Moral Arc, and the last chapter, I speculated about the future of moral progress. That is, to what extent can we expand the moral sphere even more to uh, include not only all members of our species, but other species, and then what happens when we uh, uh, migrate out into other uh, moons and planets and possibly even other solar systems and, and other galaxies and so on. Well, we're still taking with us our DNA. <laughs> we're still taking with us our human nature. And uh, so that got me to thinking about uh, more close to home when uh, Elon Musk uh, announced he was gonna you know, send people to Mars. I tweeted at him just for fun. And here's my tweet. When you start the first Mars colony at Elon Musk, what documents would you recommend using to establish a governing system? And then I listed a few US Constitution slash Bill of Rights, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
Humanist Manifesto, Atlas Shrugged, Against the State, and Anarcho-Capitalist Manifesto, and so on. And to my utter amazement, he, uh, a few minutes later, replied back, direct democracy by the people. Laws must be short, as there is trickery in length. Automatic expiration of rules to prevent death by bureaucracy. Any rule could be removed by 40% of the people to overcome inertia. Freedom. <laughs> I thought, well, that's pretty good for, you know, 140 characters or whatever that is. Uh, he did elaborate on that. Someone else asked him at the South by Southwest conference that year. This was 2019. Uh, what exactly he meant uh, by that. So he expanded on that. Most likely the form of government on Mars would be somewhat of a direct democracy where, where people vote directly on issues instead of going through representative government. When the United States was formed, representative government was the only thing that was logistically feasible. There was no way for people to communicate instantly. A lot of people didn't have access to mailboxes. The post office was primitive. A lot of people couldn't write. So you have to have some form of representative democracy or things just wouldn't work at all. But on Mars, everyone votes on every issue and that's how it goes. There are a few things I recommend, which is keep laws short. Long laws, that's like something suspicious going on there if there's long laws. Uh, to, to which I responded, well, yeah, that sounds great in principle. Can't reasonable people just get along with a handful of rules, such as don't hurt other people and don't take their stuff. That's the title of Matt Kibbe's <clears throat> Libertarian Manifesto. Or golden rules like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it's silver derivative. Don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. Unfortunately, the answer is no, that, uh, it, that it doesn't work that way. And the reason is human nature. And uh, so here I quote from James Madison in his Federalist Paper Number 51, it's one of the founding documents of the, uh, of the United States, uh, which is an analog to what we're about to embark on in colonizing the red planet. So here's what Madison said. But what is government itself, but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Therein lies the problem. <laughs> A second reason uh, comes straight out of uh, an analysis that my friend and colleague UCLA geographer Jared Diamond calculated about the complexity of human dyads, two people, then three people, then four people, and so on. And here's how he constructs this, uh, thinking about hunter-gatherer people in the uh, at Papua New Guinea, where he uh, does his studies. A small band of 20 people generates 190 possible dyads or two-person interactions. That's 20 times 19 divided by two. Small enough for informal conflict resolution, something like what uh, Musk is, is talking about here. If you just have 20 people, you can just sit around in a circle and talk about it. But increase that 20 to 2,000 and you're facing 1,999,000 possible dyads. That's 2,000 times 1999 divided by two. Here, a 100-fold population increase produces a 10,000-fold dyadic rise. And those dyads have conflicts. People just do not agree on what they like and what, how life should go and what the rules should be and so on. They just don't. They have different interests and tastes and so on. So scale that up to cities of 200,000 or 2 million. And the potential for conflict multiplies beyond comprehension. Along with it, laws and regulations needed to ensure relative harmony and efficiency. Uh, here's how Jared Diamond says it in Guns, Germs, and Steel. Quote, once the threshold of several hundred, below which everyone could know everyone else, has been crossed, increasing numbers of dyads becomes pairs of unrelated strangers. Hence, a large society that continues to leave conflict resolution to all of its members is guaranteed to blow up. <laughs> that factor alone should explain why societies of thousands can exist only if they develop centralized authority to monopolize force and resolve conflict. So the um, you know the Max Weber's definition of government, a uh, you know a body with a uh, monopoly on the legitimate use of force, uh, seems inevitable because uh, you have these inevitable conflicts that arise when you have huge numbers, and too many people to just sit around and talk about it and, and resolve it peacefully, uh, and therefore to enforce the rules. At some point, you have to have behind it the the threat of force or force itself. So. 
Musk has said that the threshold for a self-sustaining city on Mars or a civilization on Mars would be a million people. That number generates nearly 500 billion dyadic, dyadic combinatorial possibilities. That's 1 million times 999,999 divided by two. Meaning any hope for manual of short laws would soon become tomes of bureaucratic legalese and all that entails in earthly political and legal systems, suffocating regulations, entangling restrictions, government overreach and suppression of individual freedom and autonomy. Martian colonists will need to figure out how to prevent a bureaucracy from expanding in response to the accelerating dyadic combinations as their population increases which has happened on every government on earth as if it were a law of nature. Now, it's possible that, uh, you know, the Elon's engineers or NASA's social scientists or whoever will think of something completely different. I, I don't wanna discount that. It's possible we just haven't thought of something better than democracy. I mean, democracy is, you know, a, an evolving system over uh, thousands of years or at least centuries anyway. Um, and, but, but maybe we just haven't thought of it. Maybe it's just too much inertia. Well, whatever it is, it's going to have to deal with the problems I just described. And I don't see a way around that. Uh, the, the direct democracy sounds good. Uh, but uh, the moment you set that up, you, you get in, uh, into the problem of what the founding fathers of the United States called tyranny of the majority, also known as Bob Rule. You get 51%. Uh, too bad for the 49%. We're going to do whatever we like. Well, you can't do that, which is why we have a Bill of Rights. There's certain things you just can't do no matter how many people. It could be 99% of the people think X should be the way it is. If it violates one of those um, rights in, in the Bill of Rights, well, then you can't do it. And uh, so I think um, a few lessons can be learned from natural experiments. So let's think about how historians conduct science. Most people think of history as part of the humanities. I think of it as part of the social sciences as, as a science. That is, we can use the comparative method and see what different experiments have been tried around the world. So I think of it like this. Uh, let's say in the United States, we have 50 different states with 50 different um, gun control uh, laws and regulations. And we can look to see how they differ, which they do, and to see uh, and controlling for other factors like socioeconomic status and, and, and so forth, and, and see how their uh, vi uh, gun violence rates vary and see if there's something we can tease out of that a mess of data, uh, some causal vectors that would lead us to find a, you know, a right solution to say gun violence. So, so you can just apply that anywhere. And, uh, and so you have across the board, historically, uh, intentional communities, that is nation states and, and groups of any kind that intent were intentionally set up, designed, written laws and constitutions and so on. And we can see how they differ. Now, obviously, this is very complex. A small country of mostly homogeneous people are gonna, is going to pr probably have different kinds of problems than a massive, huge country like the United States with a very heterogeneous population. But nevertheless, you can control for those sorts of things. But if we scale down and look at uh, like artificial communities, uh, such as the kibbutzen uh, in Israel or uh, some of these uh, communes that were established in the 19th century in America, and we can see how they do. Uh, they mostly fail uh, because uh, they, they tend to lean toward a more communal form of governance. And that doesn't work uh, with uh, uh, human nature for the most part. Um, and then a final uh, example that I, I really enjoyed uh, reading in Nicholas Christakis's book, book Blueprint, I was unaware that there's a database that he accessed, <clears throat> excuse me, of, uh, of shipwreck survivors, and um, and and, and there is actually a book published in 1813, and here's the title of this book: of a collection of interesting accounts of naval disasters, with many particulars of the extraordinary adventures and sufferings of the crews of vessels wrecked at sea, and of their treatment on distant shores. That's the title, <laughs> very 19th century title. So the book uh, consists of. Um, 24 small-scale shipwreck societies that developed over a 400-year span from 1500 to 1900. Okay, just to be clear, a ship crashes, wrecks, the um, sailors survive uh, and are rescued, or they don't survive, they all die. 
And uh, so in terms of the database here, the, uh, the, the populations range from four to 500 with a mean of 119. And, uh, and so the duration of the unplanned societies range from two months to 15 years with a mean of 20 months. Some of the survivors killed and ate each other, murder and cannibalism, while others survived and flourished and were eventually rescued. What made the difference? So here's how Christakis puts it, quote, the groups that typically fared best were those that had good leadership in the form of mild hierarchy without any brutality, friendships among the survivors and evidence of cooperation and altruism. Uh, close quote. The successful shipwreck society shared food equitably, took care of the sick and injured survivors and worked together digging wells, burying the dead, building fires and building escape boats. There was little hierarchy. For example, while on board their ships, officers and enlisted men were separated, but on land successful castaways integrated everyone in a cooperative, egalitarian and more horizontal structure, putting aside prior hierarchical class differences in the interest of survival. Camaraderie emerged and friendships across such barriers were formed. So, uh, and then, then um, Christakis presents a perfect experiment. This is like these natural experiments that happens. You can never get it approved by an IRB and uh, committee. Uh, and this is when two ships, the Invercald and the Grafton, wrecked on the same island, Auckland, at the same time. This is South Pacific down by uh, South of New Zealand. It's actually 290 miles south of New Zealand. So, I mean, it is way down there, super isolated. This happened in 1864. So two ships, the Invercal and the Grafton, same island, which is 26 miles long and 16 miles wide. Um, they were separated from each other. I mean, they, they didn't even see each other uh, and their outcomes were starkly different. For the Invercald, 19 out of the 25 crew members made it to the island, but only three survived when rescued a year later whereas all five of the Grafton crew members made it to land and all five were rescued two years later. Here's how Christakis puts it. The differential survival of the two groups <clears throat> may be ascribed to differences in initial salvage and differences in leadership, but it was also due to differences in social arrangements. Among the Invercald crews, there was an every man for himself attitude, whereas the men of the Grafton were cooperators. They shared food equitably, worked to together toward common goals like repairing the dinghy, voted democratically for a leader who could be replaced by a new vote, dedicated themselves to their mutual survival and treated one another as equals. <clears throat> so the characteristics that um, Nicholas Christakis outlines for uh, the suite of characteristics that leads to a more harmonious um, uh, organization, social organization, let's just call it that instead of a government. Here are the eight. One, the capacity to have and recognize individual identity. That's our nature. We want to be individuals. Two, love for partners and offspring. Obviously, we're not isolated. We have uh, family. Three, friendship. We also have extended family and community and, and, and so forth out to number four, social networks. These are people we're not related to. Uh, but interact, not related to genetically, but interact with in uh, reciprocally altruistic ways. Five, cooperation. Six, preference for one's own group. That is an in-group bias. Of course, you want to care for the other people in your group, so you are cooperative. Mild hierarchy. That is relative egalitarianism. You can't have a perfectly flat horizontal um, social organization. You have to have some hierarchy, uh, but not too much, especially if it's uh, the hierarchy is imposed with violence. And eight, social learning and teaching. Whatever the right balance of these characteristics will be for the first Martians remains to be seen, but the overall balance to be sought is between individualism and group living, that is individual autonomy balanced with commitment to the community. So uh, the problem here is that, uh, you know, by nature, if the social organization lets me just selfishly pursue my own uh, individual and autonomous goals and desires um, at the cost of somebody else's, uh, then that's not going to be conducive um, to our first Martian colony. Um, so you have to, let's say, tweak the dials to use a metaphor to bring out our better angels and to uh, attenuate our, our inner demons, those uh, desires to, let's say, use other people. And um, 
So the prospects of establishing a, a human colony and eventually a human civilization on Mars uh, not only boggles the mind and fires the imagination, it's a call to action to gather the best science we have on how best to live there, which is what this conference is all about. And um, so just to speak, I guess, you know, just off the page here, um, the problem to be solved is, is a profound one. It's th th this is an excuse to think about historically to what extent humans are by nature uh, trustworthy, cooperative, you know, pro-social and so on, and to what extent we're selfish and greedy and, and, and potentially violent? And the answer is, of course, both. So it, it very much, even though much of this is, uh, is heritable, you know, sort of the logic of the selfish gene model, you know, scaled up um, that at some point, uh, morality uh, derives from the fact that I'm aware that you also have a human nature like mine that would lead you to pursue your own self-interest. And you know that I have that same nature. So I have to take your interest into consideration if I want you to take my interest into consideration. And out of that, we can derive a moral system. Uh, and from that, we can derive a, a governance system. So it has to be a disinterested party that decides kind of conflict resolution. Uh, because it's clear to everybody that we each have our own self-interest. So much of, I think, um, modern democratic constitutions, particularly those developed after the Second World War, after the uh, decolonization period, many of which were modeled on the United States Constitution, uh, are kind of converging toward certain, um, let's say, political truths that we're probably going to have to take with us to Mars rather than invent a whole new governing system. In terms of that, I mean, again, I don't wanna write this off. It's entirely possible. Elon's engineers will come up with something none of us can think of, but that's not how science and technology works. If you look at the history of science and technology, every object ever invented, every scientific discovery ever made, every one of them comes from incrementally from some other invention or idea that was already there and this is why we have so much simultaneous invention and discovery in the history of science and technology. And I think the same is gonna be true for social technologies, for governing systems like that. We're gonna to have to take with us uh, the things we've learned. And I think we've learned a lot. I think there is a lot of moral progress that has happened despite the current uh, controversies that we all wrangle about. The fact that those are getting smaller and smaller in, in uh, nature means we, we've solved a lot of the big problems. And uh, so I'll close with uh, my own uh, opening of the what, what we might call the Martian Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to leave their planet and dissolve the political bands which have connected them to the people of the home planet and to assume among the powers of Mars, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of earthlings requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation to become Martians. And then we'll list the things we're unhappy about uh, on, on Earth, which there's plenty to complain about. <clears throat> and then we might write a preamble to a Martian constitution. We, the people of the United States of Mars, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our poster posterity do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of Mars. Well, I know it sounds crazy, but uh, you know, more unlikely things have happened in the history of our civilization. And as Robert Browning stirred, ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? Okay, here we go. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, uh, Michael. That's excellent. And anyone got questions, please do put them in the question and answer box. Um, so Bernard Hennin's got a question. He's asking, is the fact that colonists in space will be educated and scientifically educated change the way they will perceive society and how they should operate? Do we have analogs of small scientifically literate populations forming uh, self-autonomous colonies? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I think it would help in this sense that um, not, not that scientists are, are somehow above human nature to have selfish desires and so on. Clearly, that's not the case. 
but they're trained to, instead of embracing, say, a political ideology, uh, a, a norm of truth seeking, whatever the facts say. And even though scientists have the preferred theories say that they are motivated to reason their way to, to support, the system itself requires them to look for the flaws in their own uh, theories and, and to pursue truth and have a fact-based uh, system, including moral system, and that would help. Uh, are there are there any large scale? No, there's no large scale uh, versions of this. But scientific communities themselves are inherently more peaceful and resolve conflicts uh, less violently than, say, ideological or political groups, or certainly religious groups historically. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I suppose there are, of course, there are small scientifically literate populations at Antarctic stations, but they're not permanent. They're quite short that, term, right. yes, and they yes. tend to be quite yes, hierarchical. And, yes, and they have their own state behind them. You yes, know, so they're, they're, they're you know they're not like Hobbes living in you know isolation. Um, yeah. O on that um, subject of short term versus more permanent settlements. Do you think that there might be, I mean, do you think that the, the lessons we learned, you, you brought up shipwrecks, can be applied given that those people, well, I suppose some of them were stuck on islands for years, right? So fairly long time, they, they weren't like mm -hmm. short, uh, small groups of people in a research station. Some of them were quite long-term experiments. But do you think we have uh, good experiments on the earth where we have these more long-term communities that have started from, from scratch? Well, these uh, intentional communities that I mentioned, uh, 19th century communes in, uh, in America, for example, or the kibbutzim, some of them can survive if they have, um, you know, like an, a, a long-term goal, like some of these you know, produced products and, and kind of uh, employee-owned companies, something like that, where there was a sense of community. But they still have a lot of hierarchy in the commune where everybody is supposedly equal. There's still a lot of hierarchy because, again, somebody has to, uh, you know, resolve the conflict when the two people that are in conflict can't do it themselves. And at some point, you need some ultimate force that, you know, we're going to kick you out of the group. Uh, you know, Christopher Bum's uh, book on this, The Origins of Morality, he has this huge database of hunter gatherers around the world, currently, you know, surviving ones, and how they deal with free, free riders and freeloaders and bullies and people that don't play nice by the rules of the group. And uh, they have a whole system of, of enforcement of the rules and gossip about the person who's not uh, trustworthy or is not a good group member, uh, all the way up to sanctions and punishments and, and even capital punishment, uh, which is where that first came from, uh, is our hunter gatherers practice capital punishment. At some point, if you, know, if you have one of these dark triad bullies, you know, psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, the so-called dark triad, uh, they just do not ever play nice by the rules. They don't care. And uh, so there, sometimes you just have to get rid of them. And uh, that's pr probably going to happen in a Martian colony. You're just going to have some guy out there just, and I say guy, cause it's probably going to be a guy <laughs> uh, that causes so many problems. You just got to get rid of them and, you know, send them back to earth or, you know, send them to, to one of the uh, Martian moons or something like this. I don't know that, that, that inevitably is going to arise. And, you know, natural selection just could not get rid of every last non-cooperating social group member that's just too costly in terms of how natural selection works so we've we've evolved this system where we have about one to three percent of the population are these kind of uh, bullies and free riders that uh, we just have to have some system to deal with yeah yeah thank you and there's a question from matt and, and billy actually asking similar questions um billy saying you know would a scientific outpost not have all the tyranny of a university. I love that, by the way. And then Matt um, <laughs> saying, you know, to follow up on Bernard's question, is there a danger that society dominated by scientists could lead to problems like excessive expert planning, scientific socialism, or technocracy run amok? Yeah, well, that's been a problem historically. We could say so-called scientific socialism, uh, you know, going back to Marx and Engels and you know, those experiments have been run. We've had lots and lots of experiments for over a century, and we can see what a disaster those kind of social structures have been. So uh, it's good to learn from that and not take those with us. 
Here I'm thinking of uh, kind of a Burkean conservatism in the old sense, uh, probably better described as classical liberalism. That is, uh, Edmund Burke wrote, you know, his great work on the French Revolution and contrasted it with the American Revolution. And the American Revolution was, you know, gradual, incremental, tried to be peaceful, you know, things were done legally through committees and, and, and uh, this long disputations and discussions, whereas the French Revolution decided we're just going to get rid of all the old institutions and start completely over, starting with, you know, a, a new calendar even. And, um, and the problem with that is <clears throat> no one's smart enough to reinvent social technologies. You have to take w what's already been invented that works and discard that which doesn't work. And uh, it, it's, not very, uh, it's not very engaging and, and uh, to, to motivate a, a crowd to get behind you. Uh, to go out, go out there, and let's let's change the political system. You know, as, as I'm fond of saying, it's like, you know, if I say, you know, what do we want? You know, incremental, peaceful change. When do we want it? Eventually. <laughs> you know, no one's going to march behind me down to city hall for that. Uh, what engages people's emotions are, you know, violent uh, uh, revolution. We're going to overthrow. We're going to defund the police. What we're experiencing here. We're going to get rid of the entire government. That almost always fails. Leads to violence. The body counts are highest in those um, in those systems, so we have to avoid that. Okay, thank you. And then there's a uh, final question. I think I know, I know you've got to head off, but uh, Christopher Johnson is asking: Isn't liberty just another element to trade off in a settlement, which might be weighed against other values like survival? I think that's an interesting question because, of course, we're treating liberty like it's some end in itself, um, some uh, some end state that we that we're after, rather than necessarily thinking of it as one thing that may need to be traded off, particularly in an environment that's instantaneously lethal, where maybe survival trumps liberty in, in many more situations than it might do in a settlement on the earth. So, so I wondered, yeah, what do, you, what do you think about that as liberty just being another element to trade off? Or should it be something sacrosanct that's at the core of a community, regardless of whatever, uh, whatever other uh, challenges it faces? Yeah, here I would invoke uh, Thomas Sowell, who's thought a lot about these things, that there are no solutions to social problems. There's just trade-offs. You know, so if you want more liberty, you're going to get less of something else. If you want more rules, you're going to have less freedom and, you know, more controls, less autonomy, you know, these kinds of things. And, and you know, all of politics are, and economics are just trade-offs. You know, in economics, it's the, you know, distribution of goods uh, that, that have, lim you know, limited resources and, you know, too many demands on them. And it's a, all of it is a trade off. So I, I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a big liberty loving guy, but um, yeah, I think I, I'd rather see it as just another uh, part of the goals that we have, along with other things like survival. Here, uh, Charles, I mean, I quoted much from your previous works on this of, you know, it's not like we're going to... Uh, North America from Europe, you know, 500 years ago, and there's air and food and water and you know, uh, food on the hoof and, you know, more fish than you can pull out, uh, than you can possibly eat and so on. You, you know, you're going to essentially the top of Mount Everest and, and worse than that to live. And so obviously I think there's going to have to be more cooperation. I'm not sure about, you know, should there be a centralized entity, a government or a corporation that produces all the air and water and food that we need, or if we, if we should have like, you know, half a dozen or a dozen different uh, entities so that no one gets power, too much power, I, yes. I'd probably err on the side of the ladder. Yeah. Excellent. I'm looking at the time. Um, I just wanted to thank you again for, for coming along. It was excellent to hear from you. And a uh, very fascinating discussion on analogs on earth and how we can use those to think about um, extraterrestrial Liberty. So thank you very much again, Michael, for joining us today. Uh, everyone else will be back at 3.45 for our next speaker. So feel free to take a break, grab a cup of tea, coffee, whatever, and see you at 3.45. Thanks again. Thank you, Michael. All right, Charles. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, we'll see soon. you again after, uh, after pandemic. Maybe we'll see you. Yeah, first. well, hopefully this will end one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it keeps going up and down just when we think it's over. And then it's like, yeah, oh, no, another again. wave. <laughs> yeah, we'll right, see. <laughs> okay. Bye -bye. Cheers, oh, send me the link. Send, send me the link when it's posted and we'll share on social media. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Oh, let me just see. There's a... Okay. Good. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming along to our next talk. Uh, and again, if you, if, this, if you have just turned up, welcome to the webinars on the institutions of extraterrestrial liberty. 
And for our next talk, we're very pleased to have Jim Schwartz. Uh, Jim is a uh, professor of philosophy at uh, Wichita State University, got his PhD from Wayne State University. He has sort of launched in for a while now into a, a strong and very um, uh, sort of robust contribution to space exploration and ethics and a whole diversity of works. He, he's author, for example, of The Value of Science and Space Exploration from OUP. I really recommend reading that. And The Ethics of Space Exploration, another book uh, I, would, I would recommend. So he actively pursues interdisciplinary work that, that sits at the interface of philosophy, ethics of space exploration, space science, and other things that cut across political philosophy, philosophy of science, science, policy and law, and space science, a very wide uh, interest. And he's also been um, a, a regular attendee at some of these previous meetings we've had on extraterrestrial liberty. And today he's going to talk about something that we haven't discussed directly so far today, but it's sort of come up tangentially, which is this uh, idea of, of being stuck in a settlement and, and what you do in being confined to uh, a society on the moon or Mars. So he's going to talk about a right to return to Earth emigration policy for the lunar state. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. All right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Charles. And I just wanted to start by uh, uh, thanking Charles for putting on this event. Um, Tony Milligan in particular for her discussion about the, the content of my talk. But of course, thanks to everyone here for uh, showing up to listen to what I have to say. Um, uh, just to, to give an outline uh, of, of my remarks. So I, I want to kind of motivate, uh, start by motivating my perspective on uh, sort of uh, lunar settlement in particular and what kind of concerns that my views uh, are, are responsive to. And, and I'll say I'm much more of an ethicist here than a political philosopher. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in the moral arguments than than in that everything I say is eminently politically feasible in the status quo. So I'm aware that uh, my work kind of has a, what you might call a utopian flavor to it in some places. Uh, but I wanna try to, you know, uh, uh, lead you through the, the concerns I have about space settlement and why I think then that what we're looking at with what lunar settlement might look like might motivate really uh, a strong desire to have a right to emigrate. Um, and in the way of defending that, I want to take a look at the brain drain objection to unrestricted emigration in the terrestrial case uh, and sort of show how we could apply that to the case of lunar emigration. And I wanna try to explain why I'm not very impressed by that objection. And if we've got time, there's a couple other objections I wanna to respond to. Uh, for those curious, uh, this talk is based on a chapter of a forthcoming volume, uh, uh, The Human Factor in Settlement of the Moon that I think is expected out a little later this year. So uh, something I kind of notice about the current culture surrounding um, enthusiasm behind space settlement, and I'm talking about wider culture, not academic interest in particular. Um, it, something we always kind of know is we're just never ready for any major endeavors simply by the time we have the technology to do so. So, I mean, we probably have the tech to settle the moon right now if we really, really tried to do that. But one thing we don't at all know how to do in that it's, it's so wonderful that uh, conferences like this are taking place and that more research is going to be done because we simply do not know how to build reliable societal institutions in space. And so if we try to settle space right now, we're probably gonna fail. And we're gonna fail painfully and expensively and dramatically. A lot of people are probably gonna die. And especially that's gonna happen if all we have in the process are just can-do attitudes or, or just historically dubious ideas about things like frontierism. So uh, one thing we need to be very clear on going forward is rhetoric is never a substitute for research. We have to do the homework here. It's not enough to talk like we've done the homework. Um, so if we start to do the homework on this, right, if we start to think about more realistically what kind of situations uh, are going to arise on the moon, what's living in that environment going to be like? I think a promising model here uh, is what social scientists talk about when they're talking about chronic technological disaster sites. That's essentially what we're proposing when we're proposing settling the moon, sending humans to a chronic technological disaster site. Um, and then expecting them to you know, thrive and live and reproduce with no help other than what's already there. So if that's the proposal, right? If that's what we think space settlement's gonna be like, uh, just sending people to live in, in disaster zones, maybe we should reconsider if that's a good idea. But if we still want to do that, uh, maybe because it's important to survive as a species and we need to do this long-term, well, 
if we're going to throw people into those situations, we really have a responsibility to see that their basic needs are met. Uh, because there is no guarantee. Um, if you look at research related to community resilience and disaster zones, um, there are situations that bring people together. There are situations that tear people apart. We just don't have a guarantee that if you throw people on the moon, that they're going to cooperate to survive. So I really worry that if our priority is not figuring out how we can thrive as human communities in space, we might not even succeed at surviving. So survival as a goal doesn't sound like a very useful one for succeeding at space settlement to me. And so when we think about, you know, again, life on the moon, we've got to remember that everything that can go wrong on earth can go wrong in space and even more can go wrong in space because on earth you don't generally have to worry about depressurization accidents that kill your entire population so you know there's more risks associated with living in space more things that can go wrong and it only stands to reason then that we should really think seriously about you know lunar societies space societies having obligations to provide more comprehensive rights and entitlements to their citizens compared to terrestrial states. I mean, if their situation is a more deprived one compared to ours, that to me says they need more help as a matter of course, the people living in these conditions. But, you know, this talk is not about a laundry list of rights and entitlements for, for space settlers. I'm happy to talk about that, but that's not the point of this particular talk. Uh, rather, I'm a bit more worried here about what do we do when, not if, when, things go wrong. So what happens when things go wrong on the moon, right? And what if things start to go so wrong that people feel the need to leave? And if the moon is the only space settlement at the time, the only place to leave is back to Earth. Um, so what I want to argue is that not only should lunar states permit emigration, uh, they should support it. They should protect a right to emigrate. And I'm not going to necessarily say that about Mars settlements or any other space settlements. Uh, my, my, my conclusions in this talk are restricted to the case of of lunar settlement. I don't know what I'd yet say about the case of Mars. Um, so let's just talk about the, the right to emigrate in general very briefly. Um, this is not a revolutionary thing. This is already a part of international political norms. So you see a lot of uh, uh, talk about uh, right to freedom of movement, which is going to imply the kinds of freedoms that I, uh, I refer to when I talk about a right to emigrate to, to relieving a state. Um, and so uh, that's already a part of the, the UEHR. Um, but if you're not impressed with precedent, if you want arguments instead, we can point to things uh, like some arguments from the political philosophy literature. So um, one way you could found a, a right to, to emigrate is that freedom of movement is necessary for protecting your other rights and liberties. So if you're in a place where your needs are not being met uh, and the only way to get your needs met is to go somewhere else, denial of freedom of movement prevents you from protecting your interests. Um, because uh, institutions might have to worry about leaving, people leaving, citizens leaving, um, that provides some kind of pressure on institutions and states to reform to improve the conditions for their citizens. And of course, if you think government ought to be uh, by consent of the governed and you have a society for which no people are ever permitted to leave, you know, you might worry about how reliable you're securing consent of the governed in that situation. So those are the you know the basic kinds of arguments you could make uh, in general for why you might want to have a right to emigrate protected as a matter of course. But you know is, is the lunar case uh, importantly different from that? Well, I think that on the face of it, that the conditions of life in a lunar settlement are probably going to give rise to a lot of desires to emigrate. Um, because there's not going to be a lot of people involved, probably, and so there's not going to be a lot of choice about what job do I do, what do I learn. Um, so there's going to be a lot of restrictions on, say, vocational and educational autonomy uh, that could cause all kinds of distress. Um, you've got to worry about, you know, maintaining minimum viable populations and not exceeding maximum population thresholds. Uh, the problem there on the moon isn't as bad because you're close to Earth and you can have personnel exchange uh, decently easily. Uh, but still, I mean, we can run into situations in which uh, people's bodies begin to get commodified for the basis of population pressures. That is not a situation anyone should think of creating. Um, in general, we're probably talking about really cramped, confined living conditions, so we don't have a lot of privacy available. That's going to have a deep psychological impact on a lot of people. And just think about the stress of existing 
uh, in a world where you've got second to second threat of total societal collapse, as bad as COVID has been, we haven't experienced that yet. Uh, so we need to think very seriously about preparing for and supporting the people that would be living in those worlds permanently. Um, and along with that, there's all kinds of ableism and other forms of discrimination that are going to arise in these situations. Um, if we don't do work to try to mitigate those things, life is going to get more and more and more awful and people are going to want to leave more and more and more. They're not going to want to stay to help build things. Um, now, there's two kind of obvious uh, things you could try to do to prevent these problems from arising in the first place, because prevention is generally better than, than treatment, right? Um, and so one thing to do is just to kind of set a really high minimum standard for starting a space settlement. Make sure that you don't even go unless you can provide a decent standard of living for the people that are up there. Um, and if you can't even do that, at least make sure people have the ability to, to, to get the heck out and come back to earth if things are pretty crummy. And those are not incompatible things. We can do both of them. We can set both of them as goals if we choose to. The fact that we don't have them as goals is just evidence we've chosen not to care about these things. And maybe it's time we should care more. Um, now, that's got a positive case I want to present for why we should have uh, a right to emigrate in lunar states, uh, but I'm 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 sure you're, you're thinking of lots of reasons why this might not work, uh, and I want to uh, spend a little time talking about uh, the brain drain objection to emigration, and this is in particular an objection to unrestricted rights to emigrate, uh, and it arises for the most part in the context of uh, lesser developed states that are experiencing sort of uh, critical shortages in healthcare and other skilled workers. Uh, and those workers sometimes emigrate to more developed states. Europe and, and America uh, are pretty common destinations where they can get higher wages, uh, but now you know, the places they leave uh, have fewer medical workers and the governments no longer have tax revenues. And, and, and so this can exacerbate already bad conditions for people living in, in states that don't have uh, very good healthcare systems. And so um, you know, if you just allow people that wanna leave to leave, that's gonna make you know, the, the the, the least advantaged members of society even more worse off. Uh, and so we don't wanna you know, contribute to situations like that. So that's, our, that's the kind of the thrust of this brain drain objection. And if we needed to apply it to the case of lunar emigration, it sounds like we could do that pretty easily because if we're thinking about a lunar settlement, its existence is fairly fragile in all likelihood. And so, you know, even one or two people that need to leave, that, that labor shortage could put the, the settlement in some sort of dire conditions. So, you know, maybe all workers are essential service workers on the moon and emigration would just be this constant threat to the existence of the lunar state and threat to protecting the rights of its citizens. So I'm not that impressed by, by this uh, objection to emigration as I'll try to elaborate. Um, so uh, the premise that I'll take, uh, and, and I share this with uh, Gillian Brock, who is someone who does think that immigration restrictions are sometimes permissible, uh, is that if those restrictions are permissible, that's only when they're pursued by states, by governments that are exercising their power legitimately. Uh, and these are going to be states that do things like sufficiently protect, uh, uh, sufficiently respect human rights, especially core civil and political ones that exercise their power in ways that, that help meet the needs of citizens. So that's a premise I'll use that you can only legitimately enforce immigration restrictions uh, if you're a legitimate state. And the next premise is, well, either the lunar state is gonna be like that or it's not. It's either gonna be legitimate in that way uh, or it's not going to be. And what follows either way? Well, here's the first conclusion I wanna draw on the horn of the dilemma if uh, we think that the lunar state is founded in a way where it doesn't exercise its power legitimately. Well, if it's not a legitimate state, it can't legitimately enforce emigration restrictions. Uh, okay, that's not a difficult conclusion to draw. Uh, and I think as a corollary there, we should acknowledge that it would just be monstrously negligent of us if we founded purposefully a leg an illegitimate state on the moon. What we should do instead is wait until we've learned how to do better. And that will not take impossibly long as the critics of waiting a little bit to learn often accuse. Um, but what if it's the other horn of the dilemma? What if we're talking about a lunar state that kind of passes whatever hazy criteria for legitimacy we want to, to, to put in place? 
well, I don't see how you can have a, a legitimate lunar state that doesn't have a pretty decent population size, that doesn't have things like labor surpluses, especially in essential services. So not only would that be a state where people are not as interested to leave, to emigrate, it would also be a state where the, the harm uh, uh, that's caused by emigration would be mitigated if not eliminated entirely. And so, you know, if you're worried about, you know, future desires to emigrate, the solution there is just to make sure you're building your society in a way that makes people want to stay there, not want to flee there. So again, people want to stay in places where they have support and they can feel valuable and feel like they're helping to build something. If you don't offer them that, they're going to go elsewhere. Um, and I think something that's really important to keep in mind is that when we talk about creating societies in space, we're not talking about these distant foreign cultures that already exist, that already have customs and traditions and ties to, to home territory that we have deep obligations to respect. That's not at all what we're, we're talking about here. We're talking about creating new societies new societies in which new lives and hopes and dreams, people who are gonna experience pain and suffering and toil will appear. I don't think any of us have any business creating novel conditions of extreme hardship, throwing people over there and then tossing the keys away. Um, that's just a monstrously unethical thing to do. We need to think very deeply about supporting space settlement, not just instigating space settlement. Uh, now. I wanna be very clear, I'm not arguing against space settlement. In my book, I even say, I think it's obligatory over the long term. Um, and I'm not even arguing for some, you know, infinitely long or unendurably long moratorium either. Uh, I think in the course of, you know, maybe two to three decades, if we support the right kinds of research, we could figure out a lot of the things that we don't yet know. Um, instead, all I'm doing is arguing that we should wait on space settlement until we have a good plan for when things go wrong. I don't even think we have a plan yet and they'll figure it out when they get up there is the opposite of a plan. So if we really care about space settlement, right? If we wanna see it succeed, if we wanna make sure it works and actually helps us survive long-term as a species, then really the best expression of that care is gonna to be to make sure that we support all of the forms of research that we know are gonna be necessary to build a, a happy human society in space. And in that regard, every single discipline has something vital and important to offer. It's not just STEM, it's the humanities and social sciences. We have all of these disciplines already because society has basically decided we need people thinking about all these different kinds of things. Well, if you're gonna have a society in space, you're gonna to need to have people thinking about all the different things that are happening in that space society. Right, so everyone needs to contribute or it's not gonna work. Um, because how many times can we fail? How many times can we afford to do this wrong? Can we afford to do it wrong even once? I uh, don't have time for those two. I can come back in Q&A if we want. Um, so, uh, but I do wanna kind of end on this thought that again, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm pushing for pie in the sky stuff in a lot of people's eyes and uh, I know that there's sort of pragmatic uh, concerns about the proposals I've made, and I do have uh, responses to those. But one thing I just wanna uh, keep in mind is if we don't set goals, uh, if we don't uh, imagine and actively seek to find ways to, to make things better, we're just gonna keep reproducing what we've already got. So I, I always love so much when I read Joseph Cairns, one of my favorite uh, political philosophers, uh, and when he says things like this, that, you know, even if we must take deeply rooted social arrangements as givens for purposes of immediate action in a particular context. So even if we have to deal with bad aspects of the status quo, we should never forget about our assessment of their fundamental character. Otherwise, we wind up legitimizing what should only be endured. Let's think about what life in space should be like, and let's try not to get too tunnel visioned on um, what we think is possible given the narrow options available to us right this second, because things can change uh, over time and we shouldn't think that our current frameworks are fixed forever. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jim. That was excellent and really interesting. And yes, there's your book on the last page, which you should show. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Um, so. If you've got any questions, like before, please do just type them into the question and answer box and uh, we can, I'll read those out. In the meantime, um, a question here from Sherry Wells Jensen, who's saying, you know, if a settlement is very crowded and dangerous and isolated, 
um, which, which she thinks it's likely to be. And I can see that would be the case if you couldn't expand fast enough and you had a, a population that was developing quite rapidly, let's say some industrial capability um, on, on some planetary body. What can we collectively do to provide structural incentives to stay? So I guess that's a question more about you know the, the actual physical architecture. How do you get people to want to stay in these very, very extreme environments? Well, um, I, I think things that will help them stay, they, they can't be in doubt about where their next meal comes from. Uh, they, they can't be in doubt about whether they can breathe safely for the next, you know, however long they know they're going to be there. Um, you know, just very basic uh, support needs. Uh, if you meet them, if people don't feel like they have to struggle just to exist, um, you know, they're much more willing to join up with other causes and help build things that lead to broader societal improvement. So, um, you know, I, I think the problem is when you start with nothing and, and when you try to make people uh, exist on nothing and all of their energy has to be spent merely just to ensure for the next 24 hours, I've got the resources I need to exist. And so, um, it, that can sound like I'm placing a, a huge obligation on, on like the lunar state or settlement itself, right? Um, and, and I think, and this came, this is one of the objections that um, uh, I, I had sort of prepped for. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll have this here so I can reflect on it while I'm speaking. Um, so, you know, who shares the burden in, in building the institutions uh, that are the ones that, that create the society that, that people want to remain? And, you know, I don't have the answers there by any means. You know, I think we can figure it out if we really try hard to do so. Um, but, you know, I see this as an obligation. And I know I've kind of changed the question into something else. So if Sherry wants to, to tell me I need to answer the question she actually asked, that's fine. Um, uh, but, you know, why don't we see this as just a basic requirement on the people that want to go start these settlements? Why don't we say this is just the minimum cost, this is the minimum standard you need to meet in order to do this? Um, you know, why is it that treating people decently is seen as so negotiable in, in these situations? Uh, so I think if, if we create a world in space where people are treated decently, people are going to want to find their way to that world. If we create a world in space that looks like the expanse, people are going to want to stay on Earth. Mm. And just continuing that discussion of the actual infrastructure, what would you do to ensure the right to leave? And would that just be a question of trying to create um, launch facilities and rockets that were sufficiently reliable and a sufficient number of them to allow people to leave on a regular basis? Or would you, uh, I don't know, instantiate some rule where there's a certain number of rocket launches from the settlement back to Earth over a given period of time? How do you think this would work physically? Good. Well, well I, I think it's got to start with, with sociology. I mean, I think, think we can get a roadmap for how serious the problem might be if we invest in the right research. And so, you know, we, we can study populations under duress and we can look at rates of emigration in different populations and we can try to build some model for what percentage of people we think might, you know, um, uh, end up in this place if this was just a, a terrestrial state. And then we can try to figure out, okay, how does the lunar context change that? Uh, and so I think we've got to start by trying to figure out, you know, how many people might want to leave. Uh, and, and you can start to build that in. You can start to think about, well, I just need that many lifeboats on my whatever. And so, um, but I don't think it's ultimately that expensive on top of what you've already got to do. It's way easier to get back to earth from the moon. Almost everything you need uh, to, to build and supply that trip is available on the moon. Uh, so the moon is not exactly resource poor for getting back to earth uh, if you need to. Um, and if you have this active earth moon transit system, you know, the, the births for people to come back to earth are already there. It's not a, a massive addition to the infrastructure, but you might even consider that, you know, everyone has an escape pod as a really great safety measure in the first place. Uh, because you've got all these additional oxygen, oxygen production machines everywhere where people need to access them. So they're great little escape rooms in the case of an emergency that doesn't require evacuation. Uh, so, I mean, it wouldn't be impossible or even unaffordable ultimately uh, to, to build some of these systems in as part of redundancies to, to other safety systems. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, yeah, we need to work out what it would cost, but we also don't need to do that under the presumption that it would cost infinite dollars and can't ever be considered, which is what I worry anytime anyone talks about, you know, doing something more than the minimum, you know, that's always the same response. And I worry it's just a, a way of uh, avoiding talking about the issue sometimes. But. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Keith Abney asks, on Earth, the right to emigrate is largely a negative right, but in space it would have to be a positive right with much more onerous obligations on others. Uh, would that be a reason to limit that right? Um, it, it really depends. Um, and I'd, I'd want to go back to that, that question about the legitimacy of the state. And, and so, you know, if the place that you want to leave from is a pretty nice place to be, um, and nevertheless, the, the sort of resources of the state are, are, are too limited to support very much in the way of, uh, of emigration, um, you know, I, I, I can see um, tension arising in cases like that. And I don't have a great judgment about what should happen there. Because I think it's going to be so contextual uh, that it's hard to predict in advance. Um, I've lost the question at the moment, but um, yeah. So if you could repeat the question, I could yeah, maybe sure. say, uh, say a little more. So, Sorry. so Keith was saying on, on Earth that right to immigrate is a negative right in space. It will yeah. be a positive one uh, with potentially more onerous obligations. Would that actually be a reason to limit that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, like uh, a little more on Gillian Brock's arguments for uh, sometimes having emigration restrictions. She'll outline a few more conditions about uh, what it means for the state to be exercising its power legitimacy. She'll also talk about how the restrictions are always going to be limited to the essential service workers in times when there is a critical shortage or at least when uh, there's going to be pretty uh, direct harmful consequences for the healthcare systems that they're emigrating away from. Uh, and so um, you could have a view like that here. I don't know if that's the view I'd want to adopt or, or something different, but I mean, you'd have to look at, you know, what kind of worker is it that wants to leave if they're a, a worker at all, or maybe uh, someone who's not working. Um, and, you know, is there going to be genuine uh, harm done to others through the sort of uh, omission of their contribution to, to the state? Um, you know, those are factors that at least on uh, the Brock kind of view would be legitimate ones to curtail uh, emigration. Um, my position, if I had to, to, to say one right now, would be um, the burden of proof should always be on the state to, 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 to defend a restriction, and it should never be on the, uh, the, em the, the potential emigree to, to justify their, their desire to leave. Um, I'd like to see the burden of proof uh, put in that way. Yeah. There's a question here from Billy Kapoor, which I think is an interesting one. Just wondering what you think. He says, uh, how many people and what sort of volume is a minimum responsible long-term sortie? I think that's an interesting question because, of course, you can define scientifically what materials you need to make a settlement successful in a certain amount of oxygen, food and water for X number of people. But the point you raised earlier about should we do this um, until we reach a point where we can create a society that's reasonably pleasant for people where they want to stay. Uh, and then the question of, you know, uh, when does it become re responsible, you know, when does it become irresponsible to send a certain number of people where they can't live a reasonably good life? So I think that's an interesting question on, you know, how do you define the number of people and the volume from the point of view of that sort of moral ethical dimension of, of is that a responsible settlement with respect to no. the conditions you're creating for people? And how do you discern where that separation between an irresponsible act of setting up a bad settlement and a sufficiently good settlement lies? Well, and this is where I think, you know, we really need a lot more uh, sociologists to, to come and, and, and work on these things because, uh, you know, when you talk about these kind of human population dynamics and, and uh, you know, different community sizes and what, what leads to cohesion and especially uh, certain kinds of demographic things. So uh, folks familiar with some of my other work about sort of space settlement ethics know that, that I worry about things like reproductive autonomy and having relevant opportunities for, for romantic companionship given the diverse ways in which people uh, identify in terms of gender and sexual orientation and all those things. And, um, you know, imagine being, um, the only gay kid on the moon or something, right? Uh, and, and just imagine how, how isolating and, and, and lonely and terrible that would be for the person. And um, we can figure out, you know, what kind of population size is going to give a good chance where everyone at least has a few people that are, are like them, uh, because that's so vital to, to having, you know, uh, supporting communities and interpersonal relationships. And uh, it, it, again, it, it's crazy that that, 
that was never even on the negotiating table uh, for so long. Um, but if we really want to do this well, in my view, um, we need to create societies, not just places for people to live. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I'm not the one that, that, that says what that population size is because I don't have the relevant expertise to do the, you know, the, the psychological and, and sociological research. But that's the place we need to really look, I think, um, for how to do this. It's not just political philosophy. It's political philosophy and uh, sociology and et cetera. Uh, anthropology has a lot to offer here, too. Cameron Smith's been doing some interesting stuff about um, uh, sort of uh, different cultures and adaptations uh, to space environments. So, hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose a parallel question to that is that you've got, well, actually, there's two questions here that are interesting. Um, first of all, how do you imagine the relationship between the colony, let's say the lunar settlement, and the nation that can be emigrated to? So I suppose there has to be some agreement on Earth. That they're going to take the emigrants from your settlement who want to come back. And then perhaps if I can just throw in another question here, because it's related that someone's asked, which is, of course, the question of once you've adapted to the lunar environment, the 1.6 G environment, um, you know, over the long term, actually, we don't really know what those long term effects are of, of living on the moon for many years. But maybe if it turns out to be physically difficult to adapt, the countries may not want to be taking uh, immigrants from the moon who want to come back to the earth, which sort of ties into this question of, of how do you build a satisfactory relationship between a lunar settlement and the state on earth such that this desire to emigrate can be made real? Uh, yeah, on the physical adaptation point, if that's the case, then that's an even uh, better reason why you don't do this hastily or, or shoddily, that you make sure you do it right the first time you do it, because if people cannot leave because of sort of physiological reasons, uh, then they're hostages to whatever conditions that, that you visit upon them. So, so to me, uh, the possibility that uh, you couldn't return to Earth um, is an even better reason why we need to do a good job of, of creating good societies in space. Um, uh, I would hope uh, no state on Earth would be so awful and ableist as to not take in uh, a refugee from the moon, uh, even if they needed a bit of uh, support. Um, and also, I think it should just be a deal that uh, states make with people that leave that said, hey, if it, it's too bad, if you can come back here, right? Um, I, I don't think uh, a nation should be in the business of denying a, a, a person that goes into space uh, the ability to, to have uh, terrestrial citizenship, again, if they desire it. So, you know, I, you know, I, there's stuff to work out there, but I don't see those as real insuperable difficulties to having a, a healthy emigration system if we've got a lunar state. And I suppose the answer would be similar, but another question here is, should you have the right to emigrate to an alternate lunar settlement? Or what about leaving Mars and going to the moon, uh, whatever yeah, your yeah. preferences are? I suppose much of what you've said would apply to the, those situations. I guess what you're saying is oh, it, the idea you should just have the right to emigrate wherever that is. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's in near term, the only place you might be able to emigrate to is, uh, or immigrate to is Earth. Um, but, you know, if you've got other settlements, um, uh, then, you know, maybe some places meet the needs of their citizens better than others. And, um, and so you've got movement to a place on the moon where your needs can be met. Um, and I see there's something in the chat about, you know, what if you're born on the moon and, you know, it's not just readaptation to Earth, it's adaptation period. And yes, yeah, sa same issue there. It's, um, you know, make sure the place is one where everyone can be happy in, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And you won't have these problems. Uh, or at least if you have them, they'll occur so less frequently. Um, and I just think yeah, it's something important to keep, keep in mind. If, if we support people in these ways, we, we avoid a lot of the problems that we worry about, right? Do, do you think they, were, they could end up being an enormous incentive to disallow emigration? So the thought that's running through my mind is you've got these settlements across the solar system. They're all pretty extreme. And even if you're a miner or a scientist and you like being there, it's not great. Um, you're in confined environments. You're in potentially lethal, instantaneously lethal environments. And then after you've been there for a while, particularly if you have people born there, you've got this vision of the earth with these beautiful lakes and forests and blue skies. And it might be very tempting for a lot of people to want to leave, particularly if they've never seen the earth or never been to the earth. If they're a child, they may have a very utopian view of what the earth is about, having seen images of wildlife and the biosphere on the planet. Could there not end up being an extremely strong uh, incentive to disallow immigration and one that is also 
tacitly agreed upon by different settlements. So the lunar settlements and the Martian settlements may be speaking to each other saying, you know, we've really got to, we've really got to discourage people from wanting to leave. Otherwise, we're going to have mass emigration back to the Earth. So you end up with a, with a sort of Machiavellian um, cabal of settlements doing their utmost to spread information to minimise the chances that anyone wants to leave and go back to the Earth. Is that a concern? And would that need a, some sort of completely unusual uh, legal structure to stop that from happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the the significance of the potential concern. Do I do I have any idea uh, what the what what a, a remediation strategy for that would be? Uh, not at the moment, by any means. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know what to say about that issue um, because yeah, uh, if if the state really fears that people will leave um, because it maybe knows that it's not treating its people very well and it's you know creating desires to leave, and moreover, there's that other place uh, that has all the the lakes. Um, well, at, at some point, I want to ask if if life on Earth is so preferable to, to that life to so many people, does that state have a right to exist? Um, right. I mean, at what point do you say you're trying so hard to do something that people actually aren't aren't fit to do? And again, we need to figure out what's a better way to do this entirely. Um, you know, I, I want to keep that open as the right thing to say about that situation. I'm not sure if it's the right thing to say about that situation, but it, it well could be if I thought about it long enough. No, I think that's a, a really fascinating question. It is the elephant in the room and that we all assume that space exploration is something that's going to happen um, because we're all enthusiastic about it. But in fact, these environments may be so extreme. It's not impossible that in, you know, 200, 300 years time, we just come to a conclusion that human space exploration it's just not a very pleasant thing to do. We do it with robots, but basically we stay on this small planet despite the risk of extinction. We might still decide that space is, is not a pleasant place to go and there may just be well, a few scattered people. Yeah, that, that even space. reminds me, uh, I'm going to have to spoil, uh, I guess, season four of The Expanse, but uh, you know, when, when the sort of uh, Mars is kind of collapsing societally and you know, people are fleeing out uh, into the through the ring gate and everything, and um, you know, it's there are a lot of people there that don't want to leave, that, that still want Mars to, to be that sort of dream that that society got founded in. And it's, it, that's, that becomes a tragic situation at that point. That becomes a situation in which there's no way to make a decision for which you're not causing a lot of people a lot of harm unnecessarily. And, you know, I, I want to think a lot more about how can we avoid creating those tragic situations. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of work we can do before we get started on actually, you know, building something out there uh, that will minimize the chances we run into these situations. Um, yes. Um, and, but we shouldn't you know, uh, immediately take off the table the, the tools that would be needed to protect people when things start to start to get bad if they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very interesting. I'm just seeing whether there's any other, there's just one question here is, can we apply the sustainable development goals of the United Nations to lunar society then. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what that's referring to. I guess- uh, I, I mean, hmm. I would agree in general that we need to be mindful of issues related to sustainability. I just would wanna say there's a lot of models of it and hmm. um, you know which one we apply to the space context, I think should, should keep a lot of the space context in mind. Um, and sustainability of what, right? Um, so uh, I care a lot about space science as well. And there are human spaceflight activities that really run counter to some of the science activities and right, you know, search for uh, evidence of, of, of extraterrestrial life in the solar system, right? And so uh, when we talk about sustaining things, um, maybe we should also talk about sustaining the ability to uh, acquire new knowledge and understanding from scientifically studying the solar system. And that could run, in, run up against um, sustaining human populations. Uh, uh, Alana Kralikowski, uh, uh, Martin Elvis, and, and Tony Milligan have written some great papers about how, you know, it's open what your objectives are and thus what sustainability would mean, depending on whether you're there to live, you're there for money, you're there for science, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I think um, we should wrap up here soon, but it, your talk also got me thinking about the right to leave Earth. I mean, uh, you sit <laughs> on this planet and there's potential for nuclear terrorism, there's uh, hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, these things are not found on the moon. 
Uh, maybe for some people, extraterrestrial environments represent something better than the Earth from these perspectives, particularly if they've been exposed to these things. I mean, not nuclear terrorism. None of us, thankfully, so far have been exposed to that. But tsunamis and um, hurricanes are things that people experience. So if you're going to implement um, uh, regulations, maybe even laws on the moon or Mars for the, for the right to emigrate, uh, would you then create similar laws on the earth in parallel? And would people not feel a sense of injustice that these laws mm -hmm. exist in the solar system and they have no right to leave the earth? So, so how, how would these new regulations elsewhere affect your view of how the right to emigrate um, might change on the earth with respect to extraterrestrial locations? Oh, that, that's a fun question. Um, wow. Yeah. I need to, <laughs> uh, that's fun. Um, I mean, yeah, you want to be fair and you, you want rules that everyone can, can, can follow and you don't have special rules for, for special groups or something, right? Um, to me, that's going to turn out to be a question of, you know, how qualitatively different is life in space compared to life on Earth? I don't think there's any shame in saying um, that life on Earth gives you a lot of privileges that are absent in life in space and thus... You know, you just have so much already being on Earth, you shouldn't complain that they get slightly easier rules on the moon or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so th there's that kind of response that I'm somewhat tempted by. I'm also tempted by the response that says, well, look, if people want to leave Earth, um, if things are really bad for them there and there are better places to go in space, I really doubt that that's ever going to be the case. Uh, I mean, you know, even after global warming uh, ravages this planet, it's still a lot better for us to, it's going to protect us a lot better than anywhere else in the solar system. We're still going to have water and oxygen and things like that, you know. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really unclear to me um, when you work out what that choice would be, that it would end up being one that would actually satisfy the goals of, of people, uh, yeah. except if the goal is merely to escape. Yeah. Um, and then the question is, well, in order to escape, odds are you've got to use more than your own resources to do so. Um, uh, and so, you know, you, you're taking from society in order to do that um, in most cases. And so, I, 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 you know, I don't think uh, society maybe has some say in is that is that a good way to use common resources? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the perfect liberty for the Earth citizen to leave earth with all of the resources, energy, cost of that, um, if they're not putting it completely and not taking away from others that need more. Yeah, I, I'm willing to say that's slightly different than the, the really desperate person on the moon that just needs to get out. Otherwise, they'll, I don't know, um, end their life. Uh, maybe those are the same kinds of cases. Maybe they're different. Again, I just need to, I haven't thought about it enough. Sure. Good. We should probably end there, actually, because we're two minutes before the next talk. But that's fine. That's why we've got this buffer. So thank you very much, um, Jim. That was excellent. Very thought provoking, uh, very important subject, you know, emigration and how that's organized in extraterrestrial settlements. So thank you again for joining us. It's excellent. OK, um, thank you, everyone, for, for staying around. And for anyone who may have just turned up, welcome to the Institutions of Extraterrestrial Liberty. So our next speaker is Zarina Agnew. She has a very interesting background. Um, she's trained as a, a neuroscientist and has published numerous papers on, on neuroscience, neurobiology. And she's really interested in asking questions about you know, why things are the way they are. Uh, do they have to be like that? And how do they work? And can we shift them to make them better? Uh, whether this is the brains of healthy people, neurobiology of healthy people, or damaged brains of, of patients that she's worked with, whether it's communities, governance, legal system, or other social dynamics. And this has taken her off into all sorts of interesting directions to deal with communities and spaces. And we've had some interaction about working with people in prisons and just out of prisons and thinking about education in those environments. And she's also uh, taken this interest and applied it to thinking about uh, space environments. So in addition to that, she has a keen interest in taking these things out uh, to the general public and dealing with public engagement. So today she's going to talk about, uh, are we ready for these new liberties beyond the earth, stewarding autonomy through place-based place experiments? 
Over to you, Agni. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Please do nudge me if I'm going over time, because I'm not quite sure how long it's going to be. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to our talk, Are We Ready for New Liberties? Stewarding Autonomy Through Place-Based Experiments. My name is Serena Agni. I'm the Director of District Commons, a nonprofit dedicated to the creation of experimental spaces in autonomous commons. As Charles said, I spent most of my academic career as a neuroscientist before moving into behavioral and social sciences. And I now study human collectivity, not just as it is, but how it could be in altered social logics. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about the Second Life Project, uh, which builds towards collective freedom centered on the wisdom, goals, and vision of citizens who've been directly impacted by incarceration. This community involves uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, survivors of trauma and violence, academics, folks with mental illness and disabilities, entrepreneurs, a really diverse bunch of people. And the humans of Second Life are committed to alternative forms of justice and building collective freedoms for everybody through the power of self-governance. Here we posit that questions of extraterrestrial governance will never be sufficient to achieve utopian societies without also addressing how to prepare humans raised in current social modes for lives of liberty that are not centered around libertarian individualisms, but instead focus on collective and mutually assured autonomies. In addressing the types of institutions that might be created in space to maximize liberty, we ask the related questions. Are we ready for liberty? And if not, how can we prepare? As a case study for this type of experimentation, we have been working on two prototype spaces that have explored the collective freedoms for perhaps some of the most liberty restricted and disenfranchised, the formerly incarcerated. Our community have all served indefinite life sentences and have collectively served many centuries incarcerated and have not only been raised in the absence of access to effective government institutions, but have also arguably internalized their constraints. In their book, The Social Order of the Underworld, How Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System, Scarbeck reports, in the early 20th century, California prisons followed a norm system called the convict code, don't snitch and some other things. By the end of the century, self-governance via the code had collapsed and the system reorganized around race gangs. Some institutional economists approach prisons as laboratories for emergent self-governance because it is a tough environment for stable governance to emerge in, but it emerges anyway, and that's important. Here we describe an exploration of new forms of autonomy in a network of experimental spaces in the Bay Area. In building, prefiguring, and prototyping these types of communities, we have learned a great deal about what we call mutually assured stewarded autonomy. <clears throat> So what is to be learned from the issue of re-entry? US prison rates are higher than anywhere else in the world. One in nine prisoners are serving a life sentence and California has the highest percentage of prisoners serving life. These humans often enter the system as children and frequently serve in excess of 20 years. On their return, housing, home and community, fundamental parts of survival are lacking. This renders much of their existence to bare survival. Under these conditions, it is very hard to be free and begs the question, to what are they returning? In an essay about surviving incarceration, Stephen Powers reflects, it's funny to appreciate a city from a jail bus because it's that very city that's sending you away. And I mean, all of it is sending you away from the disciplinarians that fancy, them, fancy themselves educators to the bullshit jobs that treat you like a crook from the first day to the police who menace you everywhere you go. The city taught me the survival mechanisms it would ultimately punish me for. And there's no other way to understand it. These spaces were built with this precise problem in mind. And, we, um, and we, we ask, can we ensure that those returning to society are not in fact returning to the same social structures that let them down in the first place, but are actually leapfrogging into the autonomous and participatory commons? Can entering into these new or perhaps old social logics not only help people recover from a chronic absence of freedom, but actually develop and prototype new forms of collective autonomy? Why the commons? In their essay, Commoning as a Transformative Social Paradigm, David Bollier writes, in facing up to the many profound crises of our time, we face a conundrum that has no easy resolution. How are we to imagine and build a radically different system while living within the constraints of an incumbent system that aggressively resists transformational change? Our challenge is not just articulating attractive alternatives, but identifying credible strategies for actualizing them. This is precisely what these experimental spaces are attempting to do. 
This brings us then to these experimental spaces, which we consider as sites of what Howard Ehrlich refers to as a transfer culture. The home as a major site of human social reproduction is also a point of leverage for altering of biopolitical production. Biopolitical production is derived from Foucault's notion of biopower as the extension of state power over both the physical and political bodies of a population, extended as biopolitics to the complete control of individual life by society as well as the government. And it refers to quantitatively to social reactions and qualitatively to consciousness and intimacy. Transfer cultures then are an attempt at future worlds right here amongst the status quo in the old world. These are experiments in the future made in the present. Specifically, transfer cultures are the manifestation of the ideas, processes, behaviors, skills, and activities that are needed to help humans transition from the current social formation to the incoming one. One of the things that one of our residents said to me early on was, Zarina, I have been a caged animal all my life. You can't just open the door and let me walk out into the jungle. I will be eaten alive. And so as we started to build these spaces, we started to really realize what, what it means to start stewarding people's autonomy. These spaces afford us the option to prototype alternative ways of being, as well as ways of becoming other as subjects and of being governed otherwise. It is our proposal that sovereignty, whether individual or collective, cannot flourish without kinship. These are spaces where people heal from a life of suffering in a manner and in a time frame that suits them, distinct from mandated programs. This is a central component in their recovery from a long-standing abusive relationship with a punitive state and marks a very different, and for many returning citizens, a first attempt at collective freedom and mutually assured autonomy. It is our hypothesis that most people, not just the formerly incarcerated, may need similar embodied experiences to get to collective freedom and to prepare themselves for new liberties. Here we get to talk about some of the principles that have guided our learnings. <clears throat> The first is a shift from modern day individualism to mutually assured autonomy, or what Judith Butler calls social freedom. Butler writes, I'm most glad to have my personal liberty, but I only have it to the extent that there is a sphere of freedom in which I can operate. That sphere is co-produced by people who live together or have agreed to live in a world in which the relations between them make possible their individual sense of being free. So perhaps we might regard personal liberty as a cipher of social freedom. And social freedom cannot be understood apart from what arises between people, what happens when they make something in common, or when in fact they seek to make or remake the world in common. The world is given to me because you are also there as one to whom it is given. The world is never given to me alone, but always in your company. Without you, the world does not give itself. Indeed, we are worldless without one another. The second principle that has really inspired our work is that of anti-individualistic individuality. In their essay on this topic, TMNG describes a form of anti-individualistic individuality that, artic that articulates well our process. This goes beyond the prioritization of either the individual unit at the expense of society, nor prioritizes collective society at the expense of the individual. It was after all Marx that said, we have to especially avoid the juxtaposed the ju juxtaposed the society against the abstraction to the individual. The collective, the community and the society, they write, consists of our individual individualities and the uniqueness that that brings. Some of the principles that Tim and G writes about that have really inspired our work include taking individual responsibility for the collective and not, for example, retreating with our private rights into private chambers, but ensuring that we actively contribute to our collective survival. They say a rigid social order may be happy with passive individuals, but a vital group needs active ones. We also lean into self-respect. Team and G says only those who are able to see themselves as real actors in the social field and not as remote controlled clones of a frightening societal machine will be able to reach a secure and positive self-understanding. For us, this means self-governance, self-determination and taking deep responsibility for the collective as Wilson et al noted in 2003 on talking about the commons, when citizens have a sense of ownership, monitoring and graduated sanctions take place spontaneously. 
We also lean into honesty, another principle that TMNG refers to. And this is about being honest to yourself about not just what you are, but who you are. And this is a really key part of our emotional ecology in these spaces. Uh, we also lean into valuing creativity in daily life, daily decisions and collective action over conformity to the group. So we really encourage each other to explore hard sentiments and work through difficult thoughts together. They say, the sovereign human knows that it is not the whole, but that it lives as part of the whole and knows how to relate it. These spaces then are places that help us become sovereign, self-valorized and self-determined. The third principle that we really lean into is the distinction between constituent power, portenza, and constitutive power, portere. Constituent power being the power of the multitude that aims at the realization of its potential, which is always already there as a space within capitalist structures and relations and through which these are altered. This is in contrast to constituted power, which is the power of the authorities that appears when formal constitutions are formulated, which comes from above and is imposed upon the multitude. So that is the theory. How is this done in practice? Our aim has been to set up a release experience that ensures that these, this group of individuals return to unincarcerated life, but are not merely cast back into the punitive and extractive society that set them down their initial trajectories, but instead to an entirely distinct social system, transformative, mutually supportive, post-scarcity social environments built around a commons-based material and emotional economy. Within these commons and as commoners, they form the tools, subjectivities and means for both autonomy, that is knowing what you want, and agency, the means to act upon those wants, as well as the critical inspection of desires whether, and whether what we want serves us or not. In practice, one of the first things we do is to try and work on creating the conditions for freedom, that is recovering from scarcity and getting to an effective abundance. As we are starting to understand in science the cognitive abilities that underpin behavioral freedom, we're starting to realize that like many evolved cognitive capacities, they are a matter of degree. Take for example, the ability to delay gratification. In humans, the classic, classic marshmallow test tells us that even young homo sapiens are able to delay gratification. In the marshmallow test for self-control, a marshmallow was placed in front of you and if you manage to not eat it for 15 minutes, you get a second one and are allowed to eat both. For a long time, it was thought that this was a measure of uh, self-control. However, recent investigations into this work suggest this is actually driven by affluence and not self-restraint. It seems then for humans to be maximally able to enact their own free will, abundance of resources is a key foundation. Anarchy does not simply mean no laws, it means no need for laws. Anarchy requires individuals to behave responsibly, when individuals can live in peace without authorities to compel or punish them, when people have enough courage and sense to speak honestly and equally with each other, then and only then will anarchy be possible. This is evident in many of our conflict resolution processes. A second uh, factor that we lean into is the idea of freedom as an evolving process an evolving developmental process that consists of both personal tools and social skills, as well as environmental factors. Stephen Cave at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge has proposed the concept of the freedom quotient. Like IQ, the FQ should tell us how free we are and how we can become even more so. Higher FQ should detect greater ability to, first of all, generate viable options for oneself. If you don't have options, you can't uh, engage in, uh, in free, free act. Um, second, to meaningfully be able to choose between those options, not just pick at random. And lastly, to pursue more, one or more of those options, that is agency. Thus, in our community, we explicitly attempt to cultivate and build the conditions for each of these. And we do that together. And we do that in common. Lastly, we really work through healing through prefiguration. This group has lived in extreme racial and gender-based segregation. In prison, to violate the norms of segregation is to risk death or worse. In these spaces, we explicitly try to heal from such social violence using the, the uh, principle, creating windows where there were once walls. That is, putting people from very diverse environments around the dinner table together, not just to feed, but actually cook together. So that's engaging in collective action. This is a great equalizer and around these tables, it does not matter where you come from or what you have done, only how you are acting today. 
projects, we host diverse support circles and emotional ecology and wellness with diverse groups of people where we cultivate safe spaces to ask and explore things that might not make sense. Things like gender, for example, uh, have changed a lot in the last 40 years. So people coming out of prison uh, want to be able to ask questions about gender and sometimes use language that isn't always appropriate for modern day, uh, for modern day conversations. And explicitly creating safe spaces to do this is really key. This also means moving away from social punishments that are very prevalent in prisons and healing from a history of difficult social dynamics that include tattletailing, profiling, suspicious behavior, territorial behavior, and of course, post-incarceration syndrome. Instead, we move towards personal and collective transformation through collective governance, conflict resolution practices, and transformative justice. We tend, for example, away from rules, which are things tend created and enforced by outside agents, and towards shared agreements and living boundaries. <clears throat> in this way, we all learn the fundamental part of being represented in the social norms that we adhere to, <clears throat> as well as getting to choose how to respond when those norms are violated. So what can be learned for extraterrestrial liberties? As Angela Davis said, Prisons do not disappear social problems, they disappear human beings. Homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, <clears throat> mental illness and illiteracy are only a few of the problems that disappear from public view when human beings contended with them are rele relegated to, to cages. We argue that just as prisons do not disappear social problems, settling new geographies will not disappear our existing social issues unless we make that an explicit goal. Here in these communities, we are investing in the preconditions for collective freedom. What have we learned that is applicable for extraterrestrial liberties? In their book, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, <clears throat> Samuel Moyne writes about the importance of equity across individuals as a core feature of a just world. Here we suggest that when we have huge disparities in who is free and who is not, the overall liberty of the collective suffers. As William Gibson said, the future is already here. It is just not evenly distributed. A common phrase that we use in this community is the pace at, pace at which I walk determines who can join me on that journey. So a key part is, is making sure that we are getting free together and that no one is left behind. We've also learned that collective freedom is an evolving process <clears throat> that requires us all to be walking together, building the conditions for collective liberty and mutually assured autonomy and minimizing the disparity between us all. We've also learned that building these very conditions together has been a key part of ensuring a future that is different from our pasts. So far, we have discussed the creation of intentional home environments that are self-consciously centered around collective emancipation and stewarded autonomy. <clears throat> In asking our original question, are we ready for liberty? And if not, how can we prepare? As a first step in answering these questions, we might turn to Foucault, who reasoned that the target nowadays is not to discover what we are, but to refuse what we are. We have shown that we need the tools, kinship and environmental conditions for an anti-individualistic individu anti individuality. And that is what has been prototyped inside these place-based experiments. <clears throat> what the prison abolitionists have known for a long time is this, that we do this till we free us, and that until we are all free, we are none of us free. What does it mean then that these are the voices not heard or most present in the field of space exploration and new frontiers, that these very voices remain struggling to be heard on earth, let alone beyond? Speaking on prison abolition in their book, The University and the Undercommons, Mothman and Harney clarify what is meant but so often misunderstood by abolition movements. They say, not so much abolition of prisons, but the abolition of a society that could have prisons, that could have slavery, that could have the wage, and therefore not abolition as the elimination of anything, but abolition as the founding of a new society. We have discussed our practices and processes associated with stewarding autonomy, and we argue that these learnings are required to prepare the current world to prepare current world human subjectivities for new forms of governance in novel geographies and post-planetary constraints. I hope we have shown that voices, experience and wisdoms from those affected by and working to change one of the most unjust social systems on this planet have much to offer us in thinking about new liberties in the future crafting of extraterrestrial societies. 
Here we conclude that any settlement or on earth or otherwise that hopes for a different and more just future requires not only institutions and organizations that create the subjects needed for such utopian visions, but also that we <clears throat> as subjects and relational beings must do the work to earn ourselves a place in that future. As Ehrlich said, we must act as if the future is today. I just want to thank you very much for listening and thank all of the Second Life community that couldn't be here today uh, for those who are free and those of them who are still incarcerated. Thank you very much, Sarah. Now it's fascinating <clears throat> and really wonderful insight into the um, experiences you've had with dealing with those communities. Excellent. And so um, as usual, everyone, if you've got any questions, please do put them in the question and answer box if you're on the panel. Um, Put this in the uh, put this in the in the chat box. I've already got a question here, Zarina, from mm. Sherry Wells Jensen. He's saying, "How might this be implemented?" I'm picturing a kind of halfway house on Earth for people considering life in space. And if they can manage the culture, they go. But if they cannot, uh, they stay on Earth. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think. Um... I think a lot about uh, not just um, freedom, but various other sort of social dynamics as a developmental trajectory that we probably are um, not all qualified to participate in. I think uh, there are many other examples I can think of. And so, yeah, I think probably what I imagine is that um, just in the same way that we uh, have a license to drive uh, and we uh, only allow to consent um, at a certain age that we we have we develop institutions for um, embodied sense of like uh, of collective autonomy, and I think that should be a goal for us. Let me ask you a really um, ethically charged question, and, and let me say right from the beginning, I'm not suggesting um, some sort of enforced penal colony on the moon, as <laughs> it's similar to you know what we've seen in the past. But people who are in prisons have an experience of confinement and they have an experience of how to get on with other people in extreme confinement in environments where there's a lot of interdependency between people, semi self-sufficient materials coming from the outside, but generally no movement uh, beyond the prison environment. Do you think that some of these, um, the individuals you've come into contact with might actually have a better insight than the rest of us on how to uh, successfully build societies in space and might they be the best people to send to the moon and Mars voluntarily of course to, to use these experiences to build successful human societies yeah I think that's absolutely right and I think <clears throat> you know COVID was a really interesting example so when when COVID struck a lot of our community returned to society in the middle of lockdown so it was a really extraordinary situation but in many ways they were best equipped for this you know lots of them have lived in solitary confinement for for decades and they had a lot of wisdom about how to survive and how to take care of yourself uh, I was really blown away by the the sort of wisdoms and learnings that they had and at the same time it was very triggering so I think it's a fine balance between how do you lean into the wisdom of people with very diverse life experiences uh, and also recognize that these, these sort of new constraints can be extremely triggering and bring about old uh, dynamics. I think something that is constantly uh, present for us is that small things can bring about or reignite uh, sort of prison yard logic. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's really important to, to develop the skills to know when that's happening. Um, but I certainly think that um, people who've lived in this sort of hyper-connected way have a lot to offer in, in thinking about how we do these kinds of things. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. And then Scott uh, Cassigan is asking, um, he's wondering about the connection with space settlement, unless you're saying that we shouldn't settle space until we completely transform current society. Uh, who, sh who would determine who is qualified to settle space? So I suppose it's partly a question about some of the uh, transformations you're suggesting on the earth in our justice system, in building societies where prisons are not needed. Do we need to get those things? I think this is what Scott's asking. Do we need to fix those things on earth uh, before we go into space or can space motivate us, do you think, to improve these systems on the earth? Is there a synergy between our movement into space that forces us to think about these things that can then help us improve societies on the earth? Or do you think that given the state of our societies on the earth and our prison systems, um, you know, we just shouldn't be sending people into these highly confined environments in space until we've got ourselves mm. sorted out here on earth? 
No, I don't think that. I, I know there's a sort of, um, I think many people think that we shouldn't be leaving Earth until we've, you know, tidied up our own backyard. I don't think that's the case. I think there's many great arguments for why, um, why these things can be done in parallel. I think more what I'm trying to say is that we should be careful about the log the social logics that we are putting into these new spaces because they they change everything um and from uh you know the initial sort of starting conditions that any um settlement begins in will determine where it can go from and so i'm not saying that we shouldn't go into space until we fix all of our problems on earth but i do think we should make sure that the the individuals that are that are settling these um spaces should take should make sure that they are ready for this kind of thing and and that might do, mean doing a lot of personal work that might do me that might be doing some relational work uh within the specific groups of people that are going um and really asking themselves you know like are we going to use this moment to be otherwise or are we going to reproduce what the social dynamics and constraints that we have been 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 raised in and that's no mean feat you know we are all products of um the sort of like uh power systems at play in our society and it's very difficult to to escape that it's almost impossible to escape that as an individual you can only really get free of these things in collective settings yeah and, and just following on from that i mean i suppose an obvious question is you know prisons on the moon and mars so we build societies on the moon and Mars that themselves are a little bit like prisons because they're confined. But nonetheless, even within that, there's going to be mm -hmm. people that are going to transgress and presumably will encourage a lunar governance structure or a lunar Martian structure to have some sort of prison, even if in a very small community, it is literally just something like a county jail that you put people in. So how do we deal with mm -hmm. um, you know, transgressions of extraterrestrial laws in these environments if we want to mm -hmm. try and build it's without prisons on the earth is the moon and mars a good place to begin this experiment and see if we can construct societies without prisons at all or will the extremity of potential crimes in these environments like right. depressurization force us to have extraterrestrial prisons whether we like it or not yeah it's a tough one because the constraints are new and really hard you know the the, the cost of violating social norms uh is is deadly um i think it, the way I would phrase it is we, you know, so a thought experiment might be we should not build these settlements until we can do them in a way that does not need prisons. And what that means is spending a lot of time working out how to be together, how to create the conditions for peace, um, how to create the conditions for conflict resolution, how to make sure people understand and have, have access to the resources they need so as ha social harms are not done. There's a great quote, um, every society has the criminals that it deserves. Um, and so really thinking about like the social, what social conditions would mean that you don't need to have prisons in space. That's really interesting. And I, I think it ties in with what Jim was saying. He was saying that we shouldn't be building societies in space until they can guarantee a certain quality of living where everyone is not trying to leave. He's talking about the right of emigration. And right. I suppose in some sense it has parallels with yours. So it's uh, mm -hmm if you join those two things up what we're saying is that it would be it's better not to construct a settlement on the moon and mars until you can be assured of a standard of living where people don't feel the need to to leave or at least not you know such a bad standard of living where people are highly motivated to leave and also those social conditions don't lead to the requirement to imprison people where there's a sufficiently right. good social structure to prevent that so maybe yeah. those two things you know that the need to emigrate and the um uh, the need not to have an incarcerated population might be two of the factors, the benchmarks of which you could use to decide mm -hmm. when your society looks like it's going to have sufficient social yeah. structure to be worth building. Yeah, and you know, there's uh, I, so um, I would like to distinguish between consequences and punishment. There's often consequences to our actions, and it might be, you know, if I get very drunk and drive around on a motorbike, that I um, the society says, okay, well, we probably should not have a driving license anymore, and that is a consequence, and that's very different from a punishment designed to sort of enact and redress harm. And so I I I don't think we can have a society without consequences um, but consequences are, th are something that we can all participate in the in the curation of and the adherence to uh, whereas punishment is a very different thing and I think there are lots of examples on earth of this already right so we have families we, in families we have ways of negotiating uh, our shared environment that don't involve 
often calling the police uh, or, you know, tenants' rights or all these things that we see. And, I, and this is why, for me, I really lean into this idea of kinship, uh, because I think when you really have these foundational um, relationships uh, that underlie your collectivity, many of these things start to, to sort of ease. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. And there's a, there's a question here from David um, Colby Reed is asking, he's saying, interesting talk. I'm thinking about the relational dimensions of ideas like freedom and liberty in space context too. Uh, how do you think about the designs of social institutions like workplaces, et cetera, in this vein? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I think, um, you know, for me, this is all tied up into a much broader system of like consensual engagement. And I think there's a lot of issues with modern day workplaces and that most people are doing involuntary labor and they're not not even necessarily showing up or participating in society in the way that they would like, because we are all dependent on uh, sort of extractive labor in order to to uh, get the means to survive. And so I would hope. Uh, that alongside creating the conditions for liberty in space, that we are that part of that is uh, freedom from involuntary labour to allow to allow people to participate in society in a way that's like actually meaningful and generative to them. Mm -hmm. So, so what happens if you end up in a you know settlement on the moon and there's some sudden shortage? Let's say some some people who uh, run a critical oxygen machine, get food poisoning, and then they're taken out of the loop. And you have to force someone else to run the oxygen machine, because then you because you're facing some, uh, you know, catastrophic lack of oxygen across the whole settlement. Mm -hmm. Is it, do you think, reliably possible to build a settlement where there is no involuntary labour at all? Absolutely. I mean, I think you know, humans. You know, we see this often in, in what is known as disaster communism. You know, when disasters happen, groups of people get together. I think Rebecca Solnit's written about this uh, in their book Paradise Built in Hell, <clears throat> about how in disasters, humans like very quickly get together to self-organize and build extraordinary things to take care of each other across a lot of like diverse life experiences. Uh, we saw this in COVID, you know, with I think the NHS put out a call for volunteers to help uh, early days and they got extraordinary numbers of people signing up to help. Um, so actually, I think humans are very good at showing up <clears throat> in disasters. It's more the maintenance phase that's a little bit hard. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but I think a, a key part of this is, is being represented in the society in which they participate. I think part of what's very difficult about our current mode of, of life is that people don't really feel represented and therefore they don't feel ownership or responsibility for the negative externalities of life. And I think this is really why collective governance and shared responsibility for our society is a key part of what we're actually getting to. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Um, just having a look here. I don't think we have any other questions. I'll just ask you one final question. Do you, do you think it's realistic to build a society without prisons? Do you think even if you have let's say your idealized social situation, someone could of course have um, some, some physiological or neurological, uh, I don't know how to, to put it, um, sort of error, if you like, that causes them to do something socially mm -hmm. catastrophic. Would you then deal with those people pharmacologically or medically to obviate the need for a prison? So, I guess what mm -hmm. I'm saying is there will always be some sort of crime of some sort even if it's medically induced mm -hmm. rather than sociological. So do you need a prison, whatever, just in case you have those? Or do you think that where crimes are committed that are not linked to social conditions, there are other mechanisms that allow you to do away with prisons mm -hmm. completely? Yeah, I mean, I think I have this sort of thought experiment that I ask people to do, which is, you know, imagine that I could press a red button now and everybody who'd ever violently assaulted anybody was you know eliminated and dissolved into a cloud of dust <clears throat> our society would only be safe for for i don't know maybe eight to ten years because we are still producing humans in a violent society where popular media um uh like encourages violence and uh, uh where people don't have access to resources and so we are creating violence uh, now say we'd eliminated that and we'd created a society that didn't do that where humans had access to all the things they need to uh, have meaning in their life and show up for the people they care for 
uh, yes, we still have harms against society. And I think, again, we need to have consequences for those. And there will be, unfortunately, some humans who are not fit to be around other humans. And that is a devastating uh, and tragic thing. I do not think those people need to be in a prison. Prisons are extremely inhumane and cruel environments, as you know. Uh, there are ways of keeping humans from other humans. Um, there's no reason why uh, they could not have a very nice life or as nice as possible. Uh, life but kept away from from other human beings uh, there's no reason why somebody has to live in a in a in a in an inhumane environment because they're unfit to be around other human beings mm -hmm. in my opinion is that partly um sorry just one last question <laughs> carry on is that partly simply because of the way prisons are i mean when we say get rid of prisons are we actually just saying make prisons decent places to live in? So you can still have a place where you put humans to keep them away from others. Maybe you don't call them prisons and you mm -hmm. make them decent places to live. So it's not so much about getting rid of prisons per se, but creating institutions where you can separate humans from others and, and still have them live in, in, reasonable, in reasonably good conditions, humane conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's right. So I think it's primarily about uh, creating the conditions that that do not need prisons as a solution. And then for the for the very few cases, and it would be relatively few, uh, of uh, for people who, who are not fit to be around other people, um, uh, yeah, we can create spaces that are, that are lovely. And there are presumably lots of ways that, as somebody's talking about here, psychopaths in the chat, there are presumably lots of ways that sociopaths and psychopaths or, or people who have like, um, uh, irreversible tendencies towards violence can still be useful for society uh, or show up in ways that are meaningful to them. Uh, and I just think we haven't really thought creatively about um, how, how to, to protect society from the, the few individuals who are, who are like irreversibly dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with that. You know, we've had our experiences of getting people with life sentences designing Mars stations. So the fact that one part of your brain has made you do something, you know, I know it's not quite as simple as that, but, you know, there's, there's plenty of stuff going on out there that's extremely productive mm -hmm. and useful for societies. There's no reason for people to become unproductive because mm -hmm. they've uh, done something very bad. And that's yeah. just a way of rethinking the way we treat prisoners. Right. Um, we shouldn't um, judge people by the, the single worst thing they've ever done. Right? Yeah. Yep, that's a good way of summing up. Yep, thank you very much, Sarah. We should stop there. Um, it's 10 past and we'll take a brief break uh, before the next speaker. Thank you very much for joining us. It's really fascinating. Another angle on liberties and, and communities of people we can draw upon to think about how we might build space settlements. Uh, so thanks a lot again. And for everyone else, we'll be back at um, 5.15 for the last talk of the day when we'll be talking about the Cosmo Legal proposal in outer space governance. So see you in a bit. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you everyone for coming along. And you know, as usual, if you've just joined us, um, welcome to this webinar series on the institutions of uh, extraterrestrial liberty. And I'm very pleased to, um, to introduce Elena uh, Chirkovich. Is that correct pronunciation? Um, um, yes, pretty much Chirkovich. You, you got it uh, 99%. Okay. Yeah, good, yeah. 99. Okay, good. Great. And it's, it's good to see you. she's a, a researcher at the University of Helsinki and a transdisciplinary scholar of international law. So she's got a number of projects happening, including one on space ice and the final frontiers of international law's universality. And she's interested in investigating the role of uh, international regulation and environmental sustainability in the Earth system and also applying that to outer space, an interesting connection between uh, Earth and the outer space environment. Uh, she also analyzes the regulation of autonomous machine learning that allows for increased commercialization and industrialization of these spaces on, on Earth and outer space. And she's a member of the Earth System Governance Global Research Alliance. So thank you very much for joining us, Elena, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Charles, for inviting me and giving me space to discuss some of the ideas with everyone else. Uh, I'm sorry again, you will have to look at my picture because I am upside down otherwise on camera and do not know how to fix it. Um, so not to lose any more time from the presentation, I will just go straight ahead. So um, there are a couple of points or more than a couple of points that um, I think um, are becoming more and more pertinent when it comes to 
space exploration, but specifically human activities in outer space. And I will not repeat many of the points that were already discussed throughout the day. Um, I was going to give an overview that was already provided by uh, Franz von Dunk, von der Dunk, sorry, this morning in the first presentation for those who saw it. So uh, I will not, I, I was going to give an overview on outer space law and whatnot, but I think uh, there are a few things that do need to be discussed with respect to uh, law as a discipline and also international law. And moving on from there, because this is an interdisciplinary event, um, the question of interdisciplinarity, as well as alternate knowledges or ontologies, depending on how we want to approach, and perhaps also the environment on its own terms, or the agency of whatever we choose to see as non-human. And I say this very carefully because the concept of a non-human or the term is, is something that can be debated. So international law as such. Um, outer space, uh, interestingly, is uh, something that uh, is not or hasn't been, I, I do relate quite a bit to, I think it was a second or third presentation of this morning, is not as popular or was hasn't been as popular in law schools over the past uh, decades. Um, it is mostly because the activities in outer space for some reason, and not for some reason, but actually for good reason, uh, tended to be associated with um, state interest, geopolitics, military activities, security, and so on. Although we do rely on outer space heavily, I would argue that this is not or hasn't been as visible um, in everyday language or even education. So what this means, in I, I, what I've been noticing in international law, um, it, there is a two-way road that I think needs to be reestablished. And that is that within the context of outer space law specifically, and uh, the space sector, uh, broadly speaking, there does needs there there needs to be an open overture towards public international law, at least um, as a whole discipline. Uh, and I say this because outer space law um, does not exist in a vacuum from the rest of international law. Uh, no law does. And of course, um, this this is something that can be discussed in great, in great detail, what this means for different areas of law, if there are hierarchies, and there are some, what those are, and so on. But I, uh, I can address this in a Q&A period, not to um, maybe focus on this too much. But all I, all I wish to point out is that all the different areas of law, international law or national law, that, which are relevant to us on Earth, um are also relevant in outer space with of course the the usual caveat that uh lex specialis or special law um is meant for something very specific and does need to also take into consideration the specific context and in our case it's outer space now it is also the case that we now have more than ever non-state actors all kinds of different actors including also um developing space uh states if i can call it that way the, or developing space industries joining in so it's not just the usual suspects of us um russia china and so on but other countries as well and so as, as well as pr the private sector so there are there, there is a need to kind of pluralize this situation in our heads um there is a lot of discussion right now about the need for new law and including something like development of settlements uh what would that mean legally speaking but i would argue that uh of course with again the uh the fact that law will develop as humanity develops and and uh specific societies we do have a body of law right now which is um functional which it, there is a there is an international uh, agreement on a multilateral agreement, so to speak, or a series of agreements that we do have such a thing as public international law. So I will leave that aside for a moment and step in 
and into the second point sorry i'm still i i was intending to speak and see myself but all i see now is my um picture anyway and this now so so it's almost like uh interdisciplinarity within law as a discipline i i would say that at the moment we have different areas of law different practices different interests and um what we have called in legal scholarship is fragmentation of international law so there is a need to reach out. There is a need for, for example, outer space lawyers to also engage with trade lawyers and commerce uh, and so on. My interest here is environmental law, uh, international environmental law, but also climate regulation and everything else that has been relevant to what we are identifying as environmental degradation in the Earth system. Very quickly, Earth System comes, there is a whole research project called Earth System Governance, but that also comes from Earth System Science, which is an actual kind of error study of its own. It's quite interdisciplinary. And the, the reason why it's called Earth System is because it approaches um, the planet as a system of inter, 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 interconnected subsystems. And you can see the definition of this, for example, in all the um, climate reports right now, etc. And why this is significant is because it, it takes on a bit of a different approach that we have than what we have had before in terms of human societies and how we approach um, our relationship to the environment on Earth, but also now in outer space. And that is that we are we are part of that system. So it, it is it is also, um, I have to emphasize again the term interdisciplinary because there is a tendency once we say humans are part of the earth system to sort of assume that there is some kind of romantic environmental approach, but it actually isn't. Um, and if we do as we have now in the context of um, environmental degradation on earth and you know climate change and everything as we tend to uh, take it to take into account more seriously in the process of law making law thinking um, other disciplines which uh, prioritize non-human laws as in say uh, laws of physics or chemistry biology and so on and understand how those interact with humans and how, for instance, anthropogenic uh, consequences. So for uh, like uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I work on the Arctic specifically uh, in the case of methane, uh, where we have all these methane crates um, with methane, uh, yeah, with methane emissions, and they are a consequence of uh, permafrost melt. And permafrost melt is a consequence of global warming. But the methane crater is not directly caused by a human. It's an indirect consequence of human agency. So, and, and it has an agency in itself. And its agency is that with increase uh, of methane emissions in the atmosphere, it's actually, it actually warms up much faster than uh, CO2. So it's, it is highly problematic and very circular. So stepping above the atmosphere back into outer space, or not back, but further up, uh, the orbit. And one of the things that um, I argued, and I decided to term it cosmolegal for the lack of a better term, and it has actually brought a lot of um, odd commentary. And today I realized why, <laughs> listening to Anthony Paton, because you know, I allocate Kant to the distance, pa distant path, uh, past, sorry, of my learning experience. But of course, a lot of people ask me, oh, do you mean cosmopolitanism? Are you referring to cosmopolitan? No, not at all. Um, the cosmolegal was just meant to be a term to bring together um, cosmology and law. And again, in order to refer to something both uh, extraterrestrial and Earth system based. Um, I, I wrote an entire paper on this, so I will I will not paraphrase right now. Again, if people have questions, I can address it later in the Q and A period. Um, so interdisciplinarity is is has been really crucial in the the context of the Earth system, and of course we see this as well in the context of outer space environment. We talk a lot about um, human activities in outer space, the relevance of human laws, human societies, but as we 
it, as it has been repeated over and over again, space is hard and it's hard for a reason. And one of which is the fact that it's not a naturally friendly environment to human life and does have to be modified in all the different ways, uh, uh, both for human bodies of our own as well as the environment for us to thrive there in, in whatever capacity. And I always shy away from maybe imagining in great detail what this might be just because of I stick to my own expertise. Um, because some of my, my colleagues actually at the University of Helsinki um, are questioning the very viability of Mars and Moon. They have some other ideas, but that's a project they're developing, developing on their own, so I will not, <laughs> it's, I guess it can be Googled. Um, so, so I will not discuss that specifically, but I will say that space environment on its own, already in Earth's orbits, um, has shown to us the limits. So just like uh, this, similar to the problems that we have on Earth, we see them now in the orbit, or the orbits, sorry. Um, they're not limitless, the environment is already saturated and there are really real uh, and potential risks and hazards. And the, there have been warnings for quite some time about space debris, but it took a while for it to be considered to the extent that it is being right now. And actually, as I have been listening, um, I'm at the conference today, but also for the past week and a half or two weeks, the, the legal subcommittee of the UN COPUS has also been in session. And all these discussions uh, have been quite pertinent there, and they will have the presentations online as well on the UN Copus website for those who might be interested. Um, so interconnectivity, so now moving, so, okay, environmental degradation in the Earth system, environmental degradation in, in outer space, are they connected? Of course they are. The limit between the atmosphere and the orbit is, again, something beyond my expertise to discuss, but what is now becoming a very important subject that some of us are just starting to to address is also uh, the relationship between atmospheric pollution and orbital pollution and how these impact each other um, not to mention that moving even beyond we have the question of interplanetary contamination and what this might result in so again whatever human activities and whatever we might consider as let's say a liberty um, we as a species, or, and specifically certain subgroups within our species that will lead and are leading the way in, in space exploration and activity, in f uh, future activities, um, will and have already decided about cer uh, uh, on certain rules and regulations, but there is a tremendous indeterminacy in what exactly is going to happen in um, in the long run, or maybe even like middle, it, it doesn't even have to be uh, too far in the future. How the environment will react, how we will react to the environment and so on. And so when I'm thinking of something like a settlement, uh, a lunar settlement or the Mars or whatever, it's not just what I or we decide to do there, we do, and, and this is heavily anticipated outside of social sciences, of course, how is the how what is this relationship going to be like and will it even be sustainable for both the environment and the humans and finally um i will just um because I, I want to make this short because i think that there are lots of things to discuss and maybe better in in uh, in a kind of uh, in an exchange with the audience and finally there are so many different um histories and knowledges uh among different communities human communities and relationship with space outer space so i would say that this is uh, this is going to become relevant and really important in all further discussions so what we discuss about just the very basics concepts of constitution constitutional law constitution constituting a state, a society, democracy, liberty, all of those things mean very specific things in a particular um, line of thought, which was um, well discussed and described during the keynote today. But of course, there are so many other different ways of thinking. 
And um, these are, we, in, in law, we would refer to legal pluralism, but of course, even beyond law, there are just the relationship between the human and the non-human or even to other humans and other planets. But again, I want to just throw this point out there because it's, it's a mountain of, um, of a topic to address. So this is what I'm, I frame it under this term of cosmolegal. Um, it's not a kind of a definite, absolute, a must term. It was something that just, it's a tool uh, for developing a methodology and a theory, primarily in law and society. So it's primarily oriented towards lawmaking and international law specifically. Uh, but that said, one of the methods, or, 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 or let's say two main points of the methods uh, that I've identified and that I've just talked about, one is serious interdisciplinarity, as in one that is, or, or rather transdisciplinarity, because where law is not on the top of the hierarchy necessarily. Um, and, and that's something that we, in the, because we tend to be quite formal at times, uh, so it becomes a problem. And the other one is also understanding multiple just ways of knowing as well as the non-human environment. So I would like to just end there and uh, open up to discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, that was that was really interesting. And you know, as usual, if any of you got questions, do please put them in the chat or the question and answer box. Uh, any questions for Eleanor? Uh, while you're thinking of questions and 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 writing those in, let me. Just start off with a question. Um, so, so people often bring up Antarctica and the, the International Antarctic Treaty as a parallel to what one might think about in space. And I just wanted to touch on something you just brought up literally just now, which was that, of course, you know, in Antarctica, you don't really talk about liberty. I mean, you talk about liberty of nation states to operate down there. But as individuals, you don't talk about liberty. I, I worked at the British Antarctic Survey for five years, and I can't recall a single you know, meaningful conversation about freedom in Antarctica. We didn't sit around talking about our freedom to, of, of, of the free press or the freedom to express ourselves in Antarctica. It's sort of just not relevant. You turn up, you do your science, you leave. And that's probably because these are not permanent settlements. Whereas, of course, once you start moving to the moon and Mars permanently, uh, these things will presumably become important to the people living there. So I, I see a sort of rift there between the sort of short-termism of the communities in Antarctica at least with relations to liberty and the sorts of things we're talking about today and the environment in space. And I just wonder whether you had any thoughts about what that might mean from a legal point of view. What are the sorts of laws that you need to um, create in the space environment that we haven't had to do in similar extreme uh, communities on the Earth, like in Antarctica? And is it just a question of bolting those things on, say, to something that's similar to the Antarctic Treaty, or are we talking about a completely different legal regime? Well, um, I will I will stick to what is. <laughs> uh, there is one thing I think that it's it's uh, in law. Hypothetical thinking is good, but also not excellent because as as a non as someone who cannot make law. I, you know, I, but anyway, with that preface, well, yeah. we do. Um, so we have a treaty, which means that it's governed by the international law of treaties, which is so. So as a treaty, uh, in I'm, I'm referring to the Antarctic Treaty, um, it has it already has its uh, a legal frame framework. Then we have the other. So outer space, um, the high seas um etc um are commons and are governed by the laws of the commons as well so this is something that um that that does need to be and and i'm not introducing this by the way it's been um if you look up the work of professor stephen freeland um and some others uh, isabel feichner for example um wrote a really wonderful piece maybe about three years ago comparing the deep seas with outer space and mining in the deep seas and outer space uh, where we look at the law as is so these are not legal legal vacuums i would say i mean there are they're governed by when i said before fragmentation of international law what i meant by that is that we have d uh, different areas of law we have different uh, types of agreements, different institutions, and and some hierarchies, of course, as well. Um, for instance, you cannot 
commit genocide anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just Cohen's. Um, ideally speaking, I mean, yeah. you, what, you, what, you know, let, I'll, I'll, just, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> before I dig myself even further from being upside down. Um, uh, but so I don't know if you see what I mean. So it's I yeah. don't see any of this as a legal vacuum. There are just different areas of law and there are different instruments that we tap into yeah. um, to deal with them. But one thing that I do want to say when you mentioned, uh, are there people there, are there human settlements? Are there, is, and it's often said that the reason why we do have a treaty in the Antarctica and not in the Arctic is because geopolitical interests are different and because we have actual state borders up here and i'm i'm constantly i'm i'm from canada mostly but also now living in finland and <laughs> i'm mm -hmm. always up here and um, so there is a yes this is true to a certain extent but even in the arctic if you think about it and i always say this in comparison to outer space if you think about the history of the cold war there were so many treaties and agreements before sorry, between so-called enemy states, because they simply had to in the Arctic. Think about something like search and rescue. Mm -hmm. And and this is this is what I think of when I think of the outer space as well. Uh, so in, in terms of, do we have an agreement here, but not there, and how does it work? A lot of it is also um, informed by the environment itself, like an icebreaker. I don't know if you've ever been on one, but it's <laughs> terms of engagement are a little bit different there. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. There's a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. So I'll read these out. One from uh, Saskia here mm -hmm. uh, saying, thanks for your talk. And a uh, question, how do you think space law will include other onto epistemologies you were referring to, especially within the context of the Sousa Santos and other critical legal thinkers making the point of the uh, epistemic violence of law. Yes, I know what she's talking about. Um, well, it, it doesn't have to, I think the key word in the question is include. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is also something that has been discussed by, well, not just Susa Santos, I mean, even going back to um, violence before the law, you know, Derrida's engagement with with uh, Benjamin and law, the relationship between constitutional law, constitu uh, um, constitutional violence and the law. And by the way, this is something that, you know, I thought about a lot during today, during all the different uh, presentations that we had today, um, how we talk about constitutions, but how do constitutions actually come to be? And uh, one of the biggest problems in these so-called constitutions and international law is a type of a constitution uh, let's call it a global constitution or planetary or whatnot is are we including something into the existing uh framework or are we changing the framework itself and this is a point of contestation that i cannot uh, i've worked on for more than 10 years because my work before this one is on indigenous people's rights in canada and um I, you know, it is a bit ironic that I am, or not ironic, I don't know what's a proper word. Um, I am talking about um, settlements in outer space. Um, we just had, uh, perhaps people know, we just had these news coming from Canada where a grave of 215 children mm -hmm. from residential schools uh, were found. And that that is also, uh, that it's a physical violence. It is also an epistemological violence. It was also because it was meant to erase an entire uh, way of knowing. And in fact, a colleague of mine and I are now writing an answer or writing a commentary uh, for the Canadian Space Agency uh, from the perspective of Indigenous people's knowledge in Canada. Um, because, and, but that is something that is rely again. That that is a question that I cannot resolve or answer here. But I think that there is a big problem of including, or are we co-creating? Are we? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. And then da David Colby Reads asked, um, Eleanor, could you elaborate on the point you'd made about synthesizing multiple sources of law, e.g., physics and biogeochemistry and human law? So I'm uh, well, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Well, I mean, it, this is a this is a it's theoretical, but arguably it's already practical. Um, I am thinking mostly of climate because it, it's this is one of the areas of international law where it was explicit made explicit that uh, future law on mitigation of climate change needs to pay attention to other disciplines. 
and mm -hmm. and in, and as in be directly informed and now the question would be well is is the law not always informed by various knowledges or disciplines yes and no uh and this is also where we enter into the whole other <laughs> area of debate and that's the role of science um so so physics and um um i'm thinking of um your colleague, the name escapes me right now. Um, she's a physicist, but she mostly is a, now a philosopher of science um, over at, um, I can't remember which university. Anyway, um, uh, Nancy Cartwright. Uh -huh. uh, because when we're also talking about physics, you know, physics is also a human, um, it's a science. We engage with physics. We called it physics as to what's happening out there. This is a big philosophical question. You know, it's as old as human humanity. So what we mean by synthesizing, what I mean by synthesizing here is that if I'm creating rules for mitigation of space debris, there needs to be input from more than just um, state representatives who may or may not be directly engaging in research dealing with the actual phenomena itself mm -hmm. but again i am aware this is a philosophical debate that is not very novel yeah that's interesting and i know you said the law is as things are but i'm going to ask you to speculate again <laughs> um can you see any situation in the very far future where developing so we often talk about you know how we can use analogies on the earth to develop space law whether that's antarctic or deep sea um, as more people go into space and perhaps our activity in space becomes uh, more more ex expan expansive across the solar system, um, are there areas of terrestrial law that could be radically improved by our experience in space? Or uh, are there examples of any terrestrial laws that have benefited from going out into space and getting a new legal perspective out there that then you apply to the Earth? So it's not just about earth uh, allowing us to develop space law but could it work the other way around could it uh, it could i i think that one one of the reasons why I, I study space law is because one of the questions that has always plagued well not just me but many people is how to th think outside of ourselves how to be outside of ourselves and then you know that that again another eternal question mm -hmm. and space and, and in international law traditional more traditional international law that sees outer that used to or does until now see outer space as a mere extension of terrestrial uh law and terrestrial divisions i think that that would be that will be the one of the biggest contributions is that we just simply an orbit is something completely different that where I where I am right now sitting in my room. Um, it, so it, it does I, I would, I think maybe so I'm speculating it might challenge that very limitation, yes. the kind of terrestrial uh, cartographic understanding of our existence. Okay, so that's been called the overview effect before. So you're sort of talking about yeah. a legal overview effect. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Well, I am upside down. Sorry, <laughs> I can't get over it. <laughs> so, Good. Right. I feel um, like, yeah. Hello. Hi, we can see you now upside down. Excellent. Um, it's now uh, 5.45, so we should probably uh, finish there as, as so, we can f so that people can um, be doing whatever they need to do. I think this is our end of the schedule. I wanted to thank you, uh, and that's really, really fascinating talk to to close off the day to talk about some of the possibilities of uh, legal development in space so thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to us thank you and uh, i want to thank all of the speakers uh today for excellent it's been a fantastic day we have another three days and it's uh, going to be just as good so please do come back we will start again tomorrow 10 o'clock um same in brief introduction by the way for those of you here today my introduction is going to be exactly the same as it was today so if you want to come along at about 10 15 that will be the first talk of tomorrow otherwise see you tomorrow for the next uh day two of the institutions of extraterrestrial liberty thank you for speakers thank you for all the attendees who have come along today and asked such fantastic questions see you all tomorrow and have a good evening